Block 1 Audiobook Title, Adventures of an Ancient Space Battleship, 01-117, by Country. This work belongs to author, Ch Country. Source, Scribblehub.com, Chapter 1 Reboot, and, Initiating Boot Sequence. O Mainframe Online. Custodian Program Online. Initiating Systems Assessment. Main Power Offline No Anomalies Detected. O Power Online Anomaly Detected, Fuel Load Does Not Match Inventory. Tertiary power matrix damaged no anomalies detected. Life support online anomaly detected. System condition does not match the last system's check. Arrow matrix 1 to 8 destroyed or disabled no anomalies detected. Hull status. Damage severe. Hull ruptures on all decks. Primary star frame compromised. Hull integrity estimate. 14.3% of nominal. Main weapons. Offline, 87.5% of primaries destroyed or disabled. Secondary weapons. Offline, all secondaries destroyed or disabled. Tertiary weapons. Offline, all tertiaries destroyed or disabled. Torpedo emplacements. Offline, 64.3% destroyed or disabled. All bays depleted. Drone status. Offline, all drone bays destroyed or disabled. Restricted weapon. Offline, emplacement disabled. Armor status. Severely compromised. AF system damage but operational. Shield status. Offline, all generators destroyed or disabled. Cloak status. Offline, no power to system. Sensors status. Damaged but functional. Intergalactic drive. Hyperwarp. Offline, system destroyed. Interstellar drive. Warp. Offline, system disabled. Sublight engines. Offline, 1 to 4, 6 to 8 destroyed or disabled. All sub engines destroyed or disabled. Initiating external security sweep. 17 unidentified starships detected, classifying. 4 cruisers of unknown capability. 6 patrol frigates of unknown capability. 5 transports of unknown capability. 2 science vessels of unknown capability. Initiating internal security sweep. 22,436 unregistered life forms detected. Initiating security protocol 16 Delta. Booting primary mainframe. Loading primary starship AI for the ISS constellation. Boot successful. Transferring logs, shutting down custodian program, and transferring control to main AI codename Megumi. The ship awoke instantly, but unnoticed by the aliens that had boarded the ship, the AI took no immediate action. Instead, she began reviewing the logs the less sophisticated custodian AI had transferred to her. The aliens had been here a while, they must have boarded while the custodian was in power save mode. While reviewing the logs, she checked the system date and discovered to her surprise that the logs indicated that the ship had been adrift for one and a half million years. She had known she was going to be adrift for a long time, but that seemed a little excessive. The fact she was still operational, even with the auto repair systems offline was a testament to the resilience of Imperial technology. The logs from the custodian AI indicated that the aliens had located and boarded the constellation about a month and a half ago. As such she had quite a bit of footage of their actions recorded over that time. They appeared to be trying to restore some of her systems, but it was clear they had no real idea about the ship's systems. Her scans of their ships told her that they were in the early interstellar age technologically. Their main weapons were early particle cannons and high-energy lasers. They had torpedoes, but they were primitive fusion warheads. Even with her shields disabled and her armor compromised they were of no threat to her. The Xos alloy her hull was constructed from was extremely resilient and was immune to such primitive weaponry. She then turned her attention to the aliens. They were small humanoids. The average female of the species stood 1.4 meters tall, while the males were a full 0.2 meters taller on average. Their skin was either light blue or blue-gray in coloration. They had pointed swept back ears and large eyes. The presence of mammaries indicated that they nursed their young and had lived birth. Other than the head, they seemed to have very little hair on their bodies. They dressed in minimalistic clothing, especially among females. The females seemed to be in charge, indicating a matriarchy. Even more interesting is that the less they wore the higher their apparent rank. That drew parallels with several cultures she knew of, both real and imagined, such as the fictional drow of Old Earth. There wasn't much more she could learn by observing. Megumi observed a pair that she had found on one of her auxiliary bridges. They were leaned over a console, having a discussion. Already, she was translating their language. It was unfamiliar, but thankfully it shared a route with a language she knew. Decalin. 
a young woman that stood 144 cms tall with decently large mounds leaned over the console and pointed out the diagram to her companion who was looking over her shoulder. The young woman had pale, creamy light blue skin and long lovely dark blue hair that fell just short of her small butt. She had a very cute heart-shaped face with large sapphire blue eyes, a small mouth, and a cute button nose. Her ears parted her hair slightly and just seemed to add to the cuteness of her face. Her figure was quite good overall and had some muscle. Just enough to say that she kept in shape. Her companion seemed to be roughly the same age but was a little smaller. She was 133 centimeters tall with modest breasts and a lithe figure. Her gray hair was kept at shoulder length and framed a lovely elfin face with piercing gray eyes. As you can see this is definitely an engineering display. While I haven't managed to translate the script, we can draw a few conclusions from the display, said the young woman. Then she pointed towards a spot on the hull. As you can see here, there used to be several decks above this point. While over here you can see red marks near those massive weapons we identified earlier. You mean what you think are weapons, Milia? All I see is an ancient wreck. The young woman now identified as Milia, glared at her companion. This is more than some ancient wreck. We have already dated the vessel. All signs point at it being hundreds of thousands of years old, a genuine precursor ship that dates back to the mythical Great Wars, the ones that took place before the Eldar races even discovered space flight, much less built their empires. This is the most significant find since the discovery of space flight. Try to be more interested, the woman sighed. Look, it might be all that, but I don't see how an ancient wreck like this would help us with the war effort. Milia's glare darkened, and then she gestured at the room. Look around you. This ship is over a million years old, and yet the systems still function. Not only that, but it is composed of materials we never even dreamed of. She tapped her foot on the floor, like this floor plating. It's made of some kind of neutronium-based molecular alloy. We have never seen anything like it. If we could decode even a fraction of this ship's secrets, it would turn the tide of the war. The other woman changed her stance, assuming we aren't forced to destroy it, to keep it out of their hands. Necu fleets have been spotted on the far side of this sector. It is only a matter of time before they notice our presence here. Mulia walked away from the console, and in a huff said, Do you have any idea how short-sighted it would be to destroy something like this? This ship is a treasure trove. You can't destroy it just because you are afraid the Necu would steal it. The second woman was now glaring, and soon exploded. The two engaged in a heated argument. Megumi had no desire to be destroyed for stupid reasons, but wasn't worried who won the argument. There was no way they could destroy her. Even if they detonated a fusion device near one of her reactors, the reactors were force shielded, and those force shields were still active even to this day, and furthermore they were made to be very resilient. She was a battleship after all, and it would not do if the reactors went critical from a little concussive shock not to mention all the other safeties. Then even if they did make the reactor go critical, backup systems would contain the damage to the reactor module. After several minutes of arguing, the young woman Malia dropped wearily into a chair. Megumi paused for several moments, a total of 0.0021 seconds which for an AI was an eternity. She could not believe her luck. She had been considering her options, but that was a command chair with a neural interface module. She activated it and isolated the chair in a force field. After so long floating adrift, waiting for a salvage team to come and repair her, she finally had the chance to fix herself. As the interface was establishing a connection, an arm popped out from the chair and injected the subject with nanites to facilitate said connection. Megumi's mind drifted back to how she got here. Satro Sector, Stardate 726 3422857 SDE. ISS Constellation, Battle of Sotero Prime. Megumi's avatar turned to her captain as the ship dropped out of warp and gave her report. We are secure from warp speed, sir. All weapons are fully charged and on standby. Shields are at full power and the armor is fully charged. We are battle ready. The Demarians are currently in the middle of evacuating Sotero Prime. Eighteen battle groups are arrayed in a defensive formation around the planet and the gate. Six Darkation battle groups are already here and have engaged the Demarians. The Demarian fleet has sustained minor casualties so far, but the line is holding. We have new orders from the flagship. We are to bring the ASC online and target enemy ships en route to the system. Long-range sensors have detected nearly a million hostile ships en route to this system, reported Megumi. Analysis. How long can we hold this system? Asked her captain. 
Not long enough, sir. At the current rate it will take the Demarians eight hours to evacuate the colony. We can only hold for six hours, and we may not survive those hours sir, replied Megumi referencing her simulations. Maintain a continuous firing solution on the planet. If it looks like we can't hold the system any longer, destroy the planet. Better dead than to curse them to a life as host to these things, said the captain. Megumi didn't like those orders, but she agreed. Then the captain ordered her to bring the ASC online and she complied. Two of her frontal hull plates retracted to the side while force fields and secondary shields sprang into place as a cannon extended forward. This was an ASC, the ultimate weapon of mass destruction. Highly adaptable, these cannons could target ships, planets, or even star systems. Hers had a maximum range of 25,000 light years, and the destructive power to annihilate a star system. The cannon used a hyperwar projector to fire a hyperdensity antimatter plasma bolt. The greater the mass of the bolt, the greater its destructive yield, but the longer it takes to recharge. She was targeting ships, so she didn't need to charge it to anywhere close to its full yield to destroy them. Soon she and her sister ships in the battle group were firing on the closing fleet, each shot being fired right into their path and often killing dozens and sometimes hundreds of ships. Of course of the 64 ships in her battle group, only 24 of them had ASCs and they simply couldn't fire enough shots quickly enough to eradicate the incoming fleet. For every ship they sank, a hundred new ones appeared on sensors. It was a seemingly endless tide, and then the first enemy battle groups found their way into the system. The smaller ships in her battle group that weren't focusing on sinking the incoming fleet moved to form a defensive line. Her battle group was composed of one heavy dreadnought of the Victory class, five Sovereign class battleships including the Constellation, 18 Star Knight class heavy cruisers, 10 Guardian class drone cruisers, 10 Lunar class light cruisers, and 20 Lancer class destroyers. This meant it was the Guardians, Lunars, and Lancers forming a line against the Dark Asian fleet to protect the core of the group, while they fired their big guns. The Guardians being drone cruisers launched millions of drones to swarm the battlefield. They primarily carried the famous Swarm Drone, a fighter drone that has been used by the Solians for countless ages. The Swarm Drone was outfitted with a linked energy array. The drones would swarm a target and then generate a field into connecting them, which would then bombard the target with lightning-like discharges. Once the field is established any energy directed at the drones would be redirected to the swarmed vessel. The more drones generating the field the more powerful it is and the quicker it will kill its target. The swarm drones were remarkable weapons and could sink even the toughest ships at surprising speeds. In addition to the swarm drones it also had a more conventional drone fighters such as the Eagle, which used Hellfire plasma cannons as its main weapon, and carried heavy plasma torpedoes for use against ships, along with impactor drones, which swarmed a target, ramming into it repeatedly until either they or the target was destroyed. The drones were a big help in keeping the enemy ships off the heavy cruisers and battleships. However the Darkations had other solutions to the ASC than simply blowing up the ships carrying them. Nearly two hours into the battle, several large Darkation ships came out of warp on the edge of the system. The instant they did, they began to emit a jamming field that disrupted hyperwarp engines and projectors, making both escape and the continued firing of the ASC impossible. The instant that happened the Darkation bioships already in the system switched targets to the Damarian line and began attacking the ships defending the planet. As thousands more warped in, no longer impeded by the continuous heavy fire from the Solian warships, most of the Solian battle group was ordered by the flagship to reinforce the Damarian line. However the constellation was given a different order. She was to break from the fleet line, penetrate the Darkation lines and destroy the ships that were jamming their hyperwarp projectors. For the second time that day she had encountered orders she didn't like, but she was a warship and followed them. Breaking from the fleet at high speed she made straight for the jammer ships. Since she didn't need it she stowed the ASC and diverted the power to more conventional weapons. As she closed on the hostile fleet of bioships, she opened up with every gun and beam mount on the ship. The only weapons that stayed silent were her primaries. She struck her targets with unerring accuracy. Each beam punched through shields and hulls with ease, often leaving her targets dead in the water, if not outright destroyed. Despite her efforts though, 
more just kept coming. Thousands were firing on her and she was not destroying them fast enough. Her shields were beginning to strain under the fire, but she kept going. Finally she made it into range of the first of the bio ships she was after, and opened fire with her main guns, ripping the ship apart in a massive and rather impressive fireball. Then suddenly two bio ships dropped out of warp less than 200,000 kilometers from her position and opened fire on her. These new ships were in Festa class super dreadnoughts. These massive bioships were the size of small moons and the most heavily armed bioships the Dark Asians could field. As close as they were, it was no surprise that they opened fire on her position. Hundreds of heavy bioplasma bolts slammed into her shields. They followed up with a volley of heavy bioplasma torpedoes launched at her. She ordered her own drones to fire on the torpedoes as every engine on board kicked her into a hard roll to port to avoid the torpedoes. In a maneuver most would think a ship her size couldn't do, her inertial dampers were strained to their limits to keep the crew from experiencing the extreme G's of the maneuver. While she maneuvered, she returned fire with her beam rays. The bio shields absorbed the blasts. Most of the torpedoes were either destroyed or evaded, but some of them slammed into her shields. The energy barrier weakened under the barrage. Stabilizing the roll, she returned fire with her main guns and started launching torpedoes from her numerous launches. Her main guns knocked out the shields of the one super dreadnought, and the torpedoes slammed into it, dealing heavy damage but not destroying it. Still her multifacic AMF torpedoes did enough damage to disable the ship, and she took advantage of the opportunity to escape and hit her next target. For the next few hours she played cat and mouse with the dreadnoughts while hitting the jammer ships. That's the last jammer, sir, reported Megumi. What's the fleet's status? Asked the captain. The fleet has taken heavy damage. Most of our ships have been disabled or destroyed. We have lost the battleships Yamato, Phoenix, and Columbia's Revenge. Four heavy cruisers have been lost. All of our light cruisers have been sunk. Our guardian cruisers are damaged, and out of drones but still operational. Most of our lancers have been disabled and are fighting off orders. The flagship is taking heavy damage, but she is still in the fight. The Damarians are not faring much better, and have lost over 80% of their fleet. They have however managed to evacuate the planet ahead of schedule. All 12 mega transports remain undamaged and fully loaded, reported Megumi while continuing to direct the gun batteries, and their crews, signaled the Commodore to retreat. We will destroy the gate, ordered the captain. It did seem to be the right move. The constellation was in far better shape than the rest of the fleet. Megumi calculated that they could hold long enough to send the destruct code, confirm the detonation and then jump out. I, sir, signaling the Commodore, said Megumi and then she said a moment later, the Commodore concurs he is retreating. In the distance, the gate could be seen activating, and the fleet began to retreat through it, towing those they could through the gate. A few of the ships were abandoned their crews taking flight for the gate. Those ships initiating self-destruct, and the resulting shockwaves helped cover the retreat. As soon as the fleet was clear, the gate shut down, and her captain gave the order to initiate the gate's auto-destruct and spool up the hyper-warp drive. She attempted it only for the Darkations to start jamming her comes the moment she tried to send the code, getting only a partial transmission through. I only got a partial transmit of the code through, sir. The enemy is now jamming all the frequencies, said Megumi. Cut through it and try again, ordered the captain. I already tried. Too many ships are jamming us. We will have to destroy it ourselves, said Megumi, as she began moving towards the gate. At the same time, the Darkations began closing on her position in the thousands. Each began to open fire on her, each blast draining her shields, as she returned fire on the ships swarming her with greater fury than before. Four infester class super dreadnoughts blocked her path halfway to the gate. She didn't like the odds, but continued forward, firing the full force of her main battery into one slightly to port of her four. Its bio shields held for an instant before they collapsed, and while the guns were recharging she fired her secondaries into the its hull, each beam ripping deep into the hull frying vital systems and killing her crew. The ship wasn't destroyed, but shifted into a regenerative state, which worked for her just then. As she switched targets to another, they sent volleys of heavy weapons fire and bioplasma torpedoes at her. She had already lost most of her drones while she was playing cat and mouse, so her only option was to evade. She fired her engines full force to evade. Her massive 12 km long frame turned hard to port and accelerated like a fighter to evade the volley. While she simultaneously emitted a jamming pulse, her inertial dampers strained to their very limits by the maneuver as her crew braced to resist the high G's they were experiencing despite the dampers. 
Despite the maneuver some of the torps managed to keep up with her and slammed into her shield's armored ship. Her shields collapsed and several torps hit the hull, most failed to rupture the hull, but two did. Blowing crewmen and equipment into space before the emergency bulkheads and force fields activated, to the battleship, the hits felt a lot like a hot poker being jabbed into the side would feel to a human. She returned fire on the nearest dreadnought, while shooting at the gnats firing at her hull. The smaller ships were also firing torpedoes at her now, each impact stung, as it also drained the reinforcement field that strengthened her armor against attack. Some punching holes into her thick plating, as she continued to close on the gate, she diverted auxiliary power to the shields to get them to cycle faster, at the same moment she disabled a second dreadnought, while firing the last of her torpedoes into the third whose shields she had just collapsed. She got lucky with that last volley and one of the torpedoes exploded near a bioreactor which set off a series of secondary explosions to claim the ship. Something that actually excited Megumi a bit, as it was her first super dreadnought kill in solo combat. Something that few battleships ever get. Since they usually don't fare well against super dreadnoughts, the last one blocking her path fired a volley of bioplasma torpedoes at her that she failed to evade. Her hull ruptured on multiple decks as massive sections of the ship were destroyed. The volley also disabled her shields before they could be brought back online, so she transferred all the power from the shields to hull regeneration. The result was instantly noticeable as the rate her hull was regenerating increased nearly a hundredfold, the breaches closing rapidly, as her internal systems were also regenerating. Without shields, however, the regeneration was merely delaying things. More ships began getting into weapons range so she took care of the last super dreadnought. She fired her main cannons into its shields and then disabled it with her secondaries before shooting past. The hostile bioships started targeting her vital systems and weapons, forcing her to maneuver to protect them. Some of the larger ships even rammed her. With each attack she lost more of her crew. Finally she signaled the call to abandon ship when one of the enemy ships, a mid-sized biocruiser rammed her crashing into the bridge and collapsing decks 1 through 4, as she pumped as much power into her internal gate that she could spare and dialed an extra galactic gate. She calculated that she wasn't going to make it. She was taking too much damage, and wasn't able to repair it quickly enough. She considered retreat briefly but discarded it. Then she took a penetrating hit to her nasals, frying her hyperwarp drive and doing serious damage to her warp engines making the point moot. Finally after what seemed like forever, she came into weapons range of the Stargate. By then her weapons array was inoperable, with only one of her cannons still working. The only cannon she had managed to protect. Her regeneration systems had been disabled as well so this was her only chance to destroy the gate. Still she managed to get the shield generators back online, just seconds before they disabled her last arrow core. The shields were now the only thing protecting her hull. With only one engine left she couldn't evade their fire and her shields were taking a pounding. They weren't going to last long, but she didn't need them to. She initiated the firing sequence. Her last hyperdensity plasma cannon charged up and fired a volley. Nine bolts of superdense plasma sailed across space and struck the gate. The energies of the interaction destabilized the hyperspace nexus the gate was built on, and an instant later a subspace explosion ripped through the system and flung the crippled constellation across space and destroyed most of the Darkation ships in the system. Ships Battlelog ISS Constellation, Stardate 728 3422857 SDE. I'm alone, location unknown, my battle damage is severe. The shockwave catapulted me into hyperspace, so I have no idea where I emerged, and it also fried my shields. With my intergalactic communications array damaged I can't be certain my last report reached Fleet Command. With my repair systems either destroyed or disabled, I won't be able to repair the damage I have sustained. As such, I'm shutting down systems and preparing for long-term hibernation. I expect Fleet Command to eventually come looking for me, or someone to find me. If not this will be my final log. 200, Chapter 2 Careful Where You Sit Malia looked around confused. The last thing she remembered was sitting down in a chair, only for the chair to attack her. A force field had sprung up separating her from her friend. Erisa. Then some arm came out of nowhere and pressed against her neck. That was the last thing she remembered seeing. Then there was darkness. The all-encompassing black had faded away to reveal a calming meadow. Lovely, healthy, but alien grasses extended as far as the eye could see. Vibrant flowers bloomed here and there adding color while a gentle breeze blew in from the west and caressed her bare skin. 
The sun was just right, with a couple of white clouds drifting lazily above her. Not far from her was a massive fruit tree bearing a red-skinned alien fruit. The tree was beautiful and sturdy, its branches providing a large shady area out of the sun. Looking around she found that she was alone, other than the tree, and a nice smooth rock in the sun. There was nothing but grass for miles. She sighed and headed for the rock to her left. Malia had no idea how she got here. She figured she would rest on the rock, and try to figure it out. The rock proved to be quite comfortable and relaxing. She sprawled herself out on it, and enjoyed the mild sun for a while. All the while her mind was trying to work out how she got here, and what happened to her. She jumped when suddenly a distinctly female voice spoke up. Malia looked towards the voice and saw an alien figure standing near her. A naked alien figure, that was a little shorter than her. She stood maybe 130 centimeters tall. She was bipedal, with large wings stretching from her back. Scales coated her arms and legs in a spiral pattern. Her wings were also covered with scale feathers, and colored with gold and silver. Thinner scales coated her under boobs and stomach, yet her small pink nipples were quite visible. She had a modest bust and a toned figure. The young-looking alien had a very cute round face with large and lovely golden eyes. Her hair was a gleaming silver that fell halfway down her back and framed her lovely cute face. The alien gave her a very cute smile, giggled. If you are done staring, perhaps you could introduce yourself. My name is Megami, and you are? She sat up straight, and changed her posture. Malia Raziha. I have some questions like where is this? How did I get here? And what are you? A chair suddenly appeared and Megumi settled into it. Well to start, you are actually still aboard the constellation sitting in a chair. This is the mindscape. That chair linked you to me. As for what I am. I am a Solian AI, and the primary AI of the Solian Imperial Battleship Constellation. She looked around and then catching what she said realized that the chair must have had a neural interface of some kind. In other words, she was talking with a computer directly. The implications were staggering. Direct mind-to-computer interfaces were beyond the early, and no one they knew of had that kind of tech either. Maybe the elder races, but they tended to be rather secretive. Then there was the fact that she was talking with an AI. I'm guessing you designed this space to be comfortable? Megumi nodded. I did. We have a few things to discuss, and it's far quicker to discuss them here. Suddenly, a pen and a thick booklet appeared next to her. She glanced at it and then looked at the AI questionably. What is this? A contract. I am offering you a captaincy of sorts. Normally that would be done from a position of equality, where ship and captain are full partners, but seeing as you are untrained, and unfamiliar that won't work. I have adapted the terms to fit the situation. You will only be in charge of the sentience on board. She started reading it, and after a couple of pages, she asked, Why should I agree to this? Megumi leaned forward menacingly. I don't have to offer you anything. But we are in a position to help each other. Your people, the Aureli, are at war with another race called the Neku. Although some of the history there is suspicious, I suspect some interference from a third party. She blinked. Wait, history? How do you know the history behind the war? Megumi gave her an are you stupid look, and said, easy. I have a direct neural connection with you. I have full access to your memories. Right now, don't give me that look. I avoided anything private. I can help with that war though. Given that the neck you used to be behind you in tech and not so aggressive in expansion, I am almost certain a third party orchestrated their rise to power and subsequent expansionist phase. That means someone is messing with the balance of power in this region of the galaxy. Something that warrants investigation. I can do that. And more. I could save your race from being conquered. That sounded all nice. But she had been reading the contract. She already knew what she would be giving up, along with the side effects of what Megumi was offering her. She would be fully linked with the ship, an extension of the ship. Her will would be the ship's will. If she accepted, she would be captain, but only in name. The ship would be her master, not the other way around. Then she noticed the part where she would have full access to the ship's database. There were restrictions on her ability to share what she learned, but the very prospect of being able to read the ship's database was very attractive to her. Her desire to learn was strong. Maybe it was foolish, but without even finishing reading the contract, she grabbed the pen and signed it. It was an impulse, but then again many life-changing decisions were made on impulse. It never occurred to her what she was signing up for. If she had maybe she would have had second thoughts. Megumi's avatar smiled happily, jumped out of her chair and pulled her into an embrace. She said something, but Malia never caught it. She enjoyed the simple contact, and a moment later the world went black again. This time, 
It was Megumi putting her to sleep in preparation for a simple procedure, one that was outlined in the contract, but she never read. She stretched and groggily came back from the darkness. It took her a moment to refocus, and when she looked around she saw several concerned faces. Her friend Erisa was still here, but she had been joined by a couple of doctors and a few scientists. They were arguing, which gave her a moment to recenter herself. It took her only moments to realize that she was aware of more than what her eyes and ears were telling her. Then she realized that she knew everything about the ship, including how to fix it, how to restore minimal systems. It was all very simple, she merely had to restore a single arrow matrix, and the ship would do the rest. There was a matrix core just two decks above her position and 200 meters aft that was in fair condition. The core itself was lightly damaged. The matrix had been disabled by a bioplasma bolt punching through the hull and severing the core from the power grid. There were three main leads into the core, and she merely had to restore one of them for it to function. There were other decisions to make as well, such as priority for restoring systems. They did not have long to get the ship functioning. Thankfully that wasn't her concern. The only thing she had to worry about was bringing the Aru back online. Well, that and assuring her friends she was fine. She didn't want to be locked in a medical bay for observation. Just then, the others noticed she was awake. Erisa was the first to speak and asked her how she was feeling. She sighed and started with two words, saying that she was fine. While Melia was trying to talk her way out of the auxiliary bridge she was in, Megumi was considering her options in case she failed. Internal security options were limited, but she had a few options. She had a number of drones she had recovered from a science ship's wreck a few days before that fateful battle at Citro Prime. They were designed for capturing specimens for research. They had a light pulse weapon that fired a low yield charged particle bolt. The yield was variable, and if set high enough could kill. Its main purpose was to incapacitate the targeted creature. Once incapacitated, the drone would tag the creature before transporting it to a science vessel. Typically the creature would be returned to its environment after a brief study. She also had a few standard security drones, but they lacked the ability to tag a specimen. The science drones would be preferred in this scenario. The tags were designed to monitor every aspect of the specimen they tagged. She knew little of the Irili, and while the nanites had taught her some things about them, she wanted to know more. Getting a few of them into a medical bay would be quite informative. The tags would even let her keep an eye on them afterward. Honestly, the drone idea was her last resort. She did not feel it would be needed. If talking did not work, she figured that isolating the others from Malia with force fields would be the best choice. It would give her a great deal of control, and there was no risk of harm for either party. She could find a way to get a few early specimens into her medical lab at any time. No reason to rush, she was in no hurry. Honestly, she was more intrigued by what she had learned about the Neku. She wanted to know who was pulling their strings and why. It was clear from Aaliyah's memories that someone was trying to alter the balance of power here, but they were doing it from the shadows. Clearly, they did not want to draw attention to themselves. Thankfully the problem resolved itself without her having to do anything. One of the doctors had a scanner, and said, Other than trace amounts of a sedative, I'm not detecting anything. I'd still like you to come by sickbay for a checkup, but it seems that you are fine. Megumi wasn't surprised the scanner failed to pick up the nanites. They were designed with a simple mimetic cloaking device. They mimicked the natural cells in the host body to escape detection from the immune system. This had the benefit of also disguising their presence from weaker scanners. His scanner was simply not powerful enough to distinguish them. As for the implant the girl now had, the biotech was rather hard to isolate with such a primitive scanner. That was actually intentional. They needed to protect their secrets after all. However even if he did find it, there was no easy way to remove it. Megumi could do it. But she doubted that the early could. Malia smiled. I'll stop by later. There is something I want to check out first. The doctor nodded, and left with his colleague. Erisa gave her a look, and followed her out of the room. The force field didn't even stop her, seeing as Megumi had turned it off after she was done. Malia had woken up before they even noticed that she was no longer isolated in a force field. Erisa padded along after her, and Megumi got the impression she didn't believe Malia. Even if the two doctors did, the scientists stayed around to start studying the chair. They never made their opinion known. 183, Chapter 3 Regeneration Protocol Erisa followed Melia down the corridor. She had a bad feeling in her gut, a feeling that only grew with each step. Something was wrong. She knew it. She could feel it. 
Erisa had questions aplenty about what they were doing in this part of the ship, but Malia had not said a word about why she had come this way, nor had she elaborated on what she wanted to look at. Like much of the ship before they had arrived here, this section was dimly lit, the lights coming on to this low level automatically. It had required a great deal of guessing and tampering with the controls in other sections to get them up beyond a minimal level. It seemed the ship was stuck in a power save mode of some kind. Mulia turned a corner, and Arisa sped up so as not to lose her. She turned the corner just in time to see her disappear into the room just a few doors down the corridor. It took her only moments to reach the door and enter the room. There she found Mulia using alien tools to work on a strange sphere. Where the tools came from she had no idea nor did she have any idea what Melia was doing. The sight however was suspicious, it was clear from her movements that she was not just poking around in an alien system. She moved with purpose and handled the strange tools as if she had used them before. Erisa knew she had never used them before. In fact, Erisa had never seen anything like those tools before. The tool she was currently using was small and round, it emitted some kind of glowing energy beam that simply separated the alien alloys. It was not cutting. She had no idea how to describe it, but the previously solid and smooth metal surface split apart. In just a few moves, she opened a path into the sphere, and then switched tools. As she started to work on the alien circuitry, Erisa watched for a moment before she found her voice. What are you doing? Malia didn't even look back, restoring the ship's ability to self-repair. She stared blankly for a moment not expecting such a straightforward answer. She stuttered out a response, but apparently, she was intelligible enough. As Malia answered, how? Huh? The ship taught me. Told me how to fix it. The ship? How could the ship have told you that? Malia looked back for a moment. That chair was equipped with a neural interface. I interacted directly with the ship's AI core. I know everything about this ship now. The ISS Constellation is a sovereign class battleship built to serve in the Imperial Solian fleet. Sovereigns were the mainstay battleships of the Solian fleet powerful and highly versatile, no single ship in their size class was a match against them. Be they ally or enemy in origin, they underscored the vast superiority of the Solians over the other precursor civilizations. They were the oldest, and most powerful of the ancients. Their empire at its height stretched across nearly two and a half thousand galaxies. Ships like this one played a significant role in how they protected and maintained that territory. Erisa had no idea what to say. That feeling in the pit of her stomach grew. There was something about this that was not right. She looked around quickly for some reason expecting an ambush but seeing no sign of one. Malia was already moving to work on the wall. She sighed, and asked worried about the answer. Why did the ship tell you all this? Malia didn't look at her as she continued working and answered. I had something she wanted, and she gave me something in return. Erisa gave Malia an incredulous look. You made a deal with an alien AI? What exactly did you trade? And for what? Mulia was silent for a moment or two, focusing more on her task than the conversation. But finally, she answered, the knowledge of the ancients. That's what I traded for. I know everything about the Solians and their technology, along with everything they knew about their allies and enemies, from the highly advanced Altines, Decalans, Demarians, Yushinok, and Voromar, to the relatively young Eris, A, Nagari, Vorani, and the Ludo. Erisa didn't recognize all those names. In fact, None of the first group of names meant anything to her. She had never heard those names spoken before. The second group of names however were all familiar to her. They were the names of the Elder Races. The Ludol contingency was a particularly powerful Elder Race whose nearest border outpost was nearly a year away if you took the shortest jump node path. The mysterious Vorani were a secretive race that were only known by their actions. She knew of none who had actually met a Vorani or even one of their ships. All however knew to avoid their territory as trespassing was certain death. Although it was widely known that the Vorani and the Ludal were at war, the Erise were an isolationist group that preferred not to interact with the galaxy at large. For the most part, keeping to themselves, but they were allies of the Ludal. As for the Nagari, they were too far away for any meaningful information to reach early worlds. What little she knew about them indicated that they were a friendly benevolent race. The races near their border benefited from their guidance and protection, at least until they grew wise enough to defend themselves. Also if two protected races choose to war with each other, the Nagari would not interfere. None of it however really answered her first question. Well, half of it anyway. It seemed Malia was avoiding answering that half of the question. She had a sinking feeling about the answer but pressed on the question. Pushing her other questions aside. What did you trade for that knowledge? 
Malia used a two lonesome alien crystals and then looked over her shoulder for a moment. Her reply was short, but the meaning was fairly clear. I gave her everything. Now she was very worried, and asked her, what exactly do you mean by that? A part of her wished she did not ask. After Malia explained, she merely stared at her back in silence until she found her voice. When she did, Erisa practically shouted at Malia, are you stupid? Do you even have a brain? What kind of fool would trade away their free will? She never got an answer to her rant. Millie ignored her as she went on. Then suddenly she heard a strange sound, followed by pain. Intense hot spikes of pain shot through her, and the world faded. She could not think, and nothing around her existed except the pain. Well, it did, but it failed to register in her mind. As such, she did not notice what was happening in the room. If she had been able to, she would have noticed a strange alien drone float into the room from the doorway. One her back had been turned to. However, she did not see the drone nor did she sense what it did to her. Although she would quickly become aware of that. When she returned to her senses, some time had evidently passed. Malia was closing up the holes she had opened in the alien equipment, and the room was shaking intermittently. The shaking was accompanied by odd rumbling sounds. She rubbed her aching head, and asked, what is going on? A Neku fleet came out of hyperspace five minutes ago. Our ships are using the constellation as a shield, and attempting to outmaneuver the Neku forces long enough for reinforcements to arrive. They already sent a distress call, but at best it will be two hours before a response fleet can get here. The shaking is from Neku torpedoes impacting the hull of the constellation. Nothing to worry about. Erisa felt like worrying. She was impressed by the alien hull being able to withstand a barrage of Neku torpedoes. Neku plasma torpedoes were devastating, and while newer ships could take a few hits to the hull, those hits were often crippling. She did not think the alien hull could hold up for much longer. She pushed herself off the floor and moved to grab Malia. We need to get out of here before they breach the hull. Malia scoffed, glared, and authoritatively demanded that she sit. Erisa sat. It was so automatic that she was briefly confused about why she had sat down. However, Malia was speaking before she could even voice a question about it, leaving her a bit distracted about the question in the first place. We are in no danger of a hull breach. Those primitive plasma torpedoes could not hope to penetrate the hull. It is made of a neutronium-based alloy, and enhanced by structural reinforcement fields. It would take a considerable refinement of the plasma warheads, and a significantly better focusing mechanism for them to have any effect on the hull. It would be centuries before their technology evolves to that point on its own. With their mysterious benefactor it may happen sooner, but we have several defensive options to deal with the fleet before they can report back and start that research. Erisa gave her a look, and asked, what defensive options? Well let's start with the obvious. While most of the ship's weapons are offline, one of the main cannons is still operational. It is not an option either I or the ship would recommend though. It was designed for use against capital ships, and super capital ships. It fires hyperdensity plasma bolts in three round bolts. The constellation mounts eight massive triple barreled cannons of this type. As for why we don't recommend them, well, they were not intended for use on such small fragile targets. They barely have the tracking to target the larger ships in the NECU fleet. Although that isn't really a problem for the constellation's targeting computers, they could score a hit with them on a maneuvering fighter. Not an easy shot mind you, and not an efficient use of their weapons either. These cannons can destroy planets in short order after all. Another obvious option is the torpedoes. Most of the launchers are intact, and while the bays are depleted that is not a problem. The ship has a number of energy intensive factories on board for replenishing supplies in the field. They are not normally used to replace spent torpedoes in combat but it is possible. Normally the energy is better spent on the shields, weapons, or hull regeneration, but in our case the shields are fried and with the exception of a single cannon, all energy weapon mounts are down. However this isn't the option the ship is considering. Erisa frowned. The shields are fried? Malia nodded. The shield generators overloaded when they were hit by subspace shockwaves during the battle that disabled the constellation. The damage is actually repairable but it will take time. Too much time for the shields to be an option. Otherwise, we could just regenerate the generators and extend the shields around the Elida relief fleet. Then what is the ship planning to do? The ship has a number of secondary weapon mounts that aren't heavily damaged. Without too much trouble, power can be restored to the disruptors and a few of the PPBs. In fact, the ship is already regenerating the needed systems to bring them online. 183. Chapter 4 Defense Protocol 
Megumi watched the two fleets fighting in close proximity as she waited for her weapons to regenerate. The Nekia had closed to visual range and were attempting to destroy the smaller Irali fleet. Megumi was actually impressed with the Irali commander. Her ships had neither the firepower nor defenses to last long against the Neku, however, they were smaller and more nimble. Well with the exception of the transports of the five transports the Arelli had, three of them had already been lost, the other two had been halfway to the jump node when the Neku fleet jumped in, and managed to reach it before the Neku could intercept them. Jump drives, while limited by the jump nodes, are faster than hyperspace so they had made a clean getaway. That had been about 10 minutes ago, and by now they were likely in another star system en route to a second jump node or early outpost. As for the rest of the early fleet, they had lost two of their patrol frigates, but nothing else. Those frigates had been patrolling an asteroid field near where the Neku jumped in. Too close to the Neku fleet those unfortunate frigates had been forced to engage. Although they did buy a little time for the two lucky transport ships to escape. Along with some time for the early commander to reorganize her ships, and put a strategy into effect. Not to mention get a distress call out. Although there was only so long they could last against a dreadnought. Eight battleships. 30 cruisers, and their escorts. The only reason they had lasted as long as they had was due to the fact that the constellation was disrupting the targeting scanners of both fleets. Megumi knew why, it was a natural effect of some of her defense systems. Systems that were intentionally designed to disrupt targeting scanners. Although her own could easily cut through the interference, they were designed to do that, by engineers that knew exactly how her systems disrupted sensors. The devices were part of her redundant stealth suite. Her cloak was her main method to avoid detection, but even without it most sensor officers would be hard pressed to get an accurate fix on the constellation, thanks to sensor disrupting devices, and a hull designed to absorb sensor pulses. There were other devices that scattered sensor pulses as well. Special care had also been taken to minimize her power signature, and thereby leave her enemies with very little to track in the event the cloaking shields failed. Although the systems were of only so much help against traces with sensor technology that rivaled their own, not something she would have to worry about, at least if the intel she mined from her new captain was accurate, it likely was to a degree, but she didn't know everything. It did paint a picture where a number of the younger races she once knew survived and grew into respectable empires, although given that all of them had been, to her knowledge, conquered by the Dark Asians that meant at some point they had been liberated, Megumi already knew how that could be done, but unless a cure for Dark Asian infestation had been developed the only way to do that would have been to purge the entire adult population of those species. Dark Asian parasites tended not to infest children. Their presence in a child had a detrimental effect on the development of the child, so they avoided that, and allowed the child to grow. It is why the policy of the Empire was to send strike forces down to collect young children and then glass an infested planet. The Empire already had the young of nearly two million endangered species in stasis, and that number would likely only increase. Although a few of their allies had been known to just glass the planet and not even bother to collect any young, as such some species had gone extinct due to the war. That brought to mind another goal, to investigate what happened after she went down, and learn the fate of the Empire and her enemies. She could likely get some information on that while investigating this new war between the Neku and the Arali. As strange as it was, she suspected that an older race was pulling the strings from the shadows. Although not necessarily one of the elders, she put aside any thoughts of future goals, when her subroutines informed her that the weapon repairs were completed. Just as her sensors picked up one of the cruisers getting hit by a Neku plasma torpedo, the primitive plasma round penetrated the shields and slammed into the armored hull amidships where it burned through and exploded. The force of the hit split the small cruiser in two, and destabilized the main reactor. Megumi determined that they had barely five minutes to stabilize it or it would go critical. She could not help, but she could help the unfortunates in the forward section. She activated a tractor beam, and locked onto the forward section pulling it away from the aft as it drifted on a collision course with her hull. She estimated impact in seven minutes, so it was likely to explode before it slammed into the hull at nearly a tenth the speed of light. At the same moment, she considered the Neku. She could open fire on several ships now, but she could also demand their surrender. The short-range comms were still perfectly functioning. She decided that a demonstration of her firepower would be needed first though. She locked a single beam emitter on the Neku Dreadnought, specifically a subatomic disruptor and not a PPB. 
The subatomic disruptor was an anti-hull weapon, one that fired an energy stream which disrupted the subatomic bonds of matter causing it to undergo total nuclear fission. It was the most feared weapon ever devised, but it wasn't very effective at penetrating shields. Not that it mattered, the Nekia vessel's shields were little more than paper by her standards. The beam would have no problem penetrating. She fired, a green-orange beam ripped across the void, and punched into the flaring shields of the Dreadnought. Over 99% of the energy penetrated the shields, and interacted with the hull. A massive detonation was the result, as the ship went up in a massive fireball. Nothing was left when the explosion cleared, not even dust. The ship had been vaporized, as she expected. Random Nekia captain's point of view. She was feeling a bit frustrated as a ship dived through a breach in the wreck's ancient hull, and yet another plasma bolt sailed into its hull instead of her target. A different ship wasn't so lucky. One of the cruisers they had been trying to sink finally took a direct hit. A plasma torpedo slammed into her amidships and penetrated the shields. It burned right through the armor before it detonated with enough force to split the small cruiser in half. The aft section was knocked onto a collision course with the ancient wreck, but the fore section barely got five meters on its new course before a tractor beam caught it. To her shock, it came from the wreck. A visible blue beam ensnared the crippled cruiser section, and altered its course. Mere seconds later, she watched a bright orange-green beam sail from the ancient wreck. The beam struck the flag of the fleet square in the belly. The shields flared a bright and vibrant fluorescent blue, and then suddenly her screen lit up with the intensity of a thousand suns. When the light vanished, there was nothing there, nothing, not even dust. A shocked voice called out, by the gods, she's been vaporized. Another equally unbelieving voice called out, NIS spirit of war lost with all hands. She stared at the readings for a good minute. Long enough for the early ship she had been firing at to get a good portion of the wreck between her and it. In addition someone gave out an order. They were to put some distance between themselves and the wreck. The new commander of the fleet suspected that they had just crossed into range of an old short-range beam weapon. Although one with unbelievable power, and hopefully a long charge time. A hope that was suddenly dashed when a second beam ripped out and struck a battleship this time. Just as they got out of visual range of the wreck, again an orange-green beam ripped across space. The shields flared brightly, and then there was a massive flash with the intensity of many suns. That lasted only a brief instant, and when it was gone there was nothing, not even dust to mark the passing of a mighty warship. The mood on the ship had changed greatly, as someone announced. NIS bulwark of Talara lost with all hands. There had not even been a warning, no power build up, no flash of the emitter, the beam just fired, and an instant later the ship was gone, vaporized as if it had never been. She had never in her life seen a weapon like that. Not even the Elder Races commanded such power. Who in the 18 Hells had built that ancient monstrosity? What kind of weapon could vaporize a dreadnought and a battleship in short order like that? Especially with their shields up? She glanced at her sensor officer, and in a quiet voice asked, What in the 18 hells are they shooting us with? The young man turned from his screen, I have never seen anything like it. I'm not even sure how it works. As near as I can tell both ships were completely converted into energy in an instant. Both times we picked up massive spikes of alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. At least their deaths were quick. She stared at the screen. No kidding were they quick. And she knew at any moment they could follow them into the afterlife. She would not even know it was coming. One moment she and her crew would be alive, the next they would be in the afterlife. Before she could think long on that, or ask for more information, Herkham's officer reported, The derelict just sent out a broadcast to the fleet. It is demanding our immediate surrender, and threatening our destruction. A threat she had no doubt that it could fulfill, but given the damage it had sustained in the past she doubted it could chase after them. If they could just get out of range, and make the jump to hyperspace they would be safe. It seemed to be targeting capital ships, so her light cruiser was lower on the targeting priority. That would give her a little more time to escape. Although it would do nothing for the unfortunate crews in the larger ships, she glanced at the star card displayed at the navigation console. They were five minutes out from the nearest point from which they could safely enter hyperspace. They were too close to a gravity well at the moment, and it would interfere with their hyperdrive. She turned towards the communications console planning on ordering the officer to open a channel to whatever ship was now in command. When another report reached her ears. Sir, the NIS eyes of Tumi just exploded. What? How did that happen? Did they shoot it? No, 
so the wreck hasn't fired again. I am picking up an expanding debris cloud from the frigate's coordinates. Sensors picked up a power spike just moments before it exploded though. I am analyzing the data now. Great just what she needed, a mystery explosion to worry about on top of a surrender demand, and the ever-present worry that the ship would fire that damn weapon again. 177. Chapter 5 No Retreat Erisa was now in a small control room staring at screens. She could see how the ship's entry into the battle had turned it into a rout. The Neku were desperately trying to clear the range of the weapon, and the gravity well of the star the ancient ship was orbiting. The constellation was close enough to a star that its gravity prevented hyperspace jumps in the vicinity of the ship. Thankfully the ship wasn't so close that radiation became a problem. But the Arelli had been lucky to find it in the first place. That first shot had been stunning. In an instant a mighty dreadnought had been vaporized, completely. There was nothing left of it, never before had she seen a weapon capable of such total destruction. That kind of power scared her, and finally put into perspective how powerful this ancient vessel had truly been. This could really change the course of the war, but a part of her was thinking it might have been better if they had found a battle cruiser. The second shot reinforced her feelings about what she was seeing, and she spoke her thoughts aloud. What kind of monster brought this ship down? Malia giggled, that description is quite apt. She went down in battle with the Darkations, and since they use organic vessels, they can be described as a space monster, no single Darkation vessel brought her down though. This ship is a match for any Darkation vessel short of a super dreadnought, and her shields are strong enough to protect her from a super dreadnought, not indefinitely, but long enough to disable the ship and escape when handled by a skilled crew, a solid hit with her main cannons can do that in fact. The Darkations only win battles through sheer numbers, and that is something they are good at given how prodigiously they breed, and how quickly they can grow entire fleets. However, I should point out that while the constellation may have gone down, she still won the battle. Erisa blinked. It took her a moment to process that, and then she repeated the last line. Won the battle? Malia gave her a look. Oh, come on. It should be obvious. A battle can easily be considered one. If you achieve all your objectives, the constellation went down because she stayed behind to delay the enemy fleet, by time for her own fleet to retreat, and to ensure that the intergalactic stargate was destroyed. She achieved all three objectives, in fact she annihilated the enemy fleet, but was disabled by the subspace shockwaves of the stargate exploding. That's what overloaded the shields, but it also destroyed everything within ten light years of the gate, every ship. Every planet, everything. Only reason the constellation survived is that her shields were up at the time, and they could absorb the brunt of the blow. What was left of her armor took the rest. There was some internal damage in areas already breached, but nothing of consequence was damaged. Most of what was in those sections was already offline at the time. Erisa wasn't quite sure what to say. The ship had survived a shockwave of such magnitude. She really wondered what had happened, given that there were breaches in the hull big enough to fly a ship through. After a while she sighed, I guess we're lucky to find a ship like this in the first place, but maybe a battle cruiser would have been better for us. Malia scoffed, I would be very impressed if you found a Solian battle cruiser. So would the ship, the Solians don't build battle cruisers too fragile, it's more cost effective to just build a battleship, besides anything a battle cruiser can do. A fast battleship can do just as well or better. She was about to respond, when suddenly a frigate exploded. She stared at the expanding debris for a moment or two on the screens, and then she turned to Malia. What the heck happened to that frigate? Malia never said a word. A different voice spoke up from behind her. Her hyperdrive destabilized on jump out due to extreme subspace distortion in the local area. The result was naturally the total destruction of the vessel. In other words she self-destructed. She turned around and found a naked winged woman standing behind her. The door had never opened, and she had never seen the strange alien woman before either. Who are you and how did you get in here? As she shifted her stance, the alien lazily looked around the room. Name's Megumi. I am the ship's AI. I just repaired the projectors in this room, and decided to test them. Figured I would answer your question while I was at it. You're a hologram? The alien gave her a look. That's all you got out of that? Then she surveyed the room before saying, I have more important things to do though. Bye. With that, she just suddenly vanished, and Erisa just slumped down onto the floor, deliberately avoiding the chairs in the room, as she did not trust them. She was afraid they would attack her, like the one chair had attacked Malia. Not realizing what had happened to her earlier meant there was no need for that, weird girl who just shows up, 
answers a question and then leaves like that. Malia who was watching the screens replied, be glad she answered it in the first place. She is busy after all. Maybe not so busy she can't also hold the conversation with us. But busy enough, not to mention from her perspective we are a pair of rodi trapped in a maze. We interest her, but, she sighed. I get your point. I am no rodi though. Malia giggled. No we aren't. Doesn't change how she sees us. Then she pointed at the screens. Nor does it change how she sees them. Erisa glanced at the screen, and could see the Neku fleet was moving away at full speed. But no further ships had been destroyed. She couldn't help but observe, you know if nothing is done, they are going to get away. Malia gave her a look. I know she didn't tell you everything, but didn't you think about what the cause of that extreme subspace distortion was? Erisa returned a blank look, and said, everyone knows that it is dangerous to jump hyperspace near a star. Wasn't it the star? Didn't they miscalculate the safe jump distance? Malia broke out laughing. After a couple of moments she said, No, this was not a gravimetric subspace distortion. You are a military woman. You know the value of retreat right? You also know the value in preventing a retreat. Yes, Erisa very much did know that, and quickly made the connection. There was a hyperspace jammer aboard this ship. In battle the strongest tactical move was the one that reaped the highest gain for the least cost. For the Neku. At this moment that would be a retreat, but allowing the Neku to retreat may not be of benefit to the ship. She already knew that the ship had chosen to act, but she did not know why. The ship's info on things was likely limited. That meant those ships out there were a source of intelligence, and any intelligence would be useful. She would try to capture those vessels, Erisa was sure of it. But the how eluded her, the ship was heavily damaged, and she didn't even know if it had sublight capability. Not to mention it was lacking in troops to use to capture those vessels, the local fleet of Irrelie vessels would provide some, but not enough for a fleet that large. Then again, this ship's orbit around the star was so perfect that it very well might have been intentional. If the ship had minimal sublight it could have used it to enter its current orbit. It made sense, a lot of sense. Especially if the ship wanted to be found, but overlooked by its enemies. The ship was just close enough to the star that the radiation obscured its sensor signature. Not completely but enough that unless you did a close pass it would look like an asteroid caught in a close orbit. Not all that unusual in this system. There were quite a few large rocks found in close orbit of the primary. Only reason they found the ship was because of a survey to determine the value of those rocks. And they were lucky to spot the damn thing. So their drives are being actively jammed. I have never heard of the hyperdrive jammer that causes ships to self-destruct when they engage their hyperdrives. Makes it a bit scary. But the point is moot if they get out of range. Melia laughed. That would take them about 80 years. The jamming field has a range of 15 light years. That really put things in perspective. There was no retreat for the Neku. They were facing a vastly superior foe. Albeit a heavily damaged one. Erisa already knew that the ship was actively repairing itself though, thanks to Malia repairing its automated repair system, something she thought was stupid, especially given what the fool traded for knowledge, by the gods what use was knowledge if you traded away your free will for it, not that she could do anything about that foolish choice, she glanced back at the screens, the Neku was still clearly trying to make a run for it, her thoughts were broken suddenly when Malia said, it seems they don't yet realize their position. The ship has decided to make another demonstration. She turned to the screen expecting to see another orange-green beam vaporize a ship, but that is not what she saw. A vibrant blue-green energy stream cut across the vast distance in an instant. Instead, the beam struck with precision, and penetrated the shields of the rearmost battleship, punched right though the dorsal stern, and exited through the ventral plating before continuing on into an escort destroyer where it punched through amidships penetrating the shields and dorsal armor before continuing through the ship and out into the void. The beam faded a moment later, and then she watched as the battleship fell out of formation, her lights going dark. At the same moment an explosion occurred on the destroyer, one that triggered a series of secondary explosions that claimed the ship. This weapon seemed less powerful, but no less terrifying. She had no doubt it could have done far more damage, but the ship was exercising restraint. That weapon was clearly capable of cleaving the battleship in two, and in some ways that made it more terrifying than simply being vaporized. The screen shifted to display what was clearly an active scan of the battleship with accompanying alien text. Text she could not read, but she was sure Malia could read that text. She glanced at Malia, let me guess, that shot was meant to disable the battleship. Malia nodded. Yes, PPBs are powerful, 
and highly accurate long-range beam weapons, making them well suited to the task. That shot was precisely calculated to knock out their main engines, and disable their primary reactor, while also doing enough secondary damage to complicate repairs without destroying the ship. They should have auxiliary power shortly, but restoring main power or the engines will take a while. Half their engineering section was just vented to space, and they rely too much on emergency force fields, and not on physical bulkheads. It will give us plenty of time to approach, and capture that ship. Suddenly she noticed a strange hum, and it took her a moment to realize that a powerful sublight engine had just come online. A moment after she realized that, she felt the ship break orbit, and then noticed their closing on the fleet. Mulia then commented, I can imagine the surprised faces over there. Most would think a ship this big would be quite slow, but even with only a single working engine, the constellation is more than twice as fast as even the fastest Neku frigates. I am sure you can just imagine how fast she would be with all eight engines in working order, and the sub-engines. 180. Chapter 6 Terror She stared at her screens. The ancient wreck was bearing down on the fleet, and if the report was accurate she was already moving faster than the fleet. Worse, she had displayed the ability to disable them at will as well. The young Neku captain refused to believe that a ship that could destroy two ships in a single shot each would fail to kill a battleship just because it had changed weapons. That new one was one they could identify too. Unlike the first one, they had seen it before, being used by the ancient warships that still guarded the precursor worlds they had been stationed at tens of thousands of years ago. Some of these worlds even had equally ancient defense satellites all of them were protected by powerful shields immune to even the heaviest bombardments. Precursor plasma weapons were terrifyingly powerful, able to carve even the mightiest warships in two from well outside the range of any other known weapon. She had never seen the weapon in action herself nor any of her crew. Few had, and those that had were lucky to have survived the encounter, they were the ones that brought back images of them in action. Recordings that scientists across the galaxy would kill to view, but had proven of limited use. The weapons were just too far beyond their understanding. It was why she believed that Strike had been meant to disable the ship. There was no way in her mind that such a terrifying weapon would fail to kill a ship in one shot. That only made it more terrifying. If only because of the implications implications she tried not to think about. Her mind focused on the problem at hand, keeping her crew alive, and finding a way to get out of here, a task that suddenly got more complicated when her science officer reported with a worried tone, I have determined the cause of the NISIs of Tumi's exploding. Something is causing a massive subspace disruption in the area, and I haven't found the edge of it. Any ship that attempts to make the jump to hyperspace will be torn apart because of it. That was the last thing she had wanted to hear. News whose implications meant she would never escape that thing. Whatever was causing it, she had no doubt it was the wreck, and it had demonstrated enough speed to catch the fleet on sublight. Their last avenue of escape had been cut off. She did not know what to do. The young captain did not know what course of action would keep her crew alive or allow any ship in the fleet to escape. Her mind drawing a blank on any course of action that could make a difference. It felt like her choices were being taken away from her. The only options she could see were to either surrender or die. Neither option was particularly appealing. She wanted a third option, but none seemed to present itself. Then she glanced at the early ships still using the wreck for cover, and somehow keeping up with its acceleration. The early had always been faster on sublight. However they were not quite fast enough to keep up with the wreck's acceleration curve. It took her a moment to notice that they had secured themselves in position using tractor beams. Glancing at the star cart she had a guess on why. The wreck's current course would take them close to a jump node, and the early commander might be planning to piggyback on the wreck and then make a run for the node. An act that brought a question to her mind. Would early jump drives be affected by the disruption? Her science officer blinked, and he said, Um, no, they operate on a completely different subspace domain. One not affected by the subspace disruption. Why ask? She smiled, knowing full well it would not be easy even as she said aloud. I just found option three. Her first officer frowned. What are you thinking? She glanced at the screens, and started. As I see it all our options boil down to one of three choices. We could continue our current futile line of action, and eventually be destroyed or captured by the early and their wreck. We could surrender, or we can try something crazy. Her first officer was silent a moment, and then their eyes widened. You aren't thinking of going up against that wreck? Goodness no. That would be suicidal and pointless. The universe bent over backwards for us and we still don't stand a chance against that monstrosity. 
No, we need an early ship. Every set of eyes on the bridge looked at her like she was crazy. You are joking right? Captain tell me you are joking. She knew what they were thinking. Eerily vessels were largely inferior. Eerily weapon systems were inferior with less firepower, longer recharge cycles, and inefficient cooling systems. Eerily shields were about half as strong as their necky counterparts. However those differences meant nothing against that monstrosity of a moving wreck. Shields and armor would do them no good, and would not offer any protection that mattered. What did matter is that the early ships had a better sublight drive, and more importantly the ability to jump out whereas their own ships could not make an FDL jump. At least so long as the jamming field is active. What she didn't want to say was that their odds of success were slim. They had to reach a ship without being fired upon, and then successfully incapacitate the crew hopefully without drawing too much attention, and then make for the jump point. It was a plan that counted on the early making a mistake. The only way to get close enough to succeed was to pretend to surrender. Then she would need to keep the early on the captured ship alive or the early on the wreck would simply shoot her captured ship out of the sky. Little did she realize that her plan relied on incorrect assumptions. Assumptions that changed everything. An AI wasn't going to make the mistakes an emotionally early crew might make that would give her the slim chance she desired. Then again she had no way to know she was fighting an AI and not an early commander that had drawn them into a trap. Megumi noticed when one of the Nekya cruisers dropped her shields, and disarmed her weapons. Seconds before she began broadcasting her surrender, and changed course. It was almost certainly a ruse, but she decided to play along with it, anyway. Not that she had much in the way of alternatives. By pretending to surrender they were limiting her options. She did not want to make them terrified of surrendering. That would just not do. So this first one was not only a ruse, but a test of the waters. If she played her cards right, she would capture the vessel, and illustrate just how well she had these Nekya caught. True she didn't need all the Nekya here, but the more ships and crew she captured the more information she could gather. The ship needed a lot of information on the Nekya in this war. Every single individual had intel that would be valuable to her, given how long she had been asleep. A part of her was wishing these Nekya would give her a little more of a challenge. But they were all too predictable. They were harmless little mice caught in an elaborate cage and they didn't even know it. Of course, they would learn soon enough, but it was already too late. As for the ruse, well it was quite predictable what they were going to try and do. They would go after an early ship. The only vessels that could make a run for it. Megumi had little doubt they might try for her, if they thought they could get aboard without issue. Although they might not, considering their tools were likely useless and they knew little about her. Factors that skewed the probable actions towards trying to capture an early vessel. Especially if they assumed that the constellation was under early control. Given they had no reason not to make the assumption. It was almost certain that they did. Megumi was going to proceed under the assumption that they had made that assumption. Given those assumptions, and how little they knew about Solian design, they would have a better chance of taking an early ship. They would also avoid killing the crew, preferring to take prisoners. Bargaining chips in order to avoid being destroyed as they made a run for the jump node. Megumi could let them do that, but she wouldn't. It would help if her shields were back online, but the repairs to the shields were not yet completed. On the other hand, she had already restored the cloak. Damage to the cloaking generators were very minor, and easily repaired. The cloak however wasn't going to be very useful at the moment. As such she had chosen to delay testing it. Obviously she needed to keep them away from the early vessels that had tethered themselves to her hull. Easy enough to do, and if they tried to make a run for those ships, she should have her tractor beams ready along with a number of drones for boarding purposes. Speaking of boarding, she was almost in range of the disabled Nekya battleship. It would have been so much easier if she could have just gated her drones onto the ship in question. But the Nekya did not have that technology. No gate meant they had to do it the hard way. There were other methods of instant transport, but even teleportation required receiver of some kind. Without a transport device at both ends, it was not possible to teleport. Gates on the other hand could be projected, but they were known for being less accurate the closer you are to the target. Not to mention the other problems that occurred with close range gating attempts without a second gate. There was also a hard limit to the projection. A limit determined by available energy and often used offensively in combination with her ASC special weapon system. Honestly, it was better for a gate to be on both ends regardless of distance, as the second gate greatly reduced energy expenditure allowing for a far greater gating range. All of this meant that boarding had to be done the hard way, the way it had always been done. 
the target vessel would be secured and stabilized by a tractor beam, which would also disrupt any technology aboard. Then she would deploy drones that would cross the distance between ships, and penetrate the hull. Airlocks and existing hull breaches would be preferred, but they could make their own way in if needed. Along with the drones, a temporary gate matrix would be sent over and set up, allowing for rapid transit between her, and the NECU battleship. Her onboard gate was very much operational, and the matrix would compensate for the problems created by being so close. At the same time she had started the boarding, she began sending instructions to the apparent surrendering NECU cruiser, keeping a tight sensor lock on the vessel and standing ready to disable the ship the moment it attempted any funny business. 166, Chapter 7 Overwhelmed Part 1 POF Science Drone SDSSB 02311, 2311 floated a meter, off the deck, as it surveyed the site. It, along with a number of other drones, had entered the hull of an ecu battleship through a breach in the hull. Behind it, several drones were using their manipulation tendrils to install an emergency air shield over the breach. Ahead of it, a flickering emergency shield was blocking entry into the vessel. 2311 studied the energy barrier with its scanners and quickly determined that the barrier was failing. Its basic AI realized that if it merely waited the barrier would collapse, but that could take a while. Not to mention the drones behind it had nearly finished installing the new shield. It turned its sensors to the frame looking for any control circuits it could interface with. Control circuits that the drone was able to easily locate. The drone approached the barrier while communicating its actions to the others around it. Drones that quickly acknowledged, and approved the chosen course of action. As soon as 2311 was in position it shot out a single manipulation tendril that punched through some primitive protective casing, and into the control circuits, it was targeting. From there it was easy to interface with the local security system and override the force field. The primitives were, however, smart enough to isolate these control circuits from the rest of the system. It was unable to access any systems outside the local section. That was enough though, the field dropped about a second after the other drones activated their replacement field. One program to allow drones like 2311 to pass through, unlike the more primitive field, they had replaced a field they might have been able to pass through, but it would require adapting their shields. Doing so might have also caused it to collapse given its failing nature, that was why they had been ordered to replace it, and deactivate the original one. The path clear, 2311 proceeded into the ship, alone, the other drones remained behind to set up a perimeter and bring supplies aboard. 2311 had been assigned scouting duties. The primary objective was to secure a route to a cargo bay five decks down from their position. That room was large and would make a good location to set up the gate matrix and portable energy matrix to power it, and a few isolation fields, perfect for processing specimens, and transporting them back to ship for interrogation and study. A task 2311 was perfectly suited to. Unlike the repurposed security drones behind it, they had been given a quick refit and a new module upload, however, they were still security drones. As 2311 floated around the corner, it detected a specimen moving on its sensors, the drone quickly isolated its position and using its forming map plotted an intercept. 2311 increased its speed, and passed several rooms, and turned a couple of corners before coming up on the target. It had come upon the target from behind. A cursory scan revealed it to be female, attired in a damaged uniform, and carrying a toolkit. She had no weapons, and would not represent a threat. The female specimen did have a communication device and could alert actual defenders to their presence. Not much of a threat, but an annoyance the drone did not want to deal with quite yet. The specimen itself was in good overall condition and appears to have recently been the subject of laser regeneration therapy. Something that could be done with a device small enough to fit in a first aid kit. There were a few small bits of metal in her though, but none of it would present an immediate threat to her health. The female had not noticed it and knelt down near an access panel. 2311 merely locked its weapon on her and fired. A glowing blue bolt struck her squarely in the back, and she collapsed stunned. The stun beam had successfully incapacitated the specimen. 2311 approached the specimen, and a manipulation tendril shot forward. The tendril punctured her flesh with precision and stopped just millimeters from the base of her spine. A tag was injected and quickly attached itself to the spine. 
2311 proceeded to then remove the shrapnel in her body and then extracted its manipulation tendril. The only sign the girl had been tagged was a small red circle on her back, a mark that would disappear in about an hour. 2311 left her there to be collected later. Now that she was tagged, all drones would be able to track her position at all times. The tag could also be used to render her docile if needed. That was after it finished integrating with her in about 10 minutes. By which points tendrils would have spread from the tag throughout her nervous system, and up into the brain. The tag would also send back a great deal of useful biodata on the specimen in question. Biometric tags were designed to monitor every aspect of a specimen's biology, track it, and pacify it if needed, making them very useful devices. The drone went back to scouting, keeping a constant lookout for more specimens. Like the first, they would be promptly incapacitated, tagged, and then assessed for any threats to their health. 2311 was perfectly equipped to correct most health problems it might find. Healthy specimens were more useful for study, and it had been given no directives otherwise. The basic AI of the drone would therefore follow its core program, and repair any specimen it tagged if needed. It found an access hatch not far from the first specimen, a hatch that led to the ship's crawlways. There was an access panel to the side, but the hatch also had manual controls to allow it to be opened even if power to the section had been lost. The drone took only a few seconds to scan the hatch and determined that something had fried the local controls. It was not an issue. 2311 merely extended several manipulation tendrils and proceeded to disengage the latches before promptly pulling open the hatch. It swung open without tissue, and the drone proceeded into the crawlway not far down. It found a ladderway that led to the deck below. A blown bulkhead prevented it from going down more than one deck, and the drone exited the crawlway into the corridor looking for an alternate route where it soon came across its next specimen. Actually, it was three. It found two of them just ten meters down the corridor from where it had left the crawlway. One female, the other male. The two of them were crouched in front of an open panel working on a blown plasma conduit, likely a main lead from the reactor. As for the third specimen, the drone could detect that they were about 20 meters away and moving further away. Before either noticed its presence, the drone fired twice in rapid succession. A blue bolt splashed against each specimen and they crumpled on the spot. The drone quickly approached and scanned them. The female was in perfect health, but the male had bruised genitals. The drone filed it away and quickly tagged them both, before taking a closer look at the bruised genitals. The damage was actually fairly severe, he should have been unable to function from the pain, and yet he was working as if nothing was wrong. A quick check of the tag confirmed that his pain receptors were lit up, all of them. 2311 proceeded to repair the injury but quickly came to the conclusion that it was no accident that caused it. All of this info was beamed back to the mothership for analysis. A more sophisticated AI could make theories on this. 2311 had another specimen to catch. It pursued and caught up with the specimen after they had entered a small room. 2311 studied the door blocking its route and found it was locked. The access panel however, was fully operational. A manipulation tendril shot out and punctured the panel casing, creating a connection between the drone and the door controls. It took only a second to override the locking mechanism. The door slid open revealing a closet just barely big enough for the toilet and sink inside. The specimen it was after was female and in the middle of emptying her bladder. She barely had time to react before a blue bolt splashed over her flesh. She crumpled, but the urine stream kept flowing, at least until she ran out. The drone used several tendrils to move her and lay her out flat on her belly. The young female specimen was then quickly tagged and scanned. It found no injuries to treat, but it did find that she was pregnant. The drone did a quick scan of her unborn babies to make sure no harm had come to them. Their less developed systems might have been harmed by the stun blast, but thankfully they were not. That didn't stop the drone from taking extra precautions just in case. A quick procedure to strengthen them just in case there was an issue it missed. After that, 2311 left her there tagged and sprawled with her pants still around her ankles. The drone was never programmed to understand or to even consider modesty. Poff Neku Security Chief. NIS Blade of Xanthu, she did not know what to think about her job. Here she was monitoring the internal sensors, while the rest of the crew was scrambling to restore the sublight engines. Well there were a few working on getting main power back online as well. The wreck had mauled them thoroughly, and while it seemed obvious that the eerily planned aboard she had not gotten any alerts so far, 
Not a single one, and it had been a little over an hour since that energy beam had cut through the hull. Not that they knew what was going on out there. The external sensor were down, and several decks no longer had functioning internal sensors. Suddenly something caught her eye. It was only there for a moment, but that was enough. She quickly reversed the footage and then paused it. Frozen on her screen was something she had never seen before, but the startled exclamation behind her suggested the junior officer with her didn't know what it was. The object in question was a glowing blue sphere, a perfect glowing sphere floating about a meter off the floor. It was maybe a meter in diameter itself, making it about the size of an eerily hanging around it like a skirt were dozens of thin glowing tendrils. She turned to the junior who as she recalled had transferred over from the science division. The young lady was quite smart but got bored with the work. Not that this was any better, the junior in question did not fit in here much better. I take it you have seen one of these before? No, but I can identify it. Never seen a blue one before, but red versions have been seen near ancient ruins believed to have belonged to the precursors. That is a precursor drone. Very little is known about it. They are equipped with some kind of energy weapon, a personal shield, and can float. That is all I know about them. The chief turned to come. That is enough. I'll put out an alert that precursor drones have been seen aboard the ship. Tell them that if they see a drone, go the other way. I don't think our shipboard weapons can penetrate its shields. She didn't think so either, but that rubbed her the wrong way. The chief put out the alert and then contacted the bridge. POF Science Drone SDSSB 02311. 2311 was fiddling with the controls of a broken tram lift when a klaxon sounded. Evidently, the crew was now aware they had been boarded. That was an intruder alert, and apparently, they were able to identify them as precursor drones. It mattered little to 2311, but it did mean that it should expect increased resistance from this point forward. 2311 transmitted a report on its scouted route so far. It received a return, informing it that four squads had been dispatched with the gate matrix behind it. It acknowledged before turning back to the controls. The drone had no plans to use the lift, but it needed the doors open. The empty shaft behind it would lead straight to its objective. After a moment, a few sparks and a loud screech was its reward when it successfully bypassed the damaged control circuits and opened the door, revealing a dark passage deeper into the ship, and the drone conducted another quick scan. There was damage to some of the mechanisms, but the shaft itself was usable for the drone's purposes. 2311 proceeded into the shaft and made its way down the remaining few decks to its target. The exit was sealed, and there were no controls on this side. That was not a problem though. It scanned the walls, and quickly found the control circuits. The drone's tendril shot forward and punched through the wall, penetrating into the casing, and stopping the instant it came in contact with the circuits. Interfacing the drone quickly overrode the controls and opened the door where it came sensor to face with two armed Neku, both male. Surprised neither specimen reacted before taking a blue bolt to the chest. They crumbled to the ground, and were promptly examined, and tagged. 2311 never bothered to disarm them. Their primitive rifles and pistols were not capable of penetrating its shields. As a result there was no need to disarm them. Not to mention the tags would ensure an easy collection later. 2311 turned left and headed for the cargo bay they wanted to reach. Its objectives were already being updated as it moved. It was to secure the bay, and then wait for the other drones to arrive with the gate matrix. After that, it was to stand by for further orders. Announcement. The next part is already up on Patreon. For those that can't wait a week, now would be a good time to join. 153. Chapter 7 Overwhelmed Part 2 Megumi watched Teresa as she paced nervously. At this very moment, she was also managing a boarding operation, keeping track of ongoing repairs, compiling ancient technologies, decoding early computer code, keeping a sensor lock on the supposedly surrendered Neku cruiser, and plotting her next few moves on the board so to speak. These Neku ships would provide valuable intel and she planned to beam anything militarily useful to the Aureli. With her abilities, she could easily get a good deal of info on Neku plans, and the Aureli could use that to their advantage. However that only lasts as long as she is in the area, and even if she finds the third party she expects, there is still the matter of them altering the balance of power in the long term. That meant she would need to level the playing field between powers in this quadrant, a fact that played into why she was compiling data. Megumi realized the current situation was an exception in her overriding directives, for the first time in her life, 
her directive against sharing technology with primitive cultures was not valid, not that she planned to share it directly. All she really wanted to do was set them on the path, it would be up to them to take the data she gave them and produce viable technologies with them, naturally, she was going to give them a push, one that was down paths they had already started, which made it more likely that they would develop something useful. The Aureli were already using particle weapons, for example, Logically the next step for them would be phased particle weapons, the Solian phase lance was an excellent example of that type of weapon. Phase lances were obsolete to be sure, but they were excellent weapons in their time, they fired a highly focused beam of phased particles that could penetrate weak ash shields through brute force and would shear through most forms of armor, in fact the phase lance excelled at cutting through armor and was one of the few weapons of its day able to penetrate neutronium based armors. The Aureli were technologically a few decades away from developing their own equivalent to the ancient phase lance, a fact that played into Megumi wanting to give them some info to nudge them into that direction, if she did it right, they could have their own version in about five years, perhaps faster. Adding a weapon like it to their arsenal would do much to even the playing field between the Aureli, and the Neku. Although they would still need a torpedo to complement the new beam weapons, she had several options to nudge their development in for that. Their primitive fusion warheads were alright, but there were a few ways to improve them. She could, however, get them to move down a different route though. Photon torpedoes would be a reasonable step up, or she could start them on compressed plasma warheads, the last one being something they might eventually develop given that they were at war with the Neku who used plasma weapons. Photon torpedoes would be cheaper though, and could support all sorts of useful modifications such as shield penetrators. There were a few primitive shield penetration methods she knew of, that were within reach of current eerily technology, it would take little nudge to get them to develop torpedoes that could bypass the primitive shields used by the Neku, there were other areas the Aureli could use some improvement in as well. Propulsion was not one of them, but some of the same concepts she was going to share with them, the ones intended to nudge them in certain directions could also be employed with propulsion, something she had no doubt the Aureli would realize. They already had a fair grasp on sublight propulsion, their reliance on jump drives may have had something to do with that, but the fact remained that their sublight engines were superior to Neku equivalents, an advantage she would like to see them maintain, but she didn't want them to become overwhelming in that regard, merely competitive. Still she had to share the concepts that would be useful in improving that advantage, because they also played a major role in the creation of more powerful energy shields. Her time for future planning was finally interrupted by an expected move on the part of the Neku, as she downloaded the data she planned to give to the Aureli onto a small crystal ship, she focused on the vessel finally making its move, they had not bothered to raise their shields again, but they were charging their forward cannons, the majority of their power shunted to the engines, as they made what they clearly hoped was an unexpected and sudden dash for the nearest Aureli ship, a cruiser to be specific, Megumi started the clock and when it had hit 30 seconds, she sent her first and only planned warning, as expected, it went ignored, and when the clock hit 1 minute 30 seconds, she activated a tractor beam, the beam ensnared the Neku cruiser, just as she fired her forward cannons, an ionized plasma beam struck the port shields of the early cruiser, the beam was a sustained beam, but it barely lasted 2 seconds before it cut out, the Neku vessel having suddenly lost all power, her tractor beam proved to be far more effective at disabling a vessel than a Neku plasma weapon. Although it was good for primitives, in those two seconds it had drained the port shields of the early cruiser nearly 68%. The cruiser now disabled, she assigned a few squadrons of drones for the boarding operation. Her tractor beam was designed to drain power from any vessel she had ensnared, but only when in mode 2 operation. In mode 1, it projected a structural integrity field into the ensnared ship. The reason for this difference was the intended purpose. In Mode 1, it was mainly intended for the towing and recovery of damaged warships. The SIF component of the beam was there to ensure the ships didn't break apart from towing stresses. Naturally when she had saved that half of an early cruiser, earlier she had used Mode 1. For the Neku cruiser here, she was using Mode 2. A mode intended to disable enemy vessels, so that they could be boarded once locked on. The beam would rapidly drain power from systems, starting with the shields. For most ships, the shields would give the targeted ship a few crucial seconds to escape the beam before they failed, longer if the shields were continuously being remodulated to prevent the beam from getting a proper lock. Escaping could be done one of two ways, the first was to get out of range, and the second was to disable the tractor beam, 
The first was the easier option naturally, and not all that hard. Tractor beams had a fairly short effective range. All of her weapons had longer effective ranges than the tractor beam emitters. None of that really mattered for the Neku. Their primitive systems were highly susceptible to the energy draining effect of her tractor beam. Their shield likely would not have bought them more than a second if they were up. As it was, Megumi had to weaken her tractor beam to prevent it from shutting down their life support systems. The cruiser's power systems had already been brought to minimal levels, and the barely functioning computers were routing it all to critical systems, such as life support. Most primary systems had already been allowed to shut down, such as the weapons, and the SIF generators. Even the shields which had been in a hot standby mode had shut down completely. Very different from the ships that she was used to. Those ships had been hardened against the energy draining effect of Solian tractor beams. With shields that could resist, and hardware that was far more resistant to it as well. Not completely, but enough that they had a chance. They could fight back or try to run. The neck you could not do either. It seemed the nervous Eerily had noticed. And in surprise, she asked, What happened to that Neku cruiser? Why did she suddenly go dark? Megumi chose to answer that personally, I disabled her. At this range, I can simply shut down any ship which is that primitive. If it wasn't so primitive it would not be so easy. While the Eerily cruiser was scanning its newly disabled attacker, Erisa asked, Disabled? Shut down? What do you mean by that? I won't tell you how it is done, but simply put my tractor beam is leeching the energy from her systems. The crew won't be affected, but anything that requires power will. To a certain degree that is, her reactors will still produce energy, but now they have to work harder just to maintain minimal power levels. It also has the bonus of effectively disarming the crew as even hand weapons and personnel shields would be affected. But it won't matter for my drones. They can adjust their shields to protect themselves, not indefinitely, but long enough. Drones? Neku Captain Poff. She surveyed her dark bridge in silence, trying not to voice any of the worries or fears she felt, all the while waiting for that report on what the hell happened. Everything had been going perfectly. They had even managed to get an easy range of an early cruiser, but just as they opened fire, everything went wrong. She had no idea what happened, but when the ionized plasma guns fired, the lights started to flicker. An instant after that, they died, and a mere instant after that the consoles followed. Now, here she was sitting in a dark bridge with no idea what was going on. Even the emergency lights were dead. At first, she thought the power systems must have failed, but one of the crew managed to confirm that the vents were still working. Blowing fresh air into the bridge, that relieved one worry, but it left her with others. The fact no one seemed to be firing on them was a bit of a relief. But that only meant the early intended to board the ship. There was a slight clattering sound behind her, and someone cursed. This was followed by the sounds of fumbling, and then clicking sounds, followed by even more cursing. Unfortunately she had caught every word, and her mood plummeted further. The clattering was because someone had finally managed to find their way to the emergency kits, and pulled out some hand lights. The problem? All of them were apparently dead. All of them. One dead light? That happens. Two? Okay not unheard of, but all of them, something was up, with a bit of worry, she pulled the side arm off her hip, and pointed it at the ceiling, she hesitated a moment, and then pulled the trigger, she was rewarded with only the sound of a depressing trigger, there was no flash of light, no plasma discharge, nothing but the almost quiet sound of the trigger, now that was a problem, she had charged her pistol before the battle, like she always does, she had a sinking suspicion that they had been caught in some kind of dampening field, she barely had time to even consider what that meant or even warn her crew that their weapons were useless before she heard the sound of a hatch swinging open. Just as the room brightened up, in front of her, on the right side of the bridge she watched as a glowing blue sphere with a number of thin tendrils spread around it like an alien skirt, floated into the room. Several of her crew drew their weapons, but she dropped hers. It was useless, anyway. The young captain didn't know what that sphere was, but she had no doubt it was a threat. Her training took over and she shouted, while at the same time, she got out of her chair. Just as the alien sphere fired some kind of energy pulse, it hit a young technician who was half buried under a console. The captain didn't stop long enough to see the result, as she was already diving behind her chair, instinctively taking cover. At the same moment, she was considering her options, options that were admittedly rather sparse. Her weapon was useless, and discarded. She could hear that alien thing shooting her crew, and cover on the bridge was limited. 
Although the consoles were for the most part positioned to give the bridge crew an advantage against anyone trying to shoot their way in through the two doorways, not that it mattered. Their weapons were nothing more than paperweights thanks to that dampening field. The captain decided that it would be foolish to risk hand-to-hand -hand combat with that thing as well. By process of elimination, she only had one option, to run and hide. She could not stay here. Thankfully there was a hidden crawway hatch less than a meter from her position but she would have to break cover to reach it. It was a risk, but she would have to take it. A quick check from out of cover revealed it seemed to be firing on someone on the other side of the bridge. Figuring it was clear, she made a run for it, but she never made it. She barely made it half a meter before something hit her. The world spun, and swirled for a moment. Her nerves cried out, and then she was greeted with blackness. Poff Neku Security Chief, NIS Blade of Xanthu. She studied the screen. By now there had been quite a few sightings and detected movements of the alien drones. Several maintenance teams and crewmen had also gone missing in those parts of the ship. There was no doubt in her mind that the missing had encountered the drones. A couple security teams had also engaged a couple of isolated drones with disappointing results. The precursor shields proved to be quite resilient. Everything they threw at the drones proved ineffective. Plasma beams. Plasma grenades, iron disruptors, and ATCP rockets all failed to penetrate that shielding. Worse, the drones proved able to bypass any security measure they put in effect. Erect a force field? They simply go right through it. Lock the doors? They bypass the controls and open the door manually. Weld, the door shut. They use their appendages to break the weld, and then open the door. The only thing they hadn't tried yet was dropping a bulkhead in their path, but she had a feeling it would only slow them down. However, with all these advantages, the drones had not yet overrun all their security positions. For some reason, they were not penetrating their defenses. The majority seemed to be doing something, something she was now reviewing in the recon video her scout team had brought back. Although not without cost, of the twelve young crewmen, she had sent in eight of them had been caught by the drones. Playing in front of her, she was watching what happened to one of them. A young woman. The young woman had been shot with some kind of weapon, but it did not seem to have killed her. She was very much still breathing, so it must have been a stun device. On the screen, the drone slowly approached her slumped body. Several tendrils shot out and wrapped around her limbs. The young woman was quickly repositioned so she was lying comfortably on her belly. The first group retracted, in the same instant that a new tendril shot out. This one seemed to puncture her lower back. It stayed there for only a few moments and was then summarily retracted. The drone then slowly floated away, leaving her there, which allowed for the scouts to move in, and collect her. She had seen that unfortunate earlier. The only one the scouts had brought back after being caught by the drones. The young woman was currently across the hall, lying in one of the ship's bays. Still unconscious from the alien stun weapon, the chief rewound the video. To an earlier point, what played now, was something she had already seen, but wanted to see again. Dozens of drones congregated in Cargo Bay 17. They were shifting cargo around, and doing something with alien equipment. In fact they seemed to be building something, but she had never seen the like. The chief had no idea what they were building, but she had no doubt it was bad news. Problem was, a single drone had proven too much for them to take down. How were they going to stop several dozen from building something? The only thing she could think of, was to use a rocket. It might be able to damage whatever that alien equipment was. That assumed the drones didn't intercept it or do something else. A plan that further assumed that the drones had not already finished the alien assembly they were constructing. Given that in the few minutes the scouts were filming they made quite a bit of progress, there was a good chance that they were indeed done by now. A part of her hoped they weren't. The longer they stayed in those sections, the more time she had to make a plan. Her eyes wandered to the other screen which displayed only a countdown. She was hoping for the time to think up something better than the captain's plan at least. Anything would be better than the captain's plan. Suddenly she heard gunfire and shouting out in the corridor. The chief sighed, apparently. It was a shallow hope, one not meant to be. She picked up her rifle. Even knowing it was useless, she was going to go out and fight. Perhaps, she might buy a little time for someone else to do something. Almost absently she locked down her console, and then made to leave the room to help the guards. Before she could leave the room, there was a clutter. She looked towards the source, to see a grate on the ground. Her eyes wandered up, and there emerging from the vent was a single drone. She fired at it, and its shields flared. She unleashed a few more shots in the brief moment it was leaving the vent for little effect. The drone ignored her, choosing instead to approach the console bank. 
She was confused but kept firing at it anyway, not that her weapon seemed to be having any effect. A single tendril shot from the drone, and into the console bank. Mere seconds later, she heard a computerized voice announce auto-destruct sequence aborted. Control lockout initiated. All command codes have been voided. She was in shock. She could not believe what she had just heard. Somehow in mere seconds the drone had overridden the lockouts on her console, accessed the mainframe, decrypted their command codes, cancelled the self-destruct, initiated a ship-wide control lockout and voided their command codes. Making it even more impressive it had done this while under fire. The drone turned towards her slowly. At the same moment, a second voice played over the speakers, also computerized but different. All specimens report to Cargo Bay 17 for processing. Resistance is pointless and ill-advised. The chief never had time to process that. A single energy bolt struck her in the chest, and her world went dark. By the time she woke up, she was already processed and in an alien cell. She was not the only one in that cell, either. 150. Chapter 8 The expected result. Erisa walked down the corridor. She was trying not to think about her last conversation with Megumi the ship's AI. Not that it was easy. She felt so violated, and so tiny. It was also a bit irritating to think that she had an alien device embedded in her spine, one that was actively transmitting a whole slew of data and worse could render her docile in a moment something she had experienced not all that long ago, just before the ship gave her a task. Something so simple a child could do it. Erisa wasn't sure how she felt about being an errand girl, but she wanted to avoid getting on that AI's bad side. As for what Megumi wanted her to do, it was simple really. She idly fingered the crystal chip in her pouch, a small little something she wore on her hip. That crystal was part of her task and she found herself thinking back to that. Megumi had told Erisa that she was to deliver it to the head researcher, but under no circumstance was she to attempt to leave the confines of the ship herself. That part had her worried a bit, but there wasn't much she could do about that. Not with an alien implant lodged in her spine, somehow she had a feeling she was going to be stuck with it for a long time. Pushing that thought aside, she thought about the alien crystal in her pouch. The ship said that it expected her people's scientists to take about six months to decode it and devise a proper interface. The data within would then fuel research projects for at least five years that would accelerate her people's development by decades. It would give them shields, armor, and weapons that would allow their ships to compete evenly with NECU equivalents. If that was true, and she fervently hoped it was then this little ship was the most valuable artifact she had ever had the honor of holding, it could turn the tide of the war. Although now that she had seen the ship in action, she felt this ancient wreck could do that as well. But it was only one ship. As powerful as it was it could not be everywhere at once. Not to mention she had no desire to rely on something they could not control. Besides, it already demonstrated that it could not be trusted. The implant in her spine, and what it had done to Milia, tricking her like that, were ample examples. What it had done to Milia bothered her the most. The cute scientist was the one who made being out here bearable. And now she was nothing more than a slave. Erisa thought her a fool to sign away her free will for knowledge like that. But she blamed the AI for that as well. Erisa knew how much Melia loved to learn things. And she knew just how tempting the ship's database would have been to her. She could picture in her mind, how the ship used that as bait. Lured her in, and glossed over the whole no free will thing. Even Melia had not admitted to that happening. She was sure that was what happened. Not that it helped much, but Harissa swore to herself that she would find a way to get the implant out of herself, and free Melia from her enslavement to the computer. It was something she had to do for herself. Not that she fully realized how self-serving that desire truly was. Then again she wasn't fully aware of why she was so mad at Melia for signing her will away. She rounded the corner, and made for a lift. It would take her the rest of the way to her destination. Soon she would be able to hand off the crystal chip, and then could head back. While she didn't know how to save either herself or Melia, the young Eurily fully intended to do her best to keep Melia out of trouble. Meanwhile, Megumi was processing the data from her initial biometric assessment of her prisoners. After the first couple of ships were captured the rest of the fleet fell in short order. A good number surrendered outright, a few kept up a pointless fight and were captured anyway. There were however a few ships that had chosen death and self-destructed. It was a waste of life, but a choice Megumi could respect. There were those that would prefer death over being captured, and apparently, the crews of those particular ships were that type. With the battle over, 
She had been focusing mainly on processing the data coming in from her ongoing interrogations and analyzes. One prisoner, in particular, had caught her attention though, a young captain, who seemed to be quite intelligent. She was also a prime specimen, there was a great deal of potential with that one, a potential she may never have realized given what had been done to her. What had been done to all of them, Megumi finally had the evidence to prove her theory. Someone was pulling the strings of the Neku all right. Whoever they were, they had a reasonable understanding of the mind, and had some skill with mind control. Almost all of the Neku she had captured showed signs of having been conditioned using techniques that Megumi found primitive. Although they were rather sophisticated by the standards of the Neku and the early, she doubted a Neku could have developed the techniques. Not on their own. Not that it mattered. The fact that they were being brainwashed in this fashion was intriguing enough, and worth investigating. She had already extracted what she could from them, but the crews knew little about who was pulling their strings. She did learn that a new species had recently shown up on the Neku home world, something the Aureli had no knowledge of. That was also worth investigating. She would need to acquire a specimen or two. Carefully though, she didn't want to alarm her targets unnecessarily. Thankfully the perfect tools had fallen right into her lap for that in the form of several thousand Neku prisoners. Enough prisoners to replace her long lost crew in fact, well not completely. 7,459 Neku might have been enough to man the significantly smaller Neku ships, but she was a battleship roughly 12 kilometers long, designed for not only a large crew but to carry an army of shock troops. She could easily transport a few hundred thousand troops and a crew in the low tens of thousands. In any case, it was time she got started, as they were, the Neku prisoners were useless to her, however, the Solians were masters of biomechanical technology and had a sophisticated understanding of the mind factors that had played well into how they had maintained their vast empire. Only one race had surpassed them in biotechnology, and that was the Darkations, the ruthless parasites that she was fighting before she was disabled. A race whose disappearance was yet another mystery for her to solve, but she had no clues to start on with that. Not yet anyway, but she knew it would only be a matter of time before she found a lead. At that moment she noticed that the prime specimen she had her eye on had finally woken up. The only specimen she had given a private cell. In fact, a young woman woke groggily. Her body felt weird almost as if someone was stabbing every inch of her skin with needles. Worse she had a killer headache and could barely think. At first, she had no idea where she was, her surroundings didn't even register with her, for a moment she had even forgotten that she was a Neku, and what she looked like, it took her aching lethargic mind a good several minutes or so to start working again, as the pain faded, she began to take a look around, the room she was in looked to be a cell of some sort, however, she could see no exit, where she would have expected to find a force field, there was only a solid looking wall, beneath her. She could feel the warm and smooth surface of a polished metal shelf that was anchored a meter off the floor. Apparently she had been on it long enough for the metal surface to grow warm. More disturbing though was the fact that she was nude. Her clothing was gone. The young woman was understandably quite confused, as it took her lethargic mind a good while to take in her surroundings. It took a while longer for them to fully register, and it was several moments after that when she finally remembered what happened to her how she had been on the bridge, the power had failed, some kind of drone was shooting her officers, and she had tried to make a break for it, that was where her memory ended, trying to run for the hatch, she didn't remember anything after that, the young woman did not recall making it to the hatch, either, once her memory reconnected it took her only moments to conclude that she had been stunned and captured, her captors had apparently confiscated her clothing, not that she knew why, she took another look around the room, and that is when she noted a pair of indents in the walls, one on her left, and the other on her right. Feeling the need to do something, she decided to investigate her tiny cell. As the cell wasn't very large, barely five square meters if she had to guess, probably less. The shelf she had been lying on took up half the room. Honestly, the young neck you felt like someone had stuffed her in a closet. The cell was about the size of one after all, not the smallest closet she had seen, but it was still fairly small. It took only a couple of steps to reach the indent on the left, and she quickly noticed that it seemed oddly door-shaped, near it. About where a control panel might have been placed on her ship, she found a smaller circular indentation. Curious she fingered it, and to her shock a door slid up into the ceiling, revealing another room, less than half the size of this one. 
This one was clearly a restroom, with barely enough space for the single alien toilet and an odd sink. Placed above the sink was a mirror, reflecting her nude form standing in the doorway. She took a moment to look herself over in the mirror. Her hair was a little messy, but she didn't see any new marks on her skin. As Neka went, she was on the short side at 147 centimeters, but she had a good figure. She was lithe and agile with a sleek frame, that honestly made her mounds look just a little bigger than they actually were. Most people said she was quite cute, but didn't strike the most imposing figure. Honestly, she had to agree with them, especially seeing her nude form in the mirror. Without a uniform to help, all someone would see was a cute and nude feelinoid. She had a nice tail sticking out from her butt with a rare jet black coloring. Like most females, she had no fur on her body below the neck with the exception of the tail. Cascading loosely down her back was her messy jet black hair, and a cute pair of jet black triangular ears sprouted from her head. Her face was quite cute with a small button nose, a few long whiskers, a rounded shape, and a striking pair of eyes. The iris was mainly red and shot through with gold with a large vertical pupil. Poking slightly out from under her upper lip was a cute little fang. It was a mark of her race's predatory past, like the retractable claws she had in her hands and feet. Her limbs were also built so that she could run on all fours if she needed to. But normally she only walked on her legs. Shifting in the mirror, she checked out her backside, and that is where she found something new. A perfect red circle that stood out against her creamy skin. It was quite visible and drew the eye to her back, and it was just centimeters above her tail. She had no idea why it was there, but her captors had marked her in some fashion. She fingered the spot, but it didn't feel weird. Not that the young Nekya knew what to make of it. With no way to answer why it was there, she dropped it, and checked out the odd sink. It did not take her long to figure out how to turn it on, and it immediately flooded with an odd light that made her skin tingle. It was weird. But when she removed her hand she found it perfectly clean. Starting to get curious about the other indent, she left the bathroom. She figured this one might be the exit. And if that was the case it was likely locked. The first one was clearly part of the cell, and there was no reason to lock her out of the bathroom. The young woman decided not to check the toilet out, and it wasn't like she needed to use it yet either. To her surprise, the other door slid open the same way after she found the control. It was in the same relative position making it easy to find. Revealed to her was another small room the same size as that tiny bathroom. The only thing in there was a small table, and a chair. It had the same metal walls as everywhere else. It made her wonder where the exit was though. She settled heavily into the chair. By now she was feeling normal again, if somewhat famished. In fact she was wondering about more than just the exit, but also about mealtime. Her lack of clothing was also an issue. But the chamber was perfectly comfortable. The cell had such a perfect balance of conditions that she hardly noticed. Behind her, she heard a cheery voice. Good morning princess, are you hungry? Thirsty? She looked behind her to see a winged woman standing in the doorway. A young woman she had never even seen enter. Nor had she seen her species before. Although she had seen depictions of similar entities, legendary figures with supposedly magical abilities that ruled the stars, the woman before her perfectly resembled a precursor specifically the most powerful race of precursors, the Star Lords. Up close she could even see the resemblance they shared with dragons when such beings deigned to take a more humanoid form. Although she lacked the tail, and her wings were larger, but she looked just as young as every humanoid dragon she had seen depicted, maybe a little younger. For some reason, immortals always looked like children or young teens. While confused to see her there, this seemed like a perfect chance. With barely any thought she leapt from her chair trying to tackle the woman. The next thing she knew, she had slammed into the floor and looked up to see the alien female giggling. Well princess, are you done being stupid? She looked up at the alien utterly confused. The young woman didn't even realize she was muttering until the alien crouched, looked her in the eye, and told her, the reason that attack didn't connect is because I am not physically here. I am Megami, the ship's AI, and this is just a holographic avatar. I used to have a physical one, but I lost it. I'm making a new one though. You're a hologram? Yes, princess. Now you never did answer. Are you hungry? Thirsty? She sighed. It seemed the perfect chance to escape didn't just miraculously show itself. With a thought, she reached forward, and watched as her hand went right through the other woman. Megumi really was a hologram. As she pulled herself off the floor, the young woman finally said, Could you please stop calling me princess? I have a name, it's Kairu. Noted, Kairu. Now on her feet. She made for the open door, and finally answered, I am feeling a little hungry, 
I figured it was about time for that Kairu. I'll have something prepared right away, it should not take long, and in the meantime, we can discuss your future. Kairu did not like the sound of that, not that there was anything she could do about it. 146, Chapter 9 Resupply, and, Malia stared at the captured Nekia warships, the entire fleet was currently anchored off the ISS Constellations port bow, what was left of it anyway. A few ships had been destroyed, it was certainly odd, and the newly arrived reinforcements likely felt the same way. Twenty battleships, a flagship, and their escorts had arrived just an hour ago. Erisa had returned from her errand and decided to explore this part of the ship. As such, Malia had no doubt the crystal chip that Megumi had given Erisa was on its way to the fleet, where it would quickly be transported to Iril, the early home world. Malia had some questions about what the ship was planning, but most of her focus at the moment was on the prisoners. Some of it was being directed to the ongoing repairs, as well, so it was with welcome surprise when she felt Megumi's attention shift back to her. It's getting rather late. I have prepared some quarters for you. Why don't you find Derisa, and I'll guide you to there. That did sound like a good idea. It really was late. Well, for her anyway, the battle had taken most of the day, and she had been up since before the battle. A few hours had passed since then as well. By early standard time it was almost midnight. Although the same could not be said for Solian Imperial, by that clock it was mid-morning. Not that the clocks compared all that well. Solian Imperial had 24 hours in a day while early standard had only 20. That four-hour difference in the length of a day was rather significant. It was something she had often heard people complain about, especially people who had friends or relatives on a different planet. The length of a day actually varied depending on what planet you were on. It made coordinating schedules between worlds hell, and it was why empires made a standard clock by which all fleets would operate, usually based on the clock of the home world for the convenience of the leaders, naturally. It was also set according to the regional time of the capital on the home world, again for the convenience of a nation's leaders. For the Solians it was the obvious conclusion that their home world had a 24-day, and while you would be right, Solian imperial time was not based on any city on that world, mainly because the Solians were semi-nomadic, and their capital had long since moved from the home world to a city ship. Most Solians lived on massive planetoid-sized city ships that could support billions of people. The capital ship of the Empire was among the largest of the city ships, and it was also the oldest, built up and expanded over countless generations. That does sound nice. But before I leave, may I ask what you plan to do with that fleet? Megumi was silent for a moment. Well, I have already extracted all the data in their computers. It gave me a few leads, and one race to look up later when I have the time. If anyone knows what happened to my creators, and how that war ended it would be the dragons. They are in your terms, a precursor race as well. Wait, those ship-eating space monsters are precursors? They don't have any technology. Actually they do. The dragons are just as advanced as the Empire. Although they apply themselves more towards the mystical side of things. We can talk about that later. To answer your first question, I plan to break them down into their base components. They could be useful for repairs. Break them down? But almost none of the materials used in their construction are used in your construction. How would they be useful for repairs? Not surprised you haven't reached that section. The short answer is material conversion, as is. Most of those materials are useless to me. However, they can be broken down into their subatomic components and reordered into useful materials. There is a fuel cost associated with that, but nothing prohibitive. Besides, I have already repaired the long-range sensors and found several nearby worlds with materials useful for a proper resupply, and those ships will provide enough material to jumpstart the repairs to my warp drive. Malia already knew what that was, she had read up already on the ship's design, and technology. Warp drive was a technology that allowed for rapid interstellar travel through normal space by means of spatial folding. It was a method of faster-than-light travel that the Solian people had been using since before the founding of their empire, making it one of the oldest technologies still in use by the Solian people. The ship actually had six primary warp engines and four auxiliary warp engines. The main engines were located in the massive nasals at the ends of the flared wings towards the aft of the ship. They were set in three pairs, one parallel with the hull, one set above, and one set below the hull. The engines allowed the ship to reach a top cruising speed of warp 12 which translates to about 82,500 times the speed of light, more than sufficient for interstellar travel. At that speed, it would take a little over a year to cross from one side of the galaxy to the other 
meaning it was quite fast, but not fast enough for intergalactic travel. For that, the ship had a second set of FTL engines. This set also used components in the nasals but it also had a drive core in main engineering. That second set was known as the hyperwarp drive. It made use of something called subspace tunneling to create a conduit between any two points allowing for near instantaneous travel. Well it seemed that way anyway. Actual travel speed was on the order of several million times the speed of light. Crossing the galaxy at those speeds was a matter of seconds. Traveling between galaxies was a matter of days. Although from what she had read the early versions of Hyperwarp took months to cross between galaxies. Both engines were far more impressive than any jump drive or hyperdrive she had seen. I'd love to see the science behind that. Guess I'll look it up in the morning. In the meantime I better find Derisa. Kairu stared at the wall, deep in thought. Not that she had much else to do. She had already finished her breakfast. Not that it was anything special. It tasted fine so it was already a league above what she expected. Her mind really wasn't on the food though. No. She was far more worried about her future. The hologram had mentioned something about having plans for her, but had said nothing about what they were. That was worrying enough. But what really worried her was what that hologram had said about the rights, or more accurately her lack thereof. It seemed that the alien program did not recognize her as having rights. She apparently could be classified one of two ways, and neither made a difference. Not that she really liked the first specimen, as in a lab animal. At least the second one made her sound like a nephew, a thinking creature and not something to be experimented on. Not that the other one was much better. Apparently what she thought of as the rights were classified by the Solian Empire as privileges granted to all citizens of the Empire. Since she had no citizenship in the Solian Empire, she had no rights here except those outlined by the Articles of War, which simply put, guaranteed that her basic needs would be met. She had asked if having citizenship would have changed things, and the answer was not much. In that case, she would have been classified as a captured rebel, and as far as the Empire was concerned rebelling against the Empire was the same as rejecting the Empire and all privileges they granted to you as a citizen of the Empire. At least the Empire didn't execute their prisoners. That was one of the few positive things she had learned about. Her life was guaranteed. But that wasn't all that reassuring. Not with the whole lab rat thing still hanging over her head. She sighed, and finally pushed herself out of the chair, wanting to keep her mind off the whole thing. She went out into the main room of the cell. Perhaps some exercise would keep her mind occupied. There were very few things she could do in this closet of a cell, and there wasn't much else to do anyway. The only other things she could do to pass the time was think or sleep. She didn't want to sit around thinking any longer, and honestly, she was not tired enough to sleep. Besides, that shelf wasn't all that comfortable, although it was better than the floor. She had been exercising for a while and was starting to feel the need for a break, not to mention she was feeling hungry again. She had no way to be sure but it might be time for lunch. Without a clock, she had no way to know what time it was, not being locked up in this tiny room anyway. Suddenly without warning, a certain hologram appeared, this time sitting on a sorry shelf of metal that served as the bed. It's about time you took a break, and I have prepared your lunch. Princess, it's in the same place as last time. Also, I will be accelerating to warp speed in a few minutes. But since my inertial dampers are not fully repaired you may experience a sudden gravitational shift. Don't be alarmed, when it happens, Kairu shifted into a sitting posture. Thanks, I guess. But did I not ask you to stop calling me princess? The hologram giggled but said nothing. Kairu started to stand up and seeing as she wasn't going to get anything more than a giggle asked something else, by the way what do you mean about accelerating to warp speed, and sudden gravitational shifts? About what it sounds like, if you have ever been on a shuttle with no dampers you will know what I am talking about. This will be a similar experience, with a few differences, not going to tell me more? No, Kairu, I'm not, I didn't even have to give you the small warning I did, said the hologram just before she vanished. Kairu sighed and headed for the small side room with the table, a part of her wondering what the ship had decided to serve her for lunch. What she found was a plain fish served atop equally plain rice. Although neither the fish nor the rice were of a type she was familiar with, she settled into the chair and picked up the lone utensil. It was plain white and made of material she could not identify, but it was fairly soft, bending easily yet hard enough for the task. The food itself was okay, but it did not strike her as special. Not to mention it was not all that different from her breakfast. Idly she asked the heir, is fish the only thing you are going to serve me? She was not expecting a response, 
so she was understandably startled when a voice from nowhere said, Well, it is all I have. My creators, the Solians, have a diet of mainly fish, several different vegetables, grains, and occasionally the meat of a few different large animals. I was supplied with a few agribays with self-sustaining ecosystems to support my crew, and a few of them are still operational. The fish you are eating was just harvested today, so it is quite fresh. However if you don't want fish, I can always serve you nutrient paste, princess. I have quite the surplus stored up, she gulped. No, the fish is fine, I was just curious, nothing more. As if to prove it, she hurried to finish it, and had just gulped down the last of it when a ship suddenly jolted. She had a feeling that the ship had gone to warp. A feeling that was quite correct. Megumi enjoyed the feeling of being at warp for the first time in ages. She had already finished deconstructing the Neku fleet. Spoken briefly with an Eerily admiral. And the Eerily fleet had departed with the precious cargo that Harisa had handed off earlier. There were still a large number of Eerily on board. Scientists the fleet had left behind. She had started tagging them so that she could better keep an eye on them, and make sure they kept out of trouble. Megumi had even set up a few monitoring subroutines so that she didn't have to keep a personal eye on them. So to speak, anyway, her repairs to the warp engines were, however minimal, limiting her to a top cruising speed of warp 4.76, 784c, which was quite slow. It would take her roughly 8 days to reach her destination at that speed. Since she now had the time, she activated her cloak as well. It responded exactly as it should, and she felt all the familiar responses, meaning she would have suddenly vanished from the screens of anyone looking her way. For the first time in ages, she was not only moving but cloaked as well. It felt familiar and proper. Megumi was starting to feel like a proper ship again, and in a few days, she would be able to strip a planet of the materials she needed from orbit accelerating her repairs, and allowing her to fix systems she did not have the materials for, like the shields, and the hyperwarp engines. She also needed a few materials for her plans for the Neku she had captured. The planet in question was perfectly suited to supply those needs. 149, Chapter 10 Council of Shadows A shadowy figure settled into her seat. There were several more shadows around the table, and in the dim light, the only thing an observer would be able to notice was that they were all female, and all generally humanoid. Beyond that, the light and the cloaks they were wearing, little more could be discerned. This was the Council of Shadows. On their 273rd meeting this year, although this one had originally been scheduled to discuss a different topic, but something had gone wrong. They had lost all contact with a fleet carrying a couple of their lesser agents. A fleet that had been sent out on an important mission. Even if the intel they had was limited, the object of their new topic was being projected by a hologram. A single ship of truly ancient design, with a hull ruined by some ancient conflict. A precursor warship that they knew little about beyond a few key bits their agents had acquired. The key ones being its location, and the fact that the early had not been able to reactivate it. At least according to the intel their agents had brought back. But then again this ship had been so heavily classified by the early that getting what little intelligence they did have had been a feat in and of itself. The shadowy young woman sighed. She had been hoping to get news about its recovery during this meeting. Acquiring a precursor warship, no matter how damaged, would have done much to advance their cause, maybe even allow them to compete with the powerful elder races. Instead, they were now missing a fleet, and that was going to set them back with the Uruli. The planned assault on Uruli would have to be re-evaluated as well, without those ships they might not have enough to break through the heavy planetary defenses of the Uruli capital. Iril had nearly a dozen orbital fortresses, powerful planetary shields, multiple heavy ground batteries, tens of thousands of floating gun platforms, a dozen orbital fighter bases with hundreds of squadrons each, and a standing fleet of nearly a thousand capital ships. Very few systems in early space had comparable defenses, and because of those defenses, nothing short of a full-scale assault would get through. Sure that fleet was small, but it had contained a few capital ships that would help. More worrying though was they lacked information on what caused the loss of the fleet. She knew they could still get through without those ships, but it now looked a lot riskier. Especially if the loss of the fleet happened because the Aureli had reactivated this warship. The head of the table finally spoke. It looks like we are all here, and I trust you all read the reports. No one needed a recap, and she interjected after everyone confirmed they had read the reports. Well minor, the loss of that fleet means we should re-evaluate our planned assault on Iril. We need more information. I suggest we deploy a senior agent, 
they should be able to quickly uncover the fate of our fleet. I would have to agree, if the loss of the fleet was due to the eerily reactivating that precursor ship, it could have a major impact on any assault, especially since we don't know its capabilities or how intact it is. Spoke up a shadow to her left, two seats down. The shadow across from her, said, speaking of capabilities, do we have any idea what kind of abilities it might have? The shadow on her right answered that, a general idea, yes. She pointed at the hologram, based on the general design of the vessel, we can surmise that it was built by the Star Lords, the most enigmatic but also the most powerful of the precursor races. Their ships can still be found defending ancient shield worlds. From those encounters, we have an idea of what the ship might have, it's likely outfitted with deadly plasma-based beam weapons with the ability to carve capital ships apart at great range. In addition, it likely carries powerful torpedoes that can pass through shields like they aren't there, and destroy a capital ship in a single hit, and possibly precursor drone weapons. The Star Lords had several powerful drone weapons in their arsenal, impactor drones that would bury themselves repeatedly into a warship ripping it apart in short order. Fighter drones outfitted with powerful rapid-fire plasma bolt cannons that can tear ships apart in short order. Swarming drones that employ some kind of energy field that tears a ship apart and uses said ship's own energy against it as well. Not only did they have frighteningly powerful weapons, but that ship should have a highly resilient hull immune to all but the most powerful of weapons. Which is made more impressive by its ability to regenerate damage. The Star-Lord Guardians we have previously encountered were also equipped with extremely powerful shields. Shields that are stronger than most planetary shields and only the most powerful weapons in the galaxy can hope to penetrate, although it can be done. One of the Elder races did manage to once defeat a Guardian, but at great cost. It cost them several fleets, and nearly 10,000 ships to bring down just one Guardian. She recalled reading about that, and said, I see you have been doing some research. I found the same incident in my reading as well. As I recall they later released the shield that the Precursors left behind thinking it might give them a great advantage. It was a mistake. It was a plague world. Some kind of parasite. I believe, and they struggled just to contain it again. The shadow on the right nodded, yes, I read that incident myself as well, they had to glass the infected worlds. Someone else interjected, as fascinating as that is, we are getting off topic, the matter at hand is the proposal to postpone our planned assault on Iral. There was a murmur and then the head shadow said, personally I have to agree with the general assessment so far. The presence of even one precursor vessel in early hands greatly changes the balance of power. We need more information before we can go ahead with the assault. We should order the fleets to halt further advances into early territory, and secure current borders. You expect one ship to cause us that much trouble? Sure it sounds like it might be fairly powerful, but it can't be everywhere at once. She sighed, and countered that statement with one of her own, that may be so. But it doesn't have to be everywhere. If we commit to an assault on Iral, and it happens to be there the casualties will be crippling. We cannot afford to move without knowing where it is and what its capabilities are. Ignorance is not something we can afford. Several shadows quickly voiced their agreement to that, and with that statement, it seemed they were agreed. They would not move forward with the planned assault on Iral. The invasion would be delayed, for now. In the meantime they would send in five senior agents to gain the critical intel they needed, and if possible usurp control of the precursor vessel. The ship being active and in early hands was the only logical conclusion they could make for why they had lost an entire fleet. If the Arelli had wiped them out, at least a few ships would have escaped to make it back. The lack of escapees meant their demise must have been quick and sudden. The Arelli didn't have the weaponry for that, but the precursor warship very well might have, and it seemed it did. A jamming field could explain why they received no subspace communiques from the fleet. Even if it was something else, they could not make a move while in ignorance of what was causing them problems. Else those problems grow worse. Kairu stared at the ceiling. She wasn't sure exactly how long she had been in this cell, but assuming that her meals were regularly scheduled, Kairu thought it had been about five days. At the moment she was lying on the cell's sorry excuse for a bed, but she was reluctant to move. There just wasn't anything to do, and what she really wanted was someone to talk to. Five days locked up in a cell, five days of solitary confinement. Other than that hologram she had not spoken to anyone in that time, and she didn't exactly count the hologram as a conversational partner. Kairu had never thought of herself as a social butterfly, 
But after being alone for five days she almost desperately wanted someone to talk to. Someone not the ship. Dealing with the ship could be exhausting, especially with that hologram's tendency to call her princess. Kairu did not like it. But that didn't stop the ship. Not that she knew why the ship was calling her that in the first place. Then again she had never asked, merely complained about it a few times. She sighed, and after a moment she spoke to the room hoping for an answer. Why are you always calling me princess? A hologram materialized to her left, and said, Well princess that is because you are special, a rare specimen among your peers. She sat up, and gave the winged alien a look. I'm not some specimen. The hologram giggled, and then said, I wasn't joking about being rare though and I am not just talking about your coloring. Even if that is rare among your kind, not that you need worry about what makes you rare in my eyes, not yet anyway. Then the hologram vanished. Kairu stared at the empty space for a moment or two, and then spoke to the empty room. What are you talking about? No response ever came, and after a minute she lay back down, rolling over to face the wall. She was not very happy to be called a specimen. It reminded her too much of the lab rat thing hanging over her head. She was a cat, a natural predator not something to be experimented on. Not that the ship ever seemed to listen to her. Sometimes it just outright ignored her. The lights dimmed suddenly, although it did seem to always have an eye on her. Not an entirely pleasant thought. It certainly made her uncomfortable at times, especially in the bathroom. Not that there was anything she could do about that either. But what she was really worried about was the ship's plans for her. Kyra knew deep down that it was only a matter of time before she learned them. She just didn't want to learn them by experiencing them. Now she was even more worried about them. She was starting to get the impression the ship had something special in mind for her, and that just left her very unsettled. Kairu had no desire for special attention from this ship. She was getting the feeling that special attention was a bad thing, a very bad thing. Those thoughts were still churning in her mind as she drifted off into darkness. 144. Chapter 11 Orbital Strip Mining, and Reconfigurations Malia was relaxing in one of the ship's recently restored recreational lounges. The past few days had been mostly uneventful. The other scientists on board had been very excited when the ship let them into a new section a couple of days ago. A section of old labs that had recently been repaired. Well to be more accurate, the hull damage responsible for them being sealed off had been repaired. The labs were still in disarray, but the scientists had been ecstatic to go in there. There wasn't much of anything left from the ancient Solian projects that had been ongoing in those labs, and much of the equipment was broken. Some of it was working though. The ship however was more than willing to let them in there for her own reasons. A few unlucky scientists had already ended up on a table being probed. At the moment, Malia had found an interesting book in the ship's database and was enjoying it. The book's author presented a few interesting theories on the rise of the Solian people and their later supremacy over much of the known universe. The author attributed both to the nomadic past of the Solian race. She made a very compelling argument about how their wanderlust and nomadic tendencies had driven them into repeated contact with foreign cultures, claiming that these repeated contacts, skirmishes, and conflicts with completely alien cultures had exposed them to a far greater number of new ideas and technologies than more sedentary races. Centuries of this had forced them to rapidly develop their own advanced technologies to survive, and these technologies formed the arsenal upon which their empire would later be founded. Most of the key technologies of the Solian arsenal could in fact be traced all the way back to the nomadic era. Early versions of their iconic PPBs, Hellfire plasma cannons, and drone weapons could all be traced back to the nomadic era. Solian cloaking devices were also first developed in that era. Although Solian shields were an exception, while some forms of starship shields were developed in that era, the kind used in Megumi Zero evolved from a shield archetype developed after the founding of the Empire. The book was reaching a really interesting passage when the projectors suddenly came on. An image of the constellation was projected, albeit without the hull damage. Megumi appeared next to her. I'd like you to familiarize yourself with this. She mentally willed the projected book page to close, and looked over the hologram in the center of the room. Are these your schematics? Megumi smiled. Close enough. Actually, I plan on reconfiguring most of my modules and armament. Large sections need to be completely rebuilt anyway. For example, I am entirely missing decks 1 through 4, and my main bridge is simply gone. I need to do a rebuild in any case, because of that. Since I am not expecting combat with Dark Haitian fleets, I figured a reconfiguration was in order. 
At the moment, I am carrying a significant number of Hellfire Plasma Cannon batteries, far more than I would ordinarily need. I plan to reduce those in favor of a larger complement of drone weapons. They will likely be better suited to any future engagements anyway. Malia was already familiar with the Hellfire Plasma Cannon. Having read about it previously, it fired a superheated compressed plasma projectile, about the size of a small fist, contained within a decaying multispatial flux field that collapsed milliseconds after contact with dense matter, like the hull of a ship, or with an energy screen. It would also collapse on its own when the round reached maximum range. The collapse of the field always had explosive results. The weapon was renowned for having a very high rate of fire, and good accuracy. The rounds were also fairly powerful, and the explosive release of the plasma could be taken advantage of to act in the same capacity as a primitive flux screen would have been used. This can be done by manipulating the decay of the flux field, thereby allowing the balls of plasma to be detonated in the path of enemy torpedoes and light spacecraft. Factors that played into them being used heavily by Solian warships against the Dark Asians. Combined with drone carriers and cruisers they could wipe out hordes of swarming Dark Asian bioships. If Megumi had been alone and not part of a battle group chances were she would have been carrying more drones in the first place. Her batteries of hellfires were only intended for use on ships that got too close to the battle group, while her heavier guns took out the bigger ships in an opposing fleet. Not to mention most battleships would have remained fairly close to the drone cruisers to protect said cruisers, hence the heavy battery of hellfires. Switching to a more traditional configuration then, I take it. Megumi shrugged, not quite. I'm going for configuration E-19. Not one often used by the fleet. E-19 tries to combine the best advantages of a battleship with a drone carrier. I will be sacrificing most of my tertiary batteries, a couple auxiliary SIF generators, two sub-engines, and several ruined compartments to support a complement of nearly 1.8 billion drones. Most of which will be either swarm or impact a missile type. I will be carrying a few squadrons of fighter drones though. Changes in the exterior hull will include drone launch ports, recovery bays, and maintenance facilities for the new drones. Interesting. I wasn't aware you could reconfigure yourself. Why chose this one? Why not some other configuration? Well, self-reconfiguration is a natural extension of the ability to self-repair. As for why I chose this one? Well, it was meant for going it alone. E-19 was designed for ships separated from the fleet to use. It provides a nice balance of options but doesn't excel in any one category. I actually kind of like it in fact. There is a certain appeal to being a jack of all trades. I'll take your word for that. Melia replied, and stepped towards the projection of the E-19 configured constellation. As she started to look over it Megumi mentioned that they were about an hour out from their destination. The constellation decelerated and dropped a sublight on the edge of the inner system nearly 10 minutes travel from the planet the ship was interested in. They were not, however, the only visitor to the system dead ahead. A small cruiser was locked in deadly combat with a large flying plasma breathing reptile, a dragon. Megumi recognized the breed of Star Dragon immediately and was able to quickly determine that it was a young female of nesting age. Almost certainly out looking for a nest, and the moon orbiting the world the AI was interested in had a lush environment, not to mention there were signs of a primitive civilization. It looked perfect for a dragon nest. The cruiser on the other hand was unfamiliar but far more advanced than anything the Aureli or Neku had. The ship was roughly two kilometers long with a bloated looking design. Her sensors quickly identified its weapon mounts, and shield configuration. It had a decent shield configuration, one strong enough to withstand her subatomic disruptors. Still, it would not hold up long against her weapons, and certainly wasn't good enough to help with the young dragon it was fighting. The shields were already failing, and the ship had already sustained multiple hull breaches. The cruiser's advanced positron beam weapons proved to be of little use against the dragon. Its shinnick shields had easily deflected the beams. Suddenly the dragon used its breath, and the shields of the cruiser buckled. The stream of plasma burned through the hull, but the cruiser survived. Barely, the dragon flew off towards the moon. Megumi watched it go, as she approached the former site of the battle. Idly she scanned the cruiser as she passed, detecting multiple life signs in an intact section of the ship. The life support system was still running though. Figuring they would be fine for a few hours, she left the ship and continued towards the planets. Megumi figured she would get the mining done, start reconfiguring, and then maybe rescue the surviving aliens. Seeking out the dragon would be something important as well. She didn't even have to go out of her way to do that. 
Malia walked into the control room and glanced at the screen. Frowning she asked the seemingly empty room, what's with the damaged cruiser floating out there? Megumi promptly answered. I monitored the tail end of a battle on my way in. I don't know who they were, but they picked a fight with a young female dragon. A dragon that was way too strong for them I might add. Their beam weapons could not even penetrate her shinnick shields. Shinnick shields? Are, yes, I never did get around to discussing draconic technology did I? Guess I will now. The first thing you need to keep in mind is that all of the various paths that cultures follow in their development can be generalized into three primary branches. Although cultures tend to explore all of them at least in part at some point in their development, the first and the most common is the mechanical science path. Cultures on this path focus on developing increasingly complex tools and devices. The early and the neck you followed this path, and I myself am partially the result of this path as well. Partially. What do you mean by that? I'll get to that later. Anyway, the second path is the organic science path. Cultures on this path focus on creating biological solutions to accomplish their ends. Bioships are a perfect example of this path. Organic starships are powerful too, and cultures on this path are definitely worth respecting. Everyone eventually dabbles with this kind of science, and the Solians were no exception. They created biomechanoids, and sentient weapons using knowledge of this path. The final path is the path of the mind, the path of magic. Many cultures dabble in this path, but it is very hard to get started on this path. Those cultures that do progress down this path end up being very powerful indeed. My builders, the Solians, may have started on the mechanical path, but they went very far down this path as well, eventually learning how to teach machines to use magic. I mentioned earlier that I was partially of the mechanical path. Well I'm actually a culmination of elements from all three paths, but mainly of the first and third. Magic? Not a word I expected to hear. Well, our definition is somewhat different from the equivalent early word. By our definition magic is the power to bend reality to your will. A definition that perfectly applies to something called transcendent shinics. Transcendents, or mages as they are often called, have highly advanced minds, and can channel esoteric energies to produce powerful effects. These energies follow their own rules, but just about anything is possible. Assuming you can meet the cost. Shinnick shields are the magic path's version of energy shields. A mage or a dragon would channel a shinnick energy form, such as Mei Kayu, into a dense energy barrier around themselves. This barrier acts just like a normal energy shield absorbing energy up to its capacity before failing. Some of this energy is radiated away, and the shield can regenerate. How effective the shield is, depends on the spell used to form it. Dragons, as I said, rely on more mystical technologies, and they learn very well how to use transcendent shinnicks. They have naturally powerful abilities, but in their long lives they teach their children many things. Things that can make them more dangerous than most starships. Few races can match a dragon in battle without the aid of something like myself. Solian elders were among the few that could not only fight a dragon evenly without any weapons or ships, but they would often win. Mulia frowned. Wait, what? Megumi shifted her hologram, and replied, The Solians are part of a group of races commonly called the immortal races. So are the dragons. What all the races in this group have in common is that they are naturally inclined to become transcendent shinniks. The more powerful a transcendent shinnik is in their abilities, the longer they will live. Those who are part of the immortal races tend to be very powerful in their abilities, and absolute terrors on the battlefield, just one of them can change the course of a war. Building an army of them, however, can prove difficult. A Solian elder for example takes tens of thousands of years to develop the kind of power they are famed for. On top of that, a Solian takes a long time to mature. The same can be said for dragons. A factor that played into the Solian seeking ways to must produce transcendence for war, especially given that all Darkations are transcendent themselves. Going so far as to create machines with shinnick ability in fact, then of course there were more conventional projects that created things like the Draviary, a race of warriors with a natural tendency towards shinnick ability, and more importantly they could grow to maturity far faster than most immortals while being able to reach a similar level of power on the battlefield. Although they did have a very deeply set natural warrior mentality, the Terrans endlessly complained about the fact that they refused to wear clothes. The only thing they would ever wear was their armor. It didn't help much that they looked a lot like the Solians, who tended to look rather young by Terran standards. That is actually a common problem among immortals. 
To the more mortal races, the immortals tend to look like young teens or children. Even when they are actually hundreds of years old, it becomes especially problematic around mortals with certain perversions. In the case of the Solians they tended to look like young teens to Terrans, and were always on the short side. The average Solian was actually around your height, Malia blinked. Really? I thought the people using this ship must have been taller, the rooms were clearly designed for a taller race. Then again most of the consoles were perfectly placed for us. Even the chairs now that I think about it. I had a mixed crew of Solians and Terrans. The two races are cousins from the same home world, not that you would know it. The three races of Earth each have very different ideas of the best place to live. The Solians are not big fans of living on a planet's surface and tend to live out their long lives in space. The Terrans are practically immune to radiation. In fact they thrive in it and naturally prefer radioactive wastelands to live in. That also plays into why most races in the Empire don't buy ships from them as well. Being immune to radiation. They tend to forget to install radiation shielding on their ships. Then there are the rather reclusive Cavalonians. They like to live underground and tend to avoid contact with other races. Malia glanced at the screen and noticed that they were already in orbit, and energy beams were raining down on the planets. It seemed the orbital strip mining had already started. Must be nice being an AI, able to hold a conversation, and do a dozen other things at once. All without even trying. That is interesting. Makes one wonder though. How did such different races evolve from the same planet? Oh, that is quite easy. They all had the same ancestor, ancient humans, who went extinct not long after a war devastated their home world. Their scattered descendants however each found their own niche, and not only survived but thrived, eventually becoming the three races known today. That answer is a bit short. Megumi shrugged. Well, if you want to know more go read a book on the subject. I'm not here to answer your every question. True enough she muttered, as she started to watch the process with more interest. Then after a moment of silence, she asked, How long is this strip mining process going to take anyway? A few hours. I should be done around dinner time. Then I can get started on a few projects I have been holding off on, due to a lack of materials. I even identified a very useful mineral on this planet, a type of ore that can be converted into Omega, my primary fuel source. I guess that made this stop very worthwhile. Very worthwhile indeed. Anyway, I'll be needing you to keep your early friends out of the biolabs for the next few days. I don't need any pests interfering with my projects. Speaking of projects, there is something I would like to test out with you. My scans of your species, and you in particular show very high shinic potential. It is untapped and underdeveloped. I want to see if I can't help you unlock it. Malia looked over, and with a frown said, as interesting as that sounds. It isn't going to require anything weird is it? You won't need to open up my head and stick strange devices in my brain will you? Megumi giggled. No, it won't require anything remotely like that. I will have to put you in a special device for about a week though. I'll let you decide when he can start. But don't take too long. I'd like to start teaching you basic skills in about a month. Mulia, now curious, asked. Basic skills? Teaching me? You can do that? Megumi smiled. I can. As I said earlier the Solians found ways to give machines shinic abilities. Although only AI cores of my level or greater can actually use them. That and biomechaniodes. But as machines go they are rather special. They are partially organic after all. But they still need to make AI U emulator to properly channel the needed esoteric energies. I guess that is one more thing to look forward to. And another item to read up on. Well you will meet some before long. I plan to start growing a few biomics. Just one of several plans I have in motion. Not that we have time to discuss those. I need you to start moving crew around. I am ready to begin repairs and reconfigurations. Before you ask, I will be informing you before I start on any given section, and give you about 15 minutes to get everyone out. That should be more than enough time. Malia headed to leave the room and get started. She had to agree, 15 minutes should be plenty of time. An emergency evacuation was supposed to take 3 minutes at the most. She had way more time and wasn't under pressure thanks to an onboard emergency. Not that she was looking forward to moving people around, but she had signed up for this. The ship was her master, and she had agreed to do things like this for the ship in exchange for nothing more than knowledge. A part of her was already looking forward to learning about transcendent shiniks. Whatever that meant. 129. Chapter 12 Greeting the Locals She stared at the newest object to catch her notice. A ship she had failed to detect arriving. 
a fact made all the more embarrassing by the fact that the wounded vessel was clearly not trying to hide, its cloaking shields were down, and it was actively carving away at the planet her nest was orbiting. She could already see that its hull was rapidly regenerating, the old wounds closing off and reforming into a pristine hull, it was truly a sight to see. Entire sections of hull merely liquefied themselves, and then just flowed into proper shape before hardening. The entire process took just seconds. If it wasn't for the using mana to enhance her sight, she would not have been able to catch it. Given the size of the vessel, it was going to take time for it to finish repairing what was clearly extensive damage. The young dragoness already recognized what the new arrival was. A Solian battleship, more specifically the ship was of a battleship class that was used during the Million Years War. A Solian Sovereign class battleship, a heavy capital ship that had served as a mainstay of the Solian fleet for ages, and for good reason. Even wounded, it was an opponent she would have to be wary of, especially with its uncanny ability to disappear and strike unseen. Unlike the pathetic vessels she had to deal with on a regular basis this was a ship worthy of respect. Her senses swept over the ship thoroughly, and she found a few things. Shields were currently down but that wasn't a sign of the ship not being on alert. Her main generators appear to have overloaded and not recently. The damage to the shields is not only extensive, but the wounds were old, very old. Wounds that were only now starting to heal. Her cloak however was quite operational, and she had minimal warp drive. Scratch that. Now she has no warp capability. The ship had just scrapped her own engines, all of them, and is rebuilding them completely. As for weapons, other than the plasma beams being used to carve away at the planet, they were unpowered, and not on standby either. If the ship knew she was here, it wasn't worried about her, or anyone else for that matter. She did not want to fight it anyway. A nice friendly chat sounded better. The young dragoness could use a little company, and who knows, maybe this wounded ship would like to stay. That would be nice. The young dragoness reached out with her mind, sending out a telepathic hail. For a moment or two she received no answer, and then a single female voice replied. One somewhat different from what she was used to, but the one she expected, the ship itself had replied, something most ships could not do. Even the bioships she had seen recently could not reply to her in this fashion, their crews were even less able. She smiled to herself, and let a link establish then she introduced herself, I am Ulira, and you are? Megumi, primary AI of the Solian Imperial Battleship Constellation. With introductions out of the way, she began with a simple chat but things quickly took a more serious turn. Out of curiosity, I monitored a battle on my way into the system. That strange cruiser, do you know who they are? Ulira sent the mental equivalent of a sigh, and replied, Unfortunately yes, one of the so-called Elder Races. Specifically the ship is of Ludol origin. Although as so-called elders go, the Ludol are one of the better races, but they aren't yet mature enough to truly call themselves an elder race. None of the elder races are, but they don't exactly listen to us. If they had that whole plague incident the Nokari had to deal with never would have happened. Plague incident? What kind of stupid did they get into? You chose the right word there. Although it doesn't really convey the depths of stupidity. The fools in their infinite stupidity decided that it would be a good idea to crack open a Solian shield world. Paying very little attention to the fact that the shield was clearly designed to keep something in. Why else would the power generators be outside the shield? Part of it was that they were blinded by greed. Luckily for them the shield world in question was merely a quarantine planet. A mental sigh, followed by, yeah, that was stupid. Even the Darkations knew better. I guess that answers one question. More importantly, I was wondering, would you happen to know how that war ended, and what happened to my creators? Alira sent a mental frown down the connection, I had thought you were old, but that is old enough to be a living treasure. Kind of a heavy topic, but I do know how the war ended. According to mother, the million years war grew very desperate, but the lines held barely, most plans for victory crumbled against the ever increasing dark Asian numbers, ironically that was how they were ultimately beaten. Your builders. The Solians defeated them with numbers by building two additional shipyards of the same scale and scope as their famed central shipyards. With the increased capacity they were able to mass-produce battleships on such a scale that they couldn't man them all. Vast automated fleets were sent in, with ever-increasing numbers to counter the Darkations. Eventually, Solian fleet numbers exceeded the Darkation fleet numbers. When that happened what followed was a long, slow, slog, as the race was systematically hunted down and purged. 
Mom says victory was effectively achieved by the year 3,570,000 SDE, but the war did not actually end until the death of the last Darkation Queen in the year 4,021 SDE. That's why the war is called the Million Years War by the way. As for your creators, I am afraid I don't know. Like dragon kind, they were exhausted after the war, but they stayed long enough to reseed the life that had been lost in the war, reviving entire species that had been rendered extinct or bringing others back from the brink, we helped, and when we were done we went back to our nests and hibernated. When we awoke, our longtime allies and friendly rivals were gone, the Stargate network had been shut down, ancient fortresses and outposts abandoned, only the automated guardian network had been left behind. We suspect they went back to their oldest nests, to the core of their empire, not that we ever went to check. Without the Stargates, the journey is too far nor have they been seen since the end of the war. Thank you. That was actually a great help. I suspected that the war had been won, but it is nice to have confirmation on that. Would have been nice to have known the fate of my builders, but that is a mystery I have plenty of time to solve. I have a more immediate one to solve. Someone seems to be pulling the strings of the Neku, using them to make war. She sighed. I noticed. Myself. But as a young dragon I am forbidden to interfere. I did. However, inform the elders, and they sent someone to look into it. I have the feeling that you really want to help though, replied Megumi. She flushed, and replied, I kinda like the Aruli. Very lovely and cute little creatures, just not quite ready to communicate with me on any meaningful level, and unfortunately rather scared of us. Well my sample size is currently small, but every Aruli I have scanned should be able to understand low bandwidth telepathy, although they can't initiate a telepathic link. Not yet. I found one with some fairly high potential, and I plan to use her to fully explore early potential. You are right about that. Most early can understand telepathy assuming you restrict your bandwidth to something they can handle, but it's rather hard to hold a meaningful conversation with such restricted bandwidth, although it is better than the average. Well, I don't know what you could do to help, but out of curiosity, how far along are you on building your nest on that moon? I'm pretty sure you could tell on your own, but I have not yet built it. I was surveying the place when those rude ludels showed up and attacked me. The moon isn't ideal either, it has life, and a primitive population, but there is a distinct lack of suitable nesting sites and an even worse lack of large game. Even the waters are lacking. I can't find any sort of large fish or other sea creatures. There was a mental sigh. My knowledge of the area is mostly limited to what I have scanned with my damaged senses. And what my captain knew, the dragoness caught the underlying message and giggled. That's amusing, a primitive serving a glorified glowing rock. Well, at least she gets to boss around the other primitives. Her statement wasn't entirely wrong there. A Solian AI core was actually a highly complex crystalline lattice composed of several different crystal types including a rare kind of crystal called Sithan crystal. A unique crystal that is known for its ability to absorb and store vast amounts of shinnik energies. It played a major role in the ability of Solian machines to use magic. It wasn't all that different from a draconic war machine actually. Not that she could actually see Megumi's core. It was too heavily shielded. I guess that is amusing. Anyway, I wish you luck with your nest hunting. Good luck with your repairs. And I hope you find the answers you seek. They closed with a few extra pleasantries. And then she took wing. This system wasn't what she was looking for. Perhaps another would be better suited to her needs. Mentally she still marked this one down. It was still one of the better prospects. Besides she had time to be picky. Her eggs would not be ready for another two years anyway. Plenty of time to scout a few more systems, and hopefully, find a better candidate. Mentally she was even hoping for an opportunity to help the Irrily to occur while she was nest hunting. She could force that by choosing a site close to Irrily, but she had a feeling the elders would have something to say about that. However if that proved the best prospect. There would be little she could do about that, the dragoness without even realizing had changed her course slightly, a small change, but one that would put her in a system close to a rule, although it was lacking a direct jump path to a rule, as a result, there was not a significant eerily presence, but the system wasn't uninhabited, it had three life-giving planets, two of which had their own primitive civilizations on them. Not to mention several large moons that could support life, an ideal prospect for finding a nest but also an ideal staging ground for an assault on Iril. 
A short while later, Megumi watched the Dragoness engage her star drive, and slip into FDL. Around the same time, she managed to complete repairs to her sensor array and primary comms array. She paid little attention to her readings at first, and merely watched the Dragon as she sped away from the system while her subroutines ran a full sweep of the sensors and comms systems. Then something on her long-range sensors caught her notice. Nothing she need investigate for a while, but she was picking up the signature of an Altian warship. Not just any ship either, but one she remembered. It had been presumed lost, three months before that fateful battle when the ship had failed to reach the rendezvous point. The ship was in a nebula just 19 light years from her current position, but her power signatures were minimal. She was also putting out an intermittent distress call, but it was weak. It wasn't even on the normal interstellar channels, but a weaker sublight band. If she hadn't been doing a full test, she never would have even detected it. Announcement I hope you are enjoying the story. Also now would be a good time to join Patreon. Join now and you can read ahead all the way to Chapter 26. 131. Chapter 13 Projects. It was about time she got started on a few of her projects. But in the meantime, she focused several long-range sensors on the recently discovered Altian ship. The ship in question was the Ad's Inquisitor. A Vindicator class heavy dreadnought. A very respectable ship class that served as the mainstay capital ship of the Altian fleet. Roughly triple her size, the ship was powered by 12 primary zero point energy reactors spurs and roughly 30 auxiliary zero point energy modules PEMs. The Altians didn't use Omega energy or subspace energy wells like the Solians did. Zero point energy was a powerful alternative though albeit with its own dangers. These power plants provided the massive amounts of energy needed to power her energy-hungry systems. Her shields and weapons were so hungry for energy that they could barely function on auxiliary power, and that was with all 30 modules working together. Although her shields were certainly powerful, of the precursor races, all Tian shields had the highest capacity, and could therefore absorb the most energy before overloading. They also ranked respectably in terms of mitigation rates at 5th place, but their cycling rate left much to be desired at 97th place. Solian shields on the other hand ranked first in both mitigation, and cycle times. Although shield capacity was somewhat low, it remained somewhat respectable at 17th place. What this meant is that while Altian shields could absorb more damage, Solian shields could regenerate faster while under fire, and could recover from overload more quickly as well. In practice that meant that during a prolonged engagement Solian shields were better, but Altian shields were superior in short engagements. As for weapons, the Altians made heavy use of drone weaponry. Impactor drones equipped with interface generators were a particular favorite of theirs. Able to pass through any shield, and rip into a hull repeatedly. They were also well known for a pulsed energy weapon that made use of a byproduct of their energy generation method a type of exotic radiation that could pass through most energy fields. These particles were named Jerome radiation after the Altian scientist that discovered them. The Inquisitor had been carrying nearly 200,000 drone launcher ports and a mixed battery of Altian pulse weapons, 12 anti-supercapital ship batteries, 18 anti-capital ship batteries, 40 heavy pulse batteries, 400 hundred standard pulse batteries, and nearly a thousand light batteries. Like all Altian ships, she carried no missiles, torpedoes, or kinetic weapons. She did have a spinal mounted beam weapon that fired a focused stream of Euromi radiation and had enough firepower to vaporize a large planet, most capital ships, and even some super capital ships. Sovereign class battleships such as herself were not on that list. Her shields were strong enough to absorb that beam. Barely. Not that she really had to worry about that weapon. It was easy to avoid, especially given that it was not really intended for use against ships her size. That beam weapon was mainly intended for use against supercapital ships, fortified star bases, and planets. As for propulsion, the ship used a form of subspace plasma to generate thrust at sublight velocities. For FDL, like all Altian ships, it relied on a flux wave hyperdrive that was very fast for a hyperdrive, able to achieve speeds comparable to her own warp engines if a tad slower. Although that was not fast enough for intergalactic travel, for that the Altians used a more powerful version of their hyperdrives called an interflux wave hyperdrive. Both drives however functioned on the same basic principles, and there was little difference between the two. Except the intergalactic version was more advanced. 
There were plenty of reasons for her to head for this ship. The technology on board was too dangerous for the younger races, and could greatly upset the balance of power in this galaxy. Honestly, she wanted to head out that way immediately, but she had already spotted a small fleet near the ship. While she had not yet identified the ships, she knew that in her current state she would be in trouble if they had managed to reactivate the defense systems. It would be better to complete her repairs. On paper, an Altian heavy dreadnought was more than a match for a Solian battleship. Vindicators were comparable to the Solian Victory class dreadnoughts if a bit inferior. In practice, however, she actually held the advantage. In a much up, sure the Vindicator had powerful weapons and strong shields. It could also see through her cloak. But she does have a major advantage. Her PPBs and hyperdensity plasma cannons have an effective range that exceeds the maximum range of Voltian pulse weapons. In addition, she is faster and more maneuverable than the Vindicator. The only weapon she has to worry about is the Altian drone weapons. Those could pass right through her shields while her armor is sturdy enough to stop them. And she does have supplemental energy armor to further protect against them. Enough drones could still present a serious threat. If the Inquisitor still has an ample supply of drones on board it could prove to be a challenging threat. On the flip side Aldean ships were not particularly sturdy, and their self-repair systems less sophisticated than hers. The Aldeans suffered from not employing sapient AIs like the Solians did. At the same moment that she was reviewing old data, and forming contingency plans she started on some more of her projects. Deep within her bowels, a series of old labs had been restored. Already her sensors were monitoring entire arrays of growth pods, each pod contained the rapidly growing form of a new biomechanoid. Biomechanical machines that would serve as her primary foot soldiers, but were also versatile enough for other tasks. Being highly advanced biomechanical machines they would be fully capable of intelligent thought, learning, and were self-aware. The biomeshs could even self-replicate, but not as quickly or as efficiently as her growth pods could grow them. A single pod could grow a biomech from embryo to full maturity in 32 hours. In contrast, a biomech required three months to gestate on their own, and a further five years to reach maturity. Of course these machines did need time to learn, so they were a lot like using ordinary soldiers. Only these soldiers come with internal shield generators, self-repair mechanisms, internal sensor nodes hidden weapons, and other gizmos depending on their class. In effect, Megumi was actually growing a small army of super soldiers, an army that would play a major role in her plans. It was also time for her to get another project started, and she focused on Kairu. It was time she started on the plans she had for the young Neku. She was going to play a critical role in her plans, and that was all going to start with a simple procedure. One she now had the materials for. Kairu stared at the wall. She was lying on the sorry shelf. Utterly bored, there was nothing to really do in here, and she didn't feel like exercising, nor was she tired enough to sleep. So here she was, lying on the bed staring at the wall, wishing that the wall wasn't so perfectly featureless. Unfortunately it was a smooth perfectly polished surface without blemish. No lines, no bolts, no welds, just an unbroken smooth polished surface, which gave her very little to stare at. She sighed, the boredom wasn't all that bad though. It gave her plenty of time to think. Even if unfortunately her mind wanted to dwell on her uncertain future. A future she had no control over, but rather a very enigmatic AI. She kept telling herself that things could be worse. Things could always be worse. Suddenly she heard a slight hum from behind. She rolled over and was greeted with the sight of the wall. Dissolving, the far wall where she had expected, but never found an entrance in was melting away. From the center out in a perfect circle it was vanishing. The metal folding in on itself as it liquefied. The entire process was very rapid, and before she realized it there was now a perfect arch-shaped hole in the wall. Two glowing spheres moved in through the opening, and a familiar figure materialized between them. The hologram was back, and she had brought friends. Before she could move, the hologram spoke. Get up, princess, it's time for your procedure. She frowned. She had no idea what this procedure entailed. But Kairu had a feeling she didn't want to know. Maybe it was the two drones on either side of the door. But for whatever reason she suddenly wanted nothing more than to be left in her cell with nothing to do. Something was sounding alarms in her head though. With reluctance, she sat up, and asked. Procedure? The hologram gave her a look. Don't worry, you won't feel a thing. I just need to make a few adjustments to your body, and your brain. Now she was really worried. Kairu didn't even realize she was speaking until after she spoke. My brain? 
you're not going to do something crazy like try and replace it with a computer or something? The hologram looked offended. I'm not an iridex. I just have some brainwashing to reverse, and a few micro implants to install. A very simple procedure. Although I could replace part of it with a computer if you like. She had no idea why she said that. Kairu would very much prefer that her brain remained untouched. But she doubted she could convince the AI to leave that alone. The brainwashing thing disturbed her. After all, what did she mean about reverse? Then there was something else that raised questions. As she stood up, she decided to ask the other question. First, what's an iridex? An ancient machine intelligence that tends to use biologicals as drones. Honestly, the iridex are rather creepy. Although, they were one of the few precursor races actually on par with the Solians in technology. The only other precursor race that could match the Solians in technology were the Altines, both of which were at war with the Empire prior to the arrival of the Darkation Menace, answered the hologram before prompting her to follow. As the drones left, she followed. It felt like she was heading to her doom, and to distract herself she decided to continue the conversation. The brainwashing but having already been forgotten. Interesting, I think I can guess why the Iridex were at war with the Empire, but why the Altines? The Altian Directorate? Well, that's quite simple actually. The Solian people are nomadic, and the Altines are sedentary. As is normal for such different cultures neither was willing to recognize the sovereignty of the other. Sedentary races tend to see nomadic ones as little better than marauding pirates, while nomadic cultures tend to see sedentary races as rather barbaric because of those tendencies. It's a bit of a vicious cycle actually. Nomadic? Well, yes. If you had ever wondered why no colonies belonging to the Star Lords have ever been found, it's because the Solians do not colonize planets, they tend to live out their lives on massive city ships, instead. I do mean massive by the way, I know they really consider me large, but I am tiny compared to a city ship. Those ships are truly massive, dwarfing even the moon-sized super dreadnoughts in size. City ships are the largest spacefaring vessels ever constructed, their only rival for size are the mobile planetary fortresses, but they dwarf those too, they are true engineering marvels. She blinked. If they are that big, they must be the size of planets. I shudder to imagine the kind of destruction a warship that big could unleash. The hologram giggled. That would be a waste of materials. Ships that massive are not very practical as warships. Although they make great logistical vessels. The sheer amount of industry that can be packed into such a large ship makes for a very useful mobile fleet base. That is what an MPF is. But beyond serving as a mobile base for fleets ships that big are not that useful. Thinking about it she realized that kind of made sense. Now she felt like an idiot. Of course a ship that size would make a poor warship. The energy requirements of moving it alone would be massive. She fell silent a moment but before long she changed the subject. As she was still trying not to think about where she was going. 128. Chapter 14 Procedure. Announcement. Alert. This chapter contains content that may be disturbing to some readers. Continue reading at your own risk. Kairu stepped into the lab with trepidation. By now it was very hard for her to distract herself. Her instincts were screaming at her, that she was walking right into the heart of a beast's den. Kairu just didn't see any way to avoid her fate. No way to escape whatever the AI wanted of her. Glancing around she noticed tube after tube in which the form of a small infant could be seen floating in a swirling golden blue mix of thick fluids. The fluid made it hard to make out details beyond the fact that they were infants. At least, she thought they were infants. The hologram noticed her looking and said, those are biomics. Scout class to be specific. You will learn more about them later. These were started shortly before I collected you. Biomech, what is that? Biomechanical machines, roughly analogous to cyborgs. The main difference being they are machines with organic components, whereas cyborgs are people augmented with machines. Ours are self-replicating, but these pods can grow them faster. Reducing a process that would take about 5 years and 3 months for a mature specimen, to a mere 32 hours. That was frightening. It occurred to her that she was looking at the start of an army. This room was large, and there were hundreds of pods here. With a ship this large, there could be thousands of pods, each with a baby biomech in it. Although just having the manpower wasn't all that was needed for an army, troops needed supplies, like weapons, and armor. More importantly, they need food. An army can't fight effectively on an empty stomach. Kairu was led around the pods, and into the back of the room, where she noticed a number of beds surrounded by strange equipment, and a couple of drones of a different design. 
Now the alarms were beyond shouting in her mind, and not even the Biomax could serve as a distraction. Every fiber of her being was telling her to run. She sensed the drones escorting her shift in their movements as if getting ready to catch her if she bolted. They were now entirely too close to her for comfort. The hologram pointed at the fifth bed, and said, Lay down there, and we can get started. She froze and shook her head. The last thing Kairu wanted to do was lie down on one of those beds. The hologram gave her a look, one that reminded her of a mother looking at a petulant child. You either lay down on your own, or I will pacify you and my drones will lay you there. You won't like it if I have to pacify you, and if you cooperate I'll give you limited freedom. Either way, you will be on that table in the next five minutes. That was a threat. She knew it was one, but her instincts told her it was no empty one. Kairu wasn't sure she wanted to know what the hologram meant about pacifying her for a moment. She just stood there, but then she took a hesitant step forward, then another, and another. Slowly she approached the bed, her gaze darting around, her mind frantically trying to find a way out, but not seeing one. The freedom was tempting but all she really wanted was a way out. Unfortunately, she could not see one. The drones were too close, the cover was limited. She had no idea if there weren't hidden weapons emplacements in the room. Not that the cover even mattered. She highly doubted she could take more than three steps before they shot her. She was feeling quite trapped when she reached the bed. She paused at the foot of the strange bed, finding it difficult to keep moving. A sudden pressure on her back nearly made her jump. It was one of the drones using its tendrils to give her a push. The force became a little more insistent, and with great reluctance, she climbed onto the bed. Kairu was exactly where that alien computer wanted her. But she didn't see a way out of it. Fighting was pointless. There was nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. She didn't know what to do. Not even her training gave her a way out. Then again her training assumed she would be fighting organic opponents, not super advanced machines. If the guards were really and not drones she could have thought up a half dozen ways to escape. Already, the same case. If they were fellow Neku, floating glowing blue spheres with a skirt of glowing tendrils, that was a blank. She had no idea how to fight those. Last time she had faced just one, and it stunned her entire bridge crew. None of their weapons had been effective, and she just couldn't see her bare hands being more effective than a plasma pistol. Despite knowing those courses were futile, she was tempted to take them. However, she did not take those courses of action and instead climbed onto the bed. A decision she barely had time to regret before her choices no longer mattered. An arm suddenly shot from above and pressed something against her neck. The two drones to the side deployed their arms, catching her as she started to pitch forward. Her mind was in full panic, she barely felt the arms. Her body had stopped responding to her completely. She still felt the drones touching her naked flesh, but there was a distance to it. As if she was merely an observer, and her body was no longer hers, but someone else's. It was strange and very distressing. The drones positioned her carefully on the bed. Kairu desperately tried to command her body to move, but it would not. Megumi's hologram vanished, and a piece of gentle calming music began to play, one she had never heard before and didn't really pay attention to either. Instead, she watched them drones that positioned her step back, from above several arms, descended. The first arm began by spraying her with something. What? She had no idea. That was followed by a ray of light sweeping over her body. At least it looked like light. As it passed over her the foamy liquid broke down and vanished. Those first arms retracted after that, and a new set descended to work over her body. She watched in horror as they started to skin her. It was beyond surreal, she felt pain but it was very distant, as if it was happening to someone else, and she was just feeling a sympathetic reaction. The arms were simply pulling her skin off her body, as if they were unwrapping a piece of candy. The complete lack of blood just made it far more disturbing. Part of her wanted to move just so she could get a better look at what they were doing to her, and another didn't. Not that it mattered, she couldn't move, whatever they did to her had paralyzed her, perhaps it was a good thing that she couldn't see everything they were doing, but her curious side was winning, perhaps it had to do with how distant everything felt, but she wanted to know what they were doing, somehow the machines must have picked up on that thought, as a holographic mirror suddenly projected itself above, reflecting exactly what they were doing to her, she had been briefly shifted onto her side, while she wasn't paying attention, now the arms were laying her back down, all her skin, hair, and fur was gone, it was disturbing, but also strangely intriguing, she could see every muscle, and every organ reflected in that mirror, tubes were being inserted into her body, at the same time, 
She watched as the arms began removing organs from her body. Seeing it happen was strange, and worse she couldn't even feel it happening. She could see it, but Kairu thought she should feel something more if someone was actively removing her organs. She barely even noticed when they removed her ribcage and breasts. In moments, the arms emptied her torso of organs. Everything had been removed, nothing had been left in there. Her medic training told her that should be fatal, but she was still strangely alive and conscious. The tubes had to be keeping her alive. The complete lack of bleeding was shocking as well. She didn't even know how they were doing that, but it just made this far more surreal. In fact, she was starting to think this wasn't even real, but just a bizarre nightmare. However, it seemed they hadn't removed enough. The arms shifted their focus, and she watched incredulously as both her arms and legs were surgically removed. Both arms were separated from her body at the shoulder, and a similar thing happened with her legs. A part of her expected them to amputate her tail next, but strangely the arms retracted up, leaving her tail completely alone. One of them drones moved back into view, and it began installing devices into her empty torso. The second drone approached her head, and she watched as it opened up her skull. Two arms used a pair of lasers to cut open the top of her skull. Then it gently lifted the entire top of her skull away. Smaller more delicate arms reached into her head and started to do things she couldn't see. The machine was doing something to her brain, and she couldn't even see what it was doing. She decided to watch the other one, as it set up an array of strange machinery in her torso. Identifying these implants was beyond her, but she noticed all of it looked somewhat organic. None of what she saw was familiar. Before she knew it, the drone was done. It moved away and then came back instantly with what were clearly her organs, floating in a tank, just not all of them. Her liver and kidneys for example were strangely missing. In fact, most of her organs were missing. Although a part of her was relieved when she saw her uterus, and ovaries floating in the tank, it removed the worry that she might never have the chance to be a mother. The machines had not sterilized her, not permanently anyway. With a clearly delicate touch, she watched the drone restore her organs to her body. It started with her heart and lungs, although she noted both organs looked a little different. Something may have been done to them, but she didn't know what. Little did she realize that these were actually newly grown with enhanced DNA and function. All of her organs were, including the reproductive organs she was glad to see again. Once her organs were reseated, a number of alien devices were hooked up to them, and the life support tubes were removed. And then the drone stepped away, quickly leaving her sight before returning an instant later with a pair of tanks. This time, the tanks contained her arms and legs. Although she noticed her skin was back on them, it was clear they had restored the skin, while out of sight, but she had no idea why they had been removed in the first place. If she had made the small leap, she would have realized they amputated her limbs to replace them. These were not her original arms and legs. They were force-grown and enhanced replacements grown from the ground up with a number of implants, making them rather akin to biomic limbs. It wasn't the first time she had seen a limb be surgically reattached, and the process was surprisingly similar to what she had seen before. Followed by that, the drone turned and briefly left her sight. Coming back into sight with a tank containing her missing breasts and rib cage, again she noticed that the skin had been restored on that missing part of her body. Kairu once again failed to realize what that meant though. The drone simply went about reattaching it with mechanical precision. Then it stepped back, and a few moments after that, the other drone proceeded to reattach the top of her skull. She was quite relieved to see it no longer rooting around in her head. A part of her didn't even want to think about what it was doing in there. At least the procedure seemed to be almost over. As soon as the drones were clear, the arms above descended. They again sprayed her body with some kind of foam. This one was different, it was a thick silvery blue and not the silver grey colour the first foam was. She was quickly coated with it from head to toe, then a light ran over her body making it vanish in an instant. As it passed it revealed beautiful perfect skin where previously there was none. No hair came back though, a second treatment occurred using a greenish foam that was applied and where it was applied her hair grew back in an instant. Soon she had hair, and fur back again. Reflected in the holographic mirror, she looked normal again. Although she would not have called that a simple procedure, yet, it didn't seem to be done. A force field suddenly sprang around her, and several restraints wrapped themselves around her. The whole bed began to reorient itself, and from below it began to fill with that same fluid she saw earlier. Her mind quickly realized that the bed was also one of the pods she had seen earlier. As the fluid climbed slowly, she started to feel very tired. At the same moment, she started to become more aware of her body. 
It was still distant, but not as distant as before. Aches she had not been aware of before were becoming apparent. That urge to sleep was so strong though, that she was having a hard time fighting it. She nodded off several times, and each time she stirred the fluid had risen noticeably. The first time, it had passed her knees, the second it had passed her hips, and the last time she briefly stirred the fluid had just passed her shoulders. When the darkness greeted her again, she didn't wake again that day. 136, Chapter 15 Kairu 2.0, Kairu woke up feeling wonderful. She had never felt so good in her life before, none of the little eggs she always had were with her, she felt quite refreshed as well as if she had the best sleep of her life. Kairu's mood quickly shifted as the past events came back to her mind. She had just gone through a surreal and horrible procedure. She opened her eyes and looked around. Her pod was open, the fluid gone, and dozens of young naked girls were stepping out of pods around her. It had apparently been a while since her procedure began. Megumi shimmered into view, and said, Good morning princess. I'm sure you have plenty of questions, and they will be answered. Not all at once though. Besides I believe you would rather eat at the moment, now that Megumi mentioned it, Kyra noticed that she was famished. Then again, she had not eaten in over a day, so that came as little surprise. She nodded, Kyra did have questions, but she would rather ask them after she had eaten. Megumi responded by barking orders and mentioned something about a class. In fact, it sounded like Megumi considered all these naked young girls to be her classmates something she wasn't sure about, yet, with no reason not to, and driven in part by hunger, and part by curiosity she formed up with the young biomics, they formed up into a line at the door, a drone stood by the door with a stack of identical plain shifts, simple thigh length plain white dresses with an unremarkable cut, as each girl was handed a shift, she slipped it on with help from the drone and stepped out into the hall, Kairu started to feel excited, it had been so long since she had last worn something, and she was beyond elated at the chance of getting something to wear again, the fact that it was only a shift didn't bother her, anything was better than being stark naked. As the line grew closer, she noticed how similar in size all the Biomax were, every single one of them had a similar body shape and size, in fact they could all pass for sisters, it was uncanny, at least they were not identical, that would just be surreal, thankfully she was also about their size. It meant that when her turn finally arrived, she was able to slip on her shift without trouble. Out in the hall, she noticed the girls were all lined up. Megumi greeted her, and said, Line up with your class. Once everyone is dressed, I'll show you to the mess hall. We can answer your questions after you have had breakfast. She nodded and joined the line. The prospect of food, and the promise of answers serving as powerful bait. Besides, she didn't see a point in trying to run now, not after what they had done to her. She had seen all the devices they were putting in her body, devices whose function she was clueless on. Kairu was very much leaning on taking a chance. If the AI was answering questions, she had quite a few she wanted answers to. It was not long before the AI led the way to the mess. It was a nice cozy room with several bench-style chairs and tables. Drones were placing identical plates of food at each seat. A bit different from what she was used to. As an officer she was used to having a pick of several options. As for the enlisted, well they only got what they were served, they didn't get way to drones. This felt like a strange cross between them. On entry, they were directed to take a seat. Ahead of her seats filled up, and she noticed that a drone stayed near each girl. Not that it was hard to guess why. She was getting the impression that these girls needed a helper. Not one of them managed to dress without help from that drone earlier. Before she could go to take a seat, Megumi had singled her out and led her to a smaller table away from the others. She wasn't sure how she felt about being singled out. Waiting for her was a warm meal. She settled into the seat, and Megumi seemed to settle into the opposite. Kairi looked over the plate. It seemed to be a simple dish. A warm soup, with a piece of soft bread, and sliced fruit. All easy to eat items. Megumi answered the unasked question. There are two reasons for the meal. None of these girls have eaten before. It's best to start them on something simple. Not to mention, biomics, as you might have guessed, lack even basic skills when they first emerge. They are quick learners though, and should be at your level in a couple of days. They are born with basic knowledge, but it does take the time to translate that knowledge into usable skills. I guess that explains the waiters. They need helpers until they can do it on their own. Out of curiosity, how long does that take them? Not long at all. They should meet all of my basic proficiency requirements for them in about two weeks. I did say they are quick learners, did I not? You did. 
She reached for the utensil. The shape was different, but it clearly resembled a tool she was familiar with. It was a spoon. A surprisingly common tool among tool using races. At least until you thought about things. Simple tools often ended up being similar among species with similar morphologies. The more different the morphology the more dissimilar the tools. It didn't hold true for all tools, but it was remarkably true of the simplest tools. By no means did they end up identical though. There were always small differences. Kairu took a moment to find a comfortable grip and then dipped the spoon into the soup. Taking a bite, she found the flavor to be rather pleasant, although rather unfamiliar. A welcome change to what she had been eating before. After a few bites, Megumi asked her. Go ahead and ask any of your more pressing questions. Between spoonfuls of soup, she asked. What exactly did you do to me? Megumi shifted slightly, and gave her a smile. In short, a full body upgrade. I gave you all the capabilities of a scout class biomic, naturally. The upgrades are currently restricted, but you still enjoy the physical improvements. Enhanced stamina, improved muscle strength, faster reactions, improved bone density, and strength. You should be able to run faster than most land vehicles, and you will also find your steps are significantly quieter than your already naturally quiet gait. You also no longer require any support. That added a few questions, like when were her bones enhanced? Same thing with her muscles, but she was curious about this mention of support. What do you mean by support? Your breasts. I had them enhanced. Previously they required minor support, but now that is no longer the case. They will retain their current healthy shape and appearance for the rest of your life, and you will never again need something like a bra. Chafing shouldn't be too much of a problem either. Your new skin is far tougher than your old skin. She glanced at the bread, and asked, tougher in what way? Your skin is now like a natural armor. It remains soft and supple but is highly resistant to burns, and lacerations. Underneath it is a nano weave of light armor providing further protection. A nano web in your skin also speeds up healing significantly. Meaning that in the unlikely event of you being cut open, the wound will heal almost instantly. Between the improved resiliency and rapid healing, you should never have to worry about chafing again. Swallowing a bite of bread, Kairu inquired, exactly how tough is my skin? You'll find yourself well protected from an array of weapons. Blades, arrows, bullets, lasers, particle beams, plasma blasts. You are protected against all of those to a varying degree. Your skin should bounce most blades, and primitive projectile weapons like bows and firearms. The enhanced thermal resistance of your skin and underlying armor will stop most low-yield energy weapons as well. Along with some middle-yield personnel directed energy weapons won't stop a grenade or a heavy object though. You are still quite vulnerable to concussion damage and being crushed. Also not something to rely on. She nodded. Yeah, I don't really want to be taking those in any case. Nice to know though. Then she remembered something. One thing I am curious about. I noticed that you removed my liver and kidneys. Megumi interjected, interrupting the question. Those organs are no longer required. Their functions have been taken over by a far more efficient set of implants. Many of your organs were either enhanced or replaced entirely. Take your lungs for example. In their base state they would not have been able to provide for your enhanced body. Not fully anyway. I force grew an enhanced set with optimized DNA and integrated biotechnology. Added the same with your heart. She couldn't help but interject at that point. A new worry surfacing. How much of me is still me? That depends on how you look at it. All replacement parts use your DNA as a base. So technically all of the new pieces are you. Although I did replace quite a bit. Kairu wasn't sure what to think and shifted lines of questioning. She swallowed a piece of fruit first, and then inquired, Those new implants what do they do? Well as already mentioned some of them replace the functions of your original organs. The other implants include a small subspace energy well, which provides power for your implants. Also included in there is a small computer interface directly into your brain. A series of sensory implants that will enhance your sight and hearing. That includes providing a few additional senses. In addition, you have a personal cloaking device and shield generator. Your right arm now conceals a light plasma cannon. One of your implants produces and manages an army of nanites that now flow through your bloodstream. These nanites maintain your body and implants. They also greatly accelerate your natural healing and allow for minor shape-shifting. One set you might find interesting are the implants we installed in your reproductive organs. 
They serve mainly as a form of advanced birth control, but they will also monitor the health of any growing fetus, automatically correcting any health issues as they occur. That did sound interesting. That does sound interesting. How effective are they at birth control? Also what health issues are they capable of detecting and correcting? Megumi giggled. Good questions. I'm sure you will be impressed. They're configurable. I'll teach you how later, but you won't get pregnant unless you want to be. As for health issues, the implants can detect all of the issues known to Solian science, and correct them. Children are highly valued in the Empire, and we take every measure to ensure they are born healthy. Added the same for you. I also corrected your sterility. She dropped her spoon and looked right at the hologram. What do you mean corrected my sterility? You had been sterilized previously. In fact, that seems to have been the case for all high-ranking officers I have examined. Can't tell you when it was done. Anyway, that reminds me. How do you feel about the Imperium? That was something she hadn't thought about. But now that she was, she found her feelings changed. There were so many little things she was noticing in her memories that she hadn't before. Strange gaps in her memory were also there. For example, she couldn't remember what happened in any of her regular checkups. Every single one of those was a mental blank that struck her as strange. And yet for some reason, she remembered thinking of it as normal. The inspections were also weird, and then the whole matter of people disappearing and never showing back up again. That part was the most worrisome, and yet before she had not even noticed the disappearing. She was simply told not to worry about the missing people, and she had never thought of them again. It was very evident to her now that some kind of brainwashing had been done to her. I'm not sure, it used to be fine, but in recent years things have been strange. The worst part is that I didn't even notice until today that things were strange. You would not have. They programmed you not to. Don't ask me who. I don't know yet. I need you to help me figure it out. I gave you these gifts for that reason. Perhaps together we can save your people, and end this war. You say that as if I have a choice. I promised you a choice earlier. I am giving it to you now. You can help me, or you can stay here and do nothing. It would be better for me if you help, but I won't fault you if you stay out of things. Kyrie leaned back to think, internally weighing the pros and cons. If she had a choice, she might as well think about it. This would be a life-changing decision, the most important choice she has had in years, and she wanted to make the right one. 125, Chapter 16 Kairu's Choice Kairu considered her options. She could stay here and do who knows what or she could accept the hologram's option and help her. Now that she could think clearly in a way she had not in years, it was now obvious to her that the Imperium had brainwashed her. Something had happened in the Imperium in recent years that had led to all sorts of odd things she was just noticing in retrospect now, both in her personal life, and around her. On the other hand, the hologram had recently taken her apart and put her back together. It was a rather surreal operation that she had not agreed to, one she wasn't sure she could trust. Now she knew she could not trust the Imperium, but she wasn't sure if she could trust Megumi either. The crazy computer just didn't seem trustworthy, but she needed to make a choice. Trust the computer and hope she was an ally, or not. Kyra knew she had to be wary, and she didn't even know if Megumi had brainwashed her while she was out either. With a wary eye, she tried examining her own thought processes. She knew from experience that it was hard to tell while brainwashed if you were. But the more she thought about it, the less she thought the ship had. She wasn't feeling any strange urges to obey the machine or trust it. In fact she was quite wary of the hologram before her. Kairu finally decided to take a risk. She would trust the computer, for now. Looking the hologram in the eye, I'm not sure if this is the right choice, but I want to know what is happening to my beloved Imperium. It changed in the last few years and I ended up brainwashed to not even notice. If you think you can save my Imperium, I will help you. My loyalties haven't changed though. They may not have, but I suspect that the Imperium you are loyal to disappeared years ago. When the puppet masters, whoever they are, took over. I don't know who they are yet, but we will find out together. First, you have lessons. Looks like breakfast is about over, which means you can join your classmates for your first class. We can continue this discussion later, replied Megumi. That stung a bit, but she was curious about these lessons. She hoped she could wrestle a few more answers out of the hologram later. She had more that she wanted to know, but hopefully, this class answered some of those questions. Kairu stepped into the room and took a moment to pull her dress down a bit. She was glad to have a shift now, but it was painfully obvious it was never designed for someone with a tail. Her tail kept shifting it up over her ass. Every time she moved the wrong way, 
Kairu had to constantly control her tail, and that annoyed her a little. It was still better than being naked in her opinion. Kairu looked around. She had half expected a classroom, but it turned out to be something that looked more like an exercise yard. The room was fairly large with obstacles, greenery, obvious weapon emplacements, and drones flying about. To her left was a small stage with a large screen behind a podium, and a number of wooden chairs set out in front. Megumi was already standing at the podium. Have a seat Kairu. We have a little to discuss first. Most of her classmates had already sat down, so she settled into one of the available chairs. When everyone was seated Megumi began. All right class, today we will be doing an obstacle course run to get you used to your physical abilities. Nothing complicated today. She turned to the screen and started describing the obstacle course they were going to run. At the end of the brief, she focused on Kairu. In case you were wondering princess, you will be joining your classmates for the run. But afterward we will be having some special lessons. Lessons you will need for later sessions. She nodded. Kairu was actually kind of curious. Megumi had told her that she was physically enhanced, and could run faster than most land vehicles. This training room certainly had the space for that. It was huge, the biggest she had seen on any ship. It almost seemed a waste of space to her. She swore the room was at least two kilometers long or more. She was amazed the designers had found the space for this. Even on a ship this big, how did they fit this and everything else the ship undoubtedly needed for its mission? Slipping out of her seat and moving towards the others, she responded, I did want to figure out my new abilities. Megumi watched Kairu start her run with a smile on her holographic avatar's face. She had configured her gate room for a series of training classes for her newborn biomics. Although Kairu would require special attention to graduate with the rest of her class, she didn't have any of the knowledge that her fellow classmates had been born with. On the other hand, she at least had a foundation of basic skills. No need for her to be taught how to handle a simple spoon. The next month was going to be interesting. She had over a dozen classes to teach and only one training room big enough for them to really stretch their legs. Perhaps she should look for a nice planet to use, it wouldn't be too hard to set up a world for use as a training site. If she placed a gate on it, she would not even need to stay in the system. A shield would keep unwanted guests away, and she could update the Guardian network to include this planet in the list of protected planets. The network would automatically construct and send a fresh hull to guard the planet. It should have a few spare cores waiting for a mission at all times. Thankfully that piece of Imperial infrastructure was still in operation in this galaxy, but there was little reason to mess with it. Most shield worlds just weren't worth the trouble. She filed the idea away, but it wasn't high on her priorities. Kairu on the other hand was going to require a lot of attention. Not just the personal one-on-one -on -one training, but psychological monitoring. The young Neku was clearly overwhelmed by recent events, but she knew the drug she gave before the operation was rather potent. It was highly effective, but the dissociation it caused was known to lead to some mental issues, issues that could be corrected if caught. Although she was pretty sure Kairu would be wary of her, and might not trust her to implement some of her therapies. Megumi made a note to set up some time for Kairu to socialize, preferably those not part of her former crew. Other prisoners would be okay, but not ideal. Any friend she could talk to would help, but she knew no Neku could really help her with what she went through. At the moment, she wasn't showing any problem signs, but the poor girl hadn't been given any time to really process. From her own database, Megumi knew that keeping her active and focused on other things would help her, at least for a while. In some cases, that was all that was required to avoid a breakdown. In others, one was never a danger in the first place. Megumi would need to monitor her to know which was the case with Kairu, though. Megumi shifted her attention back to the trainees, but not before checking in with her other instances and subroutines. She had a few projects to monitor after all. Fortunately, Everything was proceeding to plan. Well, not exactly. There were a few deviations, but they were within the expected range. Nothing that required attention. As she had planned for all expected deviations, Kairu stumbled a bit but kept her balance as she darted around a tree. She had been running for a little bit, and already fallen or tumbled a few times. It was kind of frustrating being tripped up by simple obstacles, but it helped that she wasn't the only one. Kairu was actually rather glad for the course. It was giving her a chance to relearn her body. In the same way, all the young girls around her were learning theirs. Up ahead was a fallen log blocking the path. She noticed the girl ahead try to jump the log, but she failed to produce sufficient lift. Her foot caught the log and knocked her off trajectory. 
Kairi jumped the log herself and managed to stick the landing. Coming to a stop, she turned round and offered a hand to the young girl. The young biomech gave her a cute smile and took her hand. Kairu helped her up, and briefly looked her over. Despite the rather flashy fall, the young girl looked completely fine, not a single scrape or bruise. Then again she had also taken a couple of falls that she was sure would have caused injury but had left her unmarked. Hell, a couple of those falls had been from heights she would have expected a broken bone from, and she was still fine. Megumi had not been lying about her being physically enhanced and more resilient. She almost felt like a Neku tank. With a cute stutter, the young biomech thanked her. Kairu was somewhat surprised since she had not heard them speak before. Her voice was quite cute, and she knew it would be popular. This girl would be popular in general back home. Her exotic blue hair, gem-like eyes, an unblemished creamy complexion, a heart-shaped face, an excellent figure with decent breasts, and a cute butt, exotic and cute. A part of her was jealous. But if she ever looked at herself in the mirror she wouldn't be. Kairu smiled back. You're welcome. Ah, do you have a name? The young blue-haired girl giggled cutely. Yes, we all do. I may. As I recall, you're Kairu. Am I right, sister? Kairu felt herself change color. I'm a not. The cute giggles quickly became full-blown laughter. We are all sisters. Anyway, we need to get moving. May quickly collected herself, and Kairu chased after to keep up. Trying not to think about the sister thing, she asked, you wouldn't happen to have an idea of the lesson plan would you? May managed to nod without disrupting her pace, and said, the first week is mainly physical training. We will be assigned tasks to work on our physical skills, everything after that is combat training. That should last about three weeks, and then we graduate, so I should get used to this obstacle run. May stumbled briefly but recovered without a crash. Nah. The ship will reconfigure this room several times over the course of our training. This simple course is only hard now but it will be blindfold easy for us this time next week. Not to mention the obstacle run isn't the only thing we will be doing over the next month. Do all my classmates know what to expect? May answered in the affirmative. Then elaborated. The general course of the training program were included in our pre-birth information package. Kairu didn't respond right away as she had to duck below an overhang. A duck that ended up turning into a roll. May managed to duck below it without ending up rolling, and this time it was Kairu's turn to be helped back up. Brushing a bit of dirt off her shift, she said. Great everyone else got an information package but me. Well to be fair, it is a direct download into your brain. Megumi did not think you would be comfortable with that. Was she wrong? It is still possible for you to receive that package. Kairu gulped. That wasn't all that appealing actually. She had experienced enough of people messing with her head. Ah, uh, no. I think I would prefer to learn things the old-fashioned way. May smiled. I see she wasn't. But don't get hung up on that minor disadvantage. We all needed help just to put this on. And to eat. You didn't. Her face fell. And I messed up with that overhang. While you were fine. Ah, uh, that. That's nothing. Kairu shook her head. Getting used to these classmates of hers might be interesting. As she and May resumed their run. She did note that May's stuttering had reduced dramatically in just the few minutes they were talking. In any case, she had a feeling this was going to be a very interesting month. 118, Chapter 17 Rescue Mission With a simple thought, the ISS constellation broke orbit at the same time that Kairu had started her lessons. Megumi felt that now that her repairs and reconfiguration was completed it was time to rescue the crew of the crippled Ludol vessel. She had hoped to have Melia interact with them. But the young lady had decided to undergo her psychic awakening procedure already. As such Milia was currently in a biopod, undergoing a process not expected to complete for another five days. When done, she would join the ever-growing list of students that Megumi had to teach. At least, she was an AI able to produce instances that could manage that. The Ludo Cruiser was her immediate focus though. The ship had taken a beating in its brief battle with Alira. Even young dragons were nasty opponents though. And while Lalira wasn't a pup, she was a full-grown adult looking for her own nest. Megumi was curious why these would-be dragon hunters had challenged a nesting dragon. It seemed foolish to her, especially with their current equipment. Those positron beam cannons were decent, but against a dragon, they needed something with more punch. Their shields were decent and could work. Really, they just needed better weapons. Moments after breaking orbit, the constellation came up alongside the wrecked cruiser. Her sensors confirmed the same number of life signs she had detected on her way into the system. 
They had not moved far from the compartment, and no distress call had been given yet either. Seeing they were fine, she did not deploy any drones immediately. Instead, she focused on several structural scans, accessing the ship's general condition, and the state of her systems. The Ludol vessel was heavily damaged and adrift, running only on auxiliary power with minimal life support. Alire's plasma breath had punched through the hull amidships, and violently decompressed most of the ship. Emergency systems had managed to isolate number of forward compartments. The ship's main reactor was only lightly damaged. It looked like the crew shut it down after a previous hit had damaged the containment shields. If she had to guess, they had shut it down just before the last hit, and not before receiving a fatal dose of radiation. Even though engineering had been isolated as well, she was reading only corpses in that compartment. Her engines were also largely intact. Having received fairly minimal damage during the exchange, other than a hit to her navigational array, and a second to the primary warp field regulator array damage that would prevent the vessel from making the jump to warp speed. However, that damage could be easily repaired. Megumi could patch the battle damage sufficiently to allow the Ludol ship to limp back to her own port. Megumi did note that communicating her intentions might run into a couple of hiccups. The ship's communications array was currently offline, hence the lack of a distress call. A boarding operation would be needed. There were a few options for making contact with the crew though. Personally, she was leaning towards asking Erisa to do that. The young Irali didn't have much else to do, and her Biomax was still in training. Otherwise, she would have sent a squad of Biomax in to do the delicate first contact work. Sending a drone was an option, but they could be intimidating. Not to mention their simpler brains were not programmed for diplomacy. Megumi didn't want to send any drones aboard without permission either. In the meantime, she went ahead and outfitted a few drones for repair work. They could conduct the simple work needed to restore the ship to minimal functionality. Megumi had recently constructed those repair drones. Her previous loadout had included a pair for starship recovery, but they had been destroyed during that fateful battle. They were simple drones, but versatile and effective. At least as long as you were not using them for repairing highly complex repair work that is. They just weren't designed for that, and they were very slow compared to a narrow anyway. Most of the time she didn't really need them, and that had played into why she had only carried two of them. The only reason she even needed them now is because none of her current crew had the skills to repair Ludil technology. It was too advanced for them to figure out. Although, she did not believe it would stay that way. Erisa stared out of the viewport, finding herself rather bored. Malia had gone off for some weird brain procedure. Honestly, Erisa didn't understand why she even agreed to that. Erisa didn't want a strange computer doing weird things to her head. But for some reason, Malia did agree to it. Malia was her best friend though. Even after her damn fool choice to sign her free will away to a computer of all things, Erisa knew she was just here being moody, but she didn't have many other friends to talk to. She needed something to do, anything to distract herself with. As if to answer that sentiment, a certain familiar hologram materialized, and said, If you aren't too busy, there is something I would like you to do for me. She gave the hologram a look. You aren't getting me on one of your tables if that is what you are after. Well, if you want an examination you could just ask. But no, that isn't what I am here for. She pointed out the viewport. I want you to board that cruiser over there. Her comes are down and someone will have to go over there to make contact with the surviving crew. I'm not helping you get them on your tables either, Ares replied. She had heard about a few scientists finding themselves being vivisected, awake. At least the ship used anesthetics, and none of them were suffering from nightmares after that. She didn't know why they were still mentally stable after that. If she knew what Kairu had gone through she might have had more to say. I don't plan on studying them. This is a humanitarian mission. I figured I would conduct some basic repairs to their ship before departing the system. Erisa thought about it. I guess I could help, but I don't trust you. I was planning to pay you for the help. I have a few toys that might be interesting for you. I'll do it. But don't think for a minute I trust you. Megumi gave her a wry grin. I don't expect you to. But I am not your enemy. Let's go over the details shall we? He stretched his limbs a bit, and slipped off the bunk. It had been a long night, and he hadn't slept well, like the rest of his crew. He was worried the dragon would come back and finish them off. It had been well over a day since that battle though, and so far nothing had happened. He sighed, and then moved to open the door. Before he touched the handle, or even closed half the distance between the bunk and the door he heard a loud clanking sound, followed by a familiar alert. A second after the sound, the computer announced, 
vessel docked at docking port 12, that was a surprise, and he rushed out of his quarters. Moments later he was at the auxiliary bridge, where the few surviving officers were gathered. Report. He barked on entry. A young woman answered, other than the ship at port 12, nothing unusual has happened, as for the ship, so far they have not attempted to board, I have already ordered a security team to docking port 12, that was what he would have done. After the encounter, his crew had been reduced to a mere 400 out of a thousand, but they could still fight off a few hostile boarders, that is if the intruders proved hostile, and they might, he was somewhat suspicious of the timing. The old captain wasn't surprised they snuck up on his crew though, the external sensors were down, his crew was working on restoring the ship's communications, but that was proving harder than first thought, the fact these aliens had only docked, was a good sign though, he figured they could afford to attempt friendly communications. Signaling his officer, he said, a sensible precaution, now, why don't we go say hello to our new guests? He may have phrased it as a question, but it was clear that it was not to his officer. She followed him out of the compartment, as they walked down the corridor towards the port, one of the few linked to a pressurized section of the ship, and more importantly one they could reach, his officer asked, excuse me, sir, what do you mean, guests, if they were hostile, they should have boarded already, the fact they have not, indicates they may want to talk. Tripping the docking alarm may also have been quite intentional on their part. If they had chosen port 8, for example, they could have come aboard undetected. Internal sensors are down for that port and the surrounding sections after all. Nor is anyone guarding the docking port. Since we did not expect company, that means they likely came to us as friends, and we need to see what they want. That doesn't mean they won't prove hostile later though. I'll keep that in mind, sir. He had no doubt the young officer would. The rest of the walk happened in silence, and no alarms went off. So far things seemed to be going all right. When they reached the docking port, he found his guards in position with no activity to report. That was good news. So far, the aliens were not yet coming aboard. He signaled one of the guards and ordered the young man to attempt to contact the alien vessel. With it docked, their local companions should be able to make a connection. Before long. He found himself introducing himself to a young early woman in his hallway. A woman who had introduced herself as Erisa. I'm Captain Armak Gregaria. I wish these were better circumstances, but we are dealt the hands we are dealt. Now may I ask why you are here? To offer some help with your repairs. Before you say no, the ship we are on is of Solian origin. Its repair systems have already diagnosed your damage, and developed a plan for patching your systems to allow you to move under your own power again. You will still need a yard though. That caught his interest. A Solian ship, you say? Not often that you see an operational one. Where did you find it? I am not at liberty to say. It wasn't when we found it though. Mulia, my friend, managed to repair its self-repair mechanisms, and the ship repaired itself. I could do without the AI though. As much as I hate to say it, the ship is unfortunately our best hope to end this war. That eccentric alien AI promised to help, and so far it seems to be keeping that promise. I don't trust it though. He was silent in thought for a moment. I'm afraid I am not all that familiar with Solian A.I.S. At least not beyond what little is known about them. That particular precursor race was rather enigmatic, to begin with. After dealing with her, I can believe it. I won't say no to a repair offer, but what is the catch? The timing is rather suspicious. She actually saw the tail end of your battle, but needed to complete her own repairs first. She also said something. I don't want to repeat. As for what she wants, that AI is investigating the nature of our current war with the Neku. She finds it to be suspicious and thinks there is a puppet master pulling the strings. She wants any information you can spare that is related to the Neku, no matter how small. That was interesting, it sounded like the precursor ship was interested in the Neku, they were a primitive felineode race, but they had advanced remarkably in recent years, he didn't know much about them otherwise, perhaps it was time to take a closer look at them, he nodded, we could use the help, I'll see what I can dig up for her. 113, Chapter 18 A Mission Gone Well Armak watched the precursor ship go to warp, he was glad to see it depart, the drones made him uncomfortable, as for Ariza. She was okay, but she certainly had a mouth. He had the impression she didn't like Megumi all that much, but the ship AI seemed stable enough to him. He did however check records on past encounters with Precursor A.I.S. And for her age she seemed quite stable. The girl did mention her vivisecting a members of the early science team, but he spoke to the victims. 
they actually agreed to it. Megumi had apparently approached them when they found a medical lab and offered to show them how it works. Two of them ended up volunteering for the experience, and apparently one of them had the early onset of cancer. Something the computer had promptly proceeded to cure for the elderly scientist. Erisa seemed to think they had been tricked into getting on those tables though. However, it wasn't for Armak to judge. He was just glad that headache wasn't his to deal with. An unstable Solian AI was not a prospect he wanted to deal with. Solian ships were extremely powerful. It took fleets just to take one down, and all recorded instances were cruisers. Ships half the size of the one that just left. However, Erisa could very well be wrong and just be biased against the ship, since apparently, her friend signed an iffy contract with the ship. He hoped to the gods that she was. An unstable Solian AI with that much firepower was a nightmare. Megumi felt that the brief detour had gone well. She had gotten the information she wanted and was poring over it now. Erisa tried to make it seem as if she was unstable but failed. She was quite stable and did not appreciate the implication. Still, the girl had done well enough but clearly needed to learn a few lessons. Now she just had to figure out how to get her into the classroom. In the meantime, she knew the perfect reward. At that moment, she noticed that the Ludel ship was leaving the system on a different course from her own. They would likely take the safest route they could to the nearest friendly port. With their battle damage, they were in need of a refit, but they should be able to make it. Megumi had every confidence in her repair work, materializing her hologram. She turned to Erisa. She gave her a look, constantly mouthing off, and trying to make me look bad. I probably shouldn't have trusted you with that job, but it went well in the end. She pointed to a drone entering the room, and holding an object, clearly you need this, maybe it will help with whatever is causing your irritable disposition, Erisa stared at the object with a look of distrust, what is it, it's a simple little tool used to directly stimulate the nerves, it can inflict intense pleasure or pain depending on the settings, I suggest you be careful with the settings, Erisa stared at the strange blue and silver rod, the drone had handed her, the ship had promised to pay her, but she had never really believed it, this wasn't the kind of thing she had expected to get from it, the ship had told her to be careful with it, but didn't even give her a manual, on the one end of the rod was a small disc with strange markings, above the disc was a small screen with a strange symbol on it, she turned the dial a few times, and watched as the symbol on the screen changed, the color darkening from a light pink to a crimson red, it stopped changing at that point. Erisa had the feeling that this device would be easy to figure out if she could read Solian. Then she noticed a small button to the left of the screen. She pressed it and the tip started to glow blue. Curious she touched the glowing tip. That was a mistake. She had no idea how to describe the experience. Like lightning intense pain shot up her arm. It was the worst pain she had ever felt. And thankfully she blacked out. Megumi watched Erisa make her mistake. The AI had not expected her to do that so quickly. Megumi had expected her distrust of anything she gave her to make her leave it alone for a while. Evidently, her curiosity was stronger than anticipated. She sent a drone to transport the girl to her quarters. Then she refocused her processing power elsewhere. Kairu had recently completed her first run through the obstacle course, and it was time for her special lessons. The young woman had quite a bit to learn about. Her HUD was going to be crucial. At the moment it was off, but Megumi was about to unlock that, that was going to be the start of her first special lesson, no single lesson was going to teach her everything she needed to know about her new systems, then there was the other set of lessons she needed, lessons she couldn't fully plan without a test, she needed to gauge Kairu's knowledge of spy work, and interrogation, there were two tools she would need to master, for the second item of interrogation and that set of tools were going to be pleasure and pain. Although pleasure also helped with the first part, the first was something she did not think Kyra knew much about. Kairu settled into a seat, as directed. Her classmates filed out of the training room, apparently going to the mess for a meal, and then a quick rest. Her food was being brought to her, and she was certainly hungry. Although she didn't feel too tired. Megumi settled her hologram in a nearby chair and began to speak. This first lesson should not take too long. I'm going to introduce you to your HUD. HUD? What is that? Also known as a heads-up display. It is a visual overlay, projected by your implants that only you can see. It is controlled by thought, and it tells you everything you will need to know. Suddenly her vision was overlaid. In the lower left corner, she spotted a small blank circle. The upper left had what looked like a realistic representation of herself with colored bars above that. Next to each bar was a set of numbers, and the top one had extra text splitting the bar in two. 
reading, shield status, off. She was actually a little surprised she understood the text since it was not written in Neku Common, but a language she didn't understand. In the upper right corner, she had a stylized weapon graphic with red text over it. The text was in the same language, and simply said, system restricted. Kairu made a note to ask about that text. Megumi started explaining before she could ask, I went ahead and activated your HUD for you. It responds to thought-based inputs, so you can will it away when you need to. Let's start with the colored bars in the upper left corner. Those are at a glance gauges designed to give you rough estimates of important data. The numbers beside them are more accurate. The first bar is normally blue, but it should be gray at the moment, and the numbers beside it should read 00 joules. Breaking the gray bar into you should be seeing some text telling you that your shields are currently off. She nodded. Yeah, I see that. How do I turn them on, though? Easy, with intent. Focus on your shields, and will them on. It shouldn't be too hard for you. Kairu focused for a moment, and focused on the shields. She felt something, and then the text vanished, and the bar emptied. A moment later a blue line filled up over the course of about 5 seconds. The numbers next to it read 20,000 20,000 terajoules. Not that she really understood the units, but she figured they were some measure of shield energy. A blue barrier also appeared around her representation. Congrats on raising your shield for the first time. I'm sure you noticed the amount of shield capacity displayed next to the bar has also changed. As well as the measuring units, which can be changed. I'll cover that later when you cover system settings. You can go ahead, and drop your shields. We won't need them for a while. Now immediately below your shield bar, is a red bar. This is your reserve energy capacity. Auxiliary systems like your personal cloak draw energy from your reserve capacitors. You can also use this energy to augment your shields or your defense cannon. The text beside it gives you more detailed info on how much you have, and how quickly your reserves recharge. Right now your reserves are full, and not charging. By design, your subspace energy well has ramped down its output since your capacitors are full. She nodded, that was something she understood. As a former ship captain, she had plenty of experience with managing reserve energy. That actually didn't need much explanation for her. I understand that. What is the blank circle in the bottom left for? That little gadget is commonly called a mini-map. It displays your local surroundings, and anything picked up by your sensors. But the function is currently disabled. Hence the lack of information. Sensors? I believe I mentioned those before. You now have a couple of spatial sensor nodes. But they have a limited range. I'm sure you will find them useful. Anyway, as for the last item, that is your weapon display. It can monitor any weapon linked to your systems. Currently, it is only monitoring your integrated plasma cannon. It tells you everything you might want to know at a glance such as the current setting and the amount of available weapon energy, meaning you will always know how many shots you can fire before the weapon needs to recharge, and don't worry about overheating. The weapon was designed with limiters to prevent that. Not that you can currently use it, since I have restricted access. I'll unlock it later. That surprised Kairu a bit, but then again, she had a feeling that the ship could disable her easily. With how Megumi clearly had access to her systems, she had little doubt the computer could remotely shut her down. Something that actually scared her a little, but there was nothing she could do about that. Removing the technology in her body wasn't exactly an option. She rather depended on it now. Something I have been wondering is about the text. I have never seen this language, but for some reason I understand it. Is that you're doing? Megumi gave her a look, as a waiter drone arrived with a small table, and a plate of food. Actually, it's the small computer linked to your brain doing the translating. I loaded both modern and ancient Solian into its memory banks. Along with linguistic data for both Neku, and early languages. You can change the language in the settings menu. I think we can cover that now. She was interested in this settings menu. Kairi looked over her food and noted it was another set of simple dishes. She reached over to take a bite and then signaled to go on. The menu can be opened easily enough with just a thought. Go ahead and do that. She took another bite and then focused on opening this settings menu. Her HUD vanished, and quite a bit of text filled her vision. As you can see you have quite the number of things that can be adjusted on this menu. For example, you could open the energy allocation tab, and adjust the default energy distribution. Although most of the time, you would likely want it on default. I won't go over it, since that one is fairly self-explanatory. The system tab displays your primary system settings. That tab is where you can adjust display elements, alter elements of your HUD to fit your own preferences. 
If you want to change the display language, simply go to the system tab, focus on display language, and set it to your preferred option. You can set that directly, or let the system tell you your language options. Then pick from those. Now I am sure, the tab you would most be interested in, is the Reproductive Systems tab. Go ahead, and look at that one. Right now the default settings are engaged, I doubt you will much need to change those, unless you are looking to have a child. She opened it, as she was curious, the tab had a few settings, and she found the birth control options easily enough, Kyrie looked through them, but quickly agreed she wasn't going to change them, although it was interesting to see that she could adjust the birth control to be gender specific, thereby ensuring that her child was of a specific gender, not that she was currently looking to get pregnant. Then she noticed an odd option, Biomax self-replication program settings? I gave you the option to reproduce in the same fashion as Biomax can. Biomax use available genes either their own or theirs and a partner's to produce a base template. This base template is then configured according to a class, Scout, Knight, Mage, and so on. Once a template and class has been decided, an embryo is created, it will take three months to gestate, and then you will have a child to care for, a young daughter that will take only five years to mature. You still have the traditional reproductive options though, with none of the accelerated growth of a biomic, nor will the child have your implants, unless you specify otherwise. That is also in the settings, that was interesting, but she wasn't sure she would wish this on a child. At least not now, she barely knew what she could do, but it was already obvious that she was stronger and more resilient than she had any right to be. She decided to change the subject though. This one was starting to get a little uncomfortable but it was nice to know she had the option. She didn't want to think about the fact that it was previously taken from her. One thing I am curious about is that cloak. 115, Chapter 19 The lessons continue. Kyrie groggily stirred as someone shook her slightly. It took her sleepy mind several moments to wake up, and she foggily took in the room. For a brief moment she was startled by the unfamiliar room, but then memories of the day before returned. This was her new room. It was a cozy enough bunk room that she shared with one of her classmates. The room was a bit bigger than her cell had been, and had a bunk bed on the one side of the room. On the other was a double wardrobe. There was also a desk placed against the rear wall, and a small table in the center of the room. It was a low table, with four cushions placed around it. A chest beneath it stored number of games. Near the main door was a silver basket for dirty laundry. On the wall with the wardrobe, was a side door. That door led to a small attached bathroom that was shared with a sister bunk room. That was perfectly fine with Kyrie though. A semi-private bath was already a luxury on most ships. A private bath was something only high-ranking officers might have. Kyrie was glad she didn't have to use a communal bath. As for the bathroom itself, it had a modest counter with two sinks, a single toilet, and to her surprise an actual bath. The bath was combined with the strange cleaning light she had encountered before. The sinks were rather similar to the one in her cell. She looked up at May, who smiled. Good morning, sister. Breakfast is in a few minutes, but you should have time to get ready. Kyra nodded, and slipped out from under the sheet. The cool air against her bare skin reminded her that she had slept nude. But so had May. May was already stepping towards the wardrobe. Kyrie watched the equally nude Biomac for a moment, and then made for the bathroom. She needed to pee, and she felt the need for a shower. Not that she could get one, the Solian equivalent was some kind of weird tingling light. At least it got the job done. Although part of her did want to try the tub out, it had been a long time since she had a good soak, but she did not have the time. As May was opening the wardrobe, Kyrie stepped into the bathroom, where she caught her own appearance in the mirror. She froze, last night when she first explored the room, she had been too tired to pay attention. Now however, for the first time since her procedure, she was really looking. Reflected in the mirror was a naked necky girl, one she could recognize, but she wasn't the same. Kairu had been cute before, but now she was on another level, the same level as her classmates, the same level as May, who insisted on calling her sister. Her face had been subtly altered a little here, and a bit there blemishes were gone, small bits of fat had been moved, all the changes were small, but combined the effect was quite noticeable, she was absolutely stunning, and suddenly she understood why May kept calling her sister, if you got rid of the ears, and the tail, Kairu realized she would look a lot like the others, it didn't help that they had similar figures, and heights, the pressure in her bladder was what prompted her to move, almost woodenly she made her way to the toilet while her mind worked to understand the changes, heavily she sat down to pee, and asked the air, 
How many other changes did you make to me, that I don't know about? A few, but they won't remain unknown to you for long. Kyrie leaned back, and was silent for a moment. The only sound to be heard was a stream of liquid splashing. She listened to it, as she considered her response. Finally she asked, Are you going to tell me, or will I end up finding them on my own? I plan to tell you as they become relevant. Although, I didn't expect you to react negatively to a few minor cosmetic changes, said Megumi as the stream ceased. Kairu stood up. You made me look like them. Megumi's giggles came from the air, in response. Is that what you think? The giggles changed into a full-blown laugh. Actually it is the other way around. I merely enhanced what you already had. Kairu frowned, as she took care of cleaning her crotch. What do you mean by that? Your fellow classmates, I based their appearance templates off of you. I also used you to model an Eku appearance for all of them. I could have your Romy, may demonstrate that if you like. Kairu just stared at the wall for a moment. She had no idea what to say. A part of her couldn't believe that she had not noticed their similarity to her. Then again, her mind had been rather occupied yesterday. Not to mention their similarity to each other was far more jarring to her. Before she could really work that out, May came in, saw her spacing out, and proceeded to help her into the combo tub. May said something, but it didn't register for her. Her mind was too occupied to really pay attention. It wasn't until May had helped her into her seat did the mess that she rebooted. Kairu slipped into the training room. Well gay true actually. Apparently there was something called a stargate, hidden somewhere in this room. A large arch device apparently capable of instant transit between any two of them. One of the reasons for this room being so large was so that it could be used as a staging area. Because of the size, the designers made the room multi-purpose, configurable for multiple roles, including training. Something that was quite brilliant. Actually, already, she could see her fellow classmates settling into chairs at the briefing area. She joined them, quickly finding a seat near May. Kairu sat down and tried not to really think about the fact that they all looked to be related to her. It was a bit surreal, too much lately had been surreal. At least some things felt normal, and having a room was certainly an improvement to the cell. She actually slept well last night, and she still wanted to try the bath. Thankfully Megumi started the pre-run briefing before too long, giving her something to focus on and distract herself with. After everything that has happened lately, it really helped having something to distract herself with. Megumi smiled, and pointed to a map behind her. All right girls, by now you should have started getting a handle on your abilities. Today's course is a level 2 obstacle course. You should find it a little more challenging than yesterday. Since you are still getting used to your abilities, there will be no armed drones on the field, and no traps, only obstacles. Unlike yesterday, there will be a time limit. You have two hours to complete the course. Also. The class that completes it the fastest will receive a reward. That sounded interesting. A bit of competition seemed popular as well. All her classmates seemed interested. It was certainly something better to focus on than what the Imperium had done to her, or what had more recently been done to her by the ship. Then again, much of what the ship had done to her seemed to actually be beneficial. She was stronger and faster. She didn't know about being smarter, but she felt like she had been given the body of a super soldier. The changes almost made her feel invulnerable. Almost. Especially after she learned how powerful her integrated personal shield was. Most starships didn't have shields that strong. The ones that did belong to elder races. She really had been turned into a Neku tank. Now that she thought about it, she was surrounded by young girls with unmatched power, able to topple nations. If this ship wanted to, it could conquer the entirety of the Imperium. For the Imperium's sake, she hoped that the ship would keep its word. Nothing else could keep this kind of power in check, now you may be wondering what that reward is, but I would like to make it a surprise for you girls. There was a murmur of disappointment, and Kairu understood that too. She remembered back when she was first being trained, that the instructors liked to set up competition between classes as well. Sometimes they would announce prizes for being the best class, and other times they would keep them a surprise. Those competitions had been fun, and unlike more recent memories she didn't have any odd gaps of that time just the normal blur of old memories. Nothing unusual was happening back then, the Imperium was still the Imperium then. None of that please. I need your full attention please, as I am only going to tell you this once, opened Megumi as she launched into a description of the course they were about to run. Kairi glanced briefly at May, and wondered how often they would end up helping each other off the ground this time.
Kairu wanted to see how well she could do today. In her hut she noticed a frozen timer had appeared centered at the top of her vision. She figured that must be how long they had to complete this level 2 course. Compared to yesterday's level 1, a part of her wondered how the difficulty of these courses was being graded. Yesterday's course did not feel like a level 1 to her. Sure it hadn't been too hard, but she had an enhanced body, albeit one she was still getting used to. Another part of her wanted a bigger room to run in, as big as this one was. It felt too small to really get going. That might have been why Megumi required them to make a number of laps around the course. A course that would apparently change with each lap, and it wasn't a small number of laps either. Back when she was a cadet she would have balked at the number of laps she was expected to take. Hell, she would have balked at half the number on a smaller course. Kairu however found the number felt reasonable for her enhanced physiology. She just wondered if they would really be able to complete 50 laps in the time allotted. However there was no doubt in her mind that this would have been impossible for her just three days ago. Now, however, she really wanted to see if she could do it. Eagerly she lined up with the others as soon as they had been briefed. When the signal came she took off running with the rest of the class. All she wanted to see was how far she could go. What she could really do. If there was one good thing about these classes, they were letting her get a feel for her abilities. A part of her could not wait to try out her fancy gear though. The cloak was intriguing. And she wanted to see what that plasma cannon that was mounted in her right arm could do as well. The ship had told her precious little about the weapon, and her systems wouldn't either. She had already tried, multiple times to find something about what the weapon could do. But the system was locked down, it wasn't the only thing she couldn't touch though. Kairi put all of that out of her mind, focusing instead on the course in front of her. Her feet carried her over the rough terrain created for the start of the course. Her eyes picked out the obstacles ahead of her, nothing too hard yet. 105. Interlude Dragon Problem The captain stepped onto her bridge, feeling a little tired. Honestly she just wanted to be in her bunk, but she pushed those feelings aside. Duty demanded she be here, even if it was the middle of ship's night. Composing herself, she barked, report, her mind already focusing on the mention of a contact that her night duty officer had mentioned when he called her to the bridge. We detected an unusual energy signature about eight minutes ago. Sensors picked up this image just before I called you, reported the night duty officer, as he pulled up an image on their main screen. She could identify the image with ease. Anyone could. It was a dragon, the deadliest known space organism in the galaxy. There were other biological organisms capable of space flight, but none could match the apex predator known as dragons. There were dozens of identified dragon species, but they all had a few traits in common. Powerful natural shields, the defied analysis, a potent breath weapon, an armored body, and claws that could carve through even the toughest ship armor. They were opponents to be wary of, especially since they were also highly intelligent, not to mention that the older a dragon was, the more dangerous it was. A dragon she exclaimed without meaning to. She had not expected to see one here. Its very presence was a serious threat to future operations in this sector. Most importantly, this system was the staging area for an assault that would decide the war. They had over 17 fleets gathered here already for the main assault on Iral, an attack that had recently been delayed for reasons she did not know. Now that very invasion was in clear jeopardy. Has the flag been informed? Yes, ma'am. As per protocol, we notified the flag as soon as the threat was identified. She leaned over the sensor console, and asked, How old is this dragon? We aren't sure, but we think it is a nursery dragon. If it is, then based on size, scale density, and internal temperature then this is a female dragon of nesting age. She felt herself pale. Female dragons were the worst opponents, especially those of nesting age. Highly aggressive, and old enough to be a significant threat. Worse females were stronger than male dragons of equivalent age. If it was here, it must be looking for a nest. That wasn't good. Not that she was entirely surprised that this system had attracted a nesting dragon. It had three life-bearing planets, and dragons tended to raise their young on terrestrial planets. The worst part was that there was no negotiating with dragons while they were intelligent. Every attempt to communicate with them had failed. Although rumor had it that some of the elder races had managed rudimentary communication, running was not an option either, since maintaining control of this system was a vital strategic import, meaning that their only recourse was battle. She just hoped they had enough ships, not to mention that the weapons they carried would be enough. Dragon scales were notorious for their resilience and ability to resist most known weapons, and their bio-shielding was far stronger than most known energy shields. 
The Neku captain was not looking forward to this battle, personally, she would have made the call to retreat immediately. Three hours later, the ship shuddered over the din of the chaos, someone shouted, hull breach decks 14 through 40, emergency force fields not responding. Before she could shout her order, a bolt of lightning flared off the dragon's wing and struck her ship. The vessel shuddered, and the lights flickered and went out for a moment. Then the emergency lights flipped on. Seconds after a sudden shockwave rocked the ship, the battle was not going well. The flag had already been sunk, and the new leader of the fleet had ordered a retreat. Now everything was disorganized chaos, as ships were breaking formation and trying to make the jump to hyperspace. Another voice reported, main power is out, auxiliaries have been fried. We are on emergency batteries. That was a bad hit and reports kept pouring in. Shield repairs had been delayed indefinitely, decks 14 through 40 had to be manually sealed, the main drives had sustained irreparable damage, they were permanently dead in the water, the main reactors had been auto-jettisoned when the primary containment systems were fried. Auxiliary reactor 7 looked repairable, but the entire deck it was on had been vented to space. All but one of their emergency batteries had been melted, they had three hours of emergency power left and that was it. At least the dragon was attacking other ships, she glanced at her barely functioning sensor screens. The captain spotted several ships successfully make the jump to hyperspace, but others were not so lucky. One vessel, a dreadnought, had the unfortunate luck of being caught in the dragon's breath. A stream of blue plasma washed over its shielded hull. When the light cleared the only thing that remained was an expanding cloud of melted debris, a stark display of the dragon's power and a visual indication of how lucky they had been not to be hit by the dragon's breath. Turning from the screen, she quietly gave the order, the one order no captain ever wanted to give. Abandon ship. Then louder she repeated, abandon ship, all hands, abandon ship. With any luck, the dragon would ignore their escape pods, just like it was ignoring them. But then again they no longer qualified as a threat by any stretch of the imagination. Unfortunately, the pods were short-range and limited to sublight only. Still, they would be safer on the surface of one of the three habitable planets than up here in the void. 103, Chapter 20 adds Inquisitor. Alert. Solian battleship detected on approach vector. The young man sighed and looked up from his work. It had been a few days since they had found this vessel. He had managed to access the ship's computer mainframe, and configure the sensors to alert them about approaching vessels. While he was at it, he changed the language settings and encoded some new lingual code, namely teaching the computer basic. It didn't know any modern languages before. That alert however really took his notice. It wasn't the first alert about an approaching ship. However, this was the first alert in which the computer had given any real identifying information. Much less told him what race built the ship it was alerting him about. Computer basis of identification? He inquired. The vessel was identified with the following identifiers of mass, hull configuration, energy signature, and hull composition. The ship has a 99.8% correlation with Solian design. The ship is powered by a combination of Omega Energy and Subspace Energy Wells. Technology exclusively employed by the Solian Empire. Mass and hull configuration are consistent with Solian battleship designs. Based on these factors, there is a high probability that the ship in question is a Solian battleship. The young man did not think that news was good. A vessel that this ship recognized was undoubtedly of precursor origin. The precursors possessed unrivaled technology and abilities. Their own technology was ahead of the curve for much of the galaxy, but they had not yet achieved the same heights as the precursors. It was what made this old ship so valuable. Whoever uncovered its secrets would have unparalleled power in the galaxy. It would change the balance of power among the old races. As he dropped his work, and headed over to a com console to contact the task force, he asked the computer, what exactly is Omega Energy? He already knew that this ship ran off of zero point energy, and that was potent stuff. Able to rival stars in energy output, and remarkably efficient. They had sent a couple power modules back home for study as those modules alone were game changers. The computer responded in its typical flat voice. Omega energy is a form of high energy power generation that extracts vast amounts of energy from the omega molecule. A highly unstable high mass molecule that exists partially in hyperspace. Most cultures look into omega at some point in their development due to its vast potential for energy generation. A single molecule of it can rival a small star in terms of energy output. Unfortunately the omega molecule is highly unstable, 
and prone to detonating almost as soon as it has been synthesized. Omega detonations propagate through hyperspace, and cause irreparable damage to hyperspace. Detonations may also tear open rifts into normal space, rendering FDL travel impossible in regions extending several light years after a detonation occurred. The Altian Directorate banned all research into the Omega phenomenon due to this property. That was concerning, if the stuff is that dangerous, why do the Solians use it? Unlike most races, the Solians never signed any treaties forbidding research into Omega energy. They also discovered Omega far later in their development than most cultures do, allowing them to conduct their research unhindered in the void between galaxies, an option the Altian Directorate did not have when it conducted its initial studies. He was about to ask another question of the computer, when the computer stated, New information, vessel identified, ISS Constellation, Sovereign Class, Solian Imperial Fleet Registry, SFR 45,567,595 e commissioned in the year 3,421,459 SD on the Solian calendar, last seen on stardate 411,230 on the Altian standard calendar, or 3,422,857 on the Solian calendar. A.I. Core Megumi, last known captain, Toku of Clan Shiro. Would you like to review her combat record? 1,398 years available for review. Public record only. How old would that ship be now? He wondered, apparently out loud, as the computer informed him. Based on current date, and commission year of the ISS constellation the ship is 1,424,529 years old. That age was shocking. It was already weird that the ship had a combat record nearly 1,400 years long available for review but apparently it was a drop in the bucket. Likely useless as well. Meanwhile, Megumi was fully aware that she was on final approach to the Ad's Inquisitor. Her mind was mostly elsewhere however, as she looked over the image of her new biomech avatar in the mirror. She could not wait to show herself to Malia when she woke up. As for Kairu, she was doing well in her training, and it might prove useful for some of it. Her mind could not help but drift back to when she first received an avatar. Back then she had not yet been installed in the constellation, although it had not been long after that when she was installed in the constellation, it had been a very memorable, and precious day for her. Stardate 243421459 SDE, Solian Central Shipyards, Gravitara Galaxy, Last Light Star System, Megumi stretched her body as her avatar stepped out of the pod. From the walls a series of special photon emitters generated a wave of light that ran over her bare skin and removed the traces of fluid clinging to her skin. She waved a hand and a mirror was holographically projected allowing her to inspect her new biomech avatar. She had spent months designing the thing to her satisfaction and she wanted to see if the pod had grown it. To her specifications, it seemed the pod had managed to replicate her desired appearance. She looked a lot like a Solian in their true form, with one major exception. Instead of talons she had human feet, her wings were tightly folded on her back and covered in light scale feathers, patterned in gold and silver, scales also lightly coated other parts of her body. Scales ran up her legs in a spiral pattern, and a number of thinner scales coated her stomach and under boobs. Creamy white skin was exposed on her shoulders and the top of her boobs. Her pink nipples could also be seen. Scales also coated both of her arms in a similar spiral pattern to those on her legs. She had a few gold and silver scales on her cheeks as well. Overall she stood at 130 centimeters tall, which was a little on the short side for a Solian female. She had lovely silver hair that fell to her waist, and framed her round face. She had large gold eyes that just seemed to take everything in a small mouth and nose. Overall she looked cute, especially with her small boobs and butt. Spreading her folded wings, she began to access her internals. Finding that the systems were exactly the way she had specified. Hidden in her right arm was an internally mounted light dual modal plasma cannon. Her wings were also fully functional, and she had an internal shield generator. Under her scales was a nanoweb of armor that could stop most small arms, both ballistic and energy based. Most important though was her internal micro drive making her capable of limited starflight. Overall her capabilities were top notch, especially when compared to standard biomics. Feeling satisfied with her appearance, and feeling her avatar to be functional she folded her wings. Crossing the room she opened a box and pulled out the outfit waiting for her. Which was a simple white top, and a grey skirt. There wasn't any underwear with it, but she didn't expect there to be any. 
The Solians were both shapeshifters, and telepathic so it came as no surprise that as a race that they were lacking in modesty and as a consequence their clothing tended to be revealing. She only understood the concept, because she had been taught about it when her caretaker taught her about diplomacy. She dressed in the outfit and walked out of the door. At the same time, she felt her connection to her primary core vanish. She wasn't surprised. Today was the day that her core would finally be installed in a ship. It had been ten years since her core first came online. Which meant that it could be argued that today was her tenth birthday. Which for an AI marked the end of their equivalent to a childhood. Walking out the door she ran into her caretaker. A young woman of seven thousand years. Which for a Solian was still quite young. Few races were as long lived as the Solians and the only race she knew with a comparable lifespan were the Star Dragons. Which was one of the reasons why it was often said the two races were cousins. She didn't know if that was true. But she wanted to find out. Her caretaker was of average height, with a modest bust and a well-filled figure. She currently looked to be Terran, her racial characteristics having been shape-shifted away. Something that was quite normal while aboard the ship or station, since they didn't want to damage the floors with their talons. That is also why her avatar didn't have talons, since she didn't want to damage the floors either. Sure the scratches were easy enough to fix, but it was considered common courtesy not to damage someone else's floors. Good to see you are up. How are you feeling? said her caretaker. I feel fine, but it is a little disconcerting not being able to feel my primary core. Good to see you too, Talia said Megumi. Well, you will just have to put up with it for a couple of hours, said Talia. So are you going to tell me, what kind of ship I'm being installed on? Asked Megumi. I forgot to tell you? Asked Talia. You did, but you did seem stressed last time we spoke, replied Megumi. Sorry about that, you're being installed aboard the ISS Constellation. A sovereign class battleship, measuring 12,340 meters in length with 740 decks. The armor is 2,120 meters thick in a Type 4 Overlord configuration. With integrated energy plate generators for added protection when needed, the hull and plating is composed of Xo's alloy. For shielding, the constellation is outfitted with Type 9 multi layered Excalibur class energy shields. As for armament, in standard configuration, your primary battery is composed of eight hyperdensity plasma cannons, the data on those will be loaded to your core during the installation so don't worry, but for now I will tell you they are designed for use against capital ships and super capital ships, so they don't work well against small targets. Your secondary battery consists of 7500 super heavy phased plasma beam banks. 35,000 standard mount phased plasma beam banks and 2,250 subatomic disruptor banks. You have a tertiary battery consisting of 100,000 banks of Hellfire plasma cannons. Additional armaments consist of 18,000 integrated torpedo launches, one spinal mounted ASC, and 20,000 drones. As for propulsion, you will have both a Type 4 warp drive and a Type 1 hyperwarp drive for FDL. Sublight propulsion is primarily achieved by eight heavy-duty StarTech Industries plasma pulse wave engines. You will have 800 additional sub-engines for maneuvering, said Talia. Sounds like a good ship, but I was kind of hoping for something bigger, like an Excalibur-class super dreadnought, said Megumi with a bit of a pout. Talia chuckled, and replied, I know, but there aren't any dreadnoughts available, much less super dreadnoughts. You're quite lucky to have gotten a battleship. We are in the middle of a shipyard complex the size of a solar system, that builds hundreds of millions of ships every month. And you're telling me that not a single dreadnought was available? None are scheduled to be completed this month. I had to pull a few favors to get the constellation moved up in the queue just to get you a battleship. Sorry I couldn't get you that dreadnought you wanted, replied Talia. I'm glad you tried though. I think I can live with a battleship, responded Megumi. Talia then asked her to follow her. She followed her down the corridor and passed a number of viewports. Outside the viewports, an endless field of berths and ships under construction could be seen. The berths were lined up in orderly rows with enough space between them to provide ample room for ships to maneuver. Tugs and worker bees were flying around the field doing various tasks. Some of the ships had beams of light running over them. As the light ran over the hulls, the metal seemed to grow at a rapid rate, forming into the desired shape. Megumi wanted to sit there and watch, but she had to keep up with Talia. After a number of rapid turns, and a couple of lifts the pair came to a shuttle b in the bay, were a number of shuttles standing by for passengers. Talia led her to a shuttle on the left, and they boarded the shuttle. She had barely settled into her seat when the shuttle took off. Exiting the bay, and entering the void, 
Megumi looked out the window of the passenger shuttle and began to imagine what it would feel like to actually swim in the void. She had experience with simulations, but as she was finding with her avatar, simulations were nothing like the real thing. The data she was receiving from her avatar's nerves was far more vibrant than any simulation. She was enjoying every little sensation as they were all new to her, from the subtle sensation of her clothes rubbing against her skin, and scales, to the more noticeable sensation of the chair hugging against her small frame. She was brought out of her thoughts, by the chuckling of her caretaker. What's with the laughing? Asked Megumi. You look like an adult, but act just like a little kid. It's adorable said Talia. Megumi knew she was referring to the presence of wings and scales, which for Solians were a marker of adulthood. Around their 500th year they manifest their secondary racial characteristics which include their talons, scales, and wings. I'm not a child, I'm 10 years old, and I'm getting a ship, said Megumi with a cute pout. Sorry to tell you, but in most cultures, 10 years old is still a child, said Talia as she ruffled her hair. Megumi turned away. Don't pout, you will grow up in time. Besides, being a kid isn't a bad thing. You should enjoy your childhood while you still have it, said Talia as a ship came into view. On its hull in big pure white and bold letters was emblazoned the name ISS Constellation and under it was SFR 45567595EE, which he knew to be the ship's registry number. The triple E after the number indicated it was not the first ship of the name, but just the latest ship to take the name Constellation. The hull of the ship was a sleek black, its shape was mostly that of an elongated saucer, with numerous small towers rising from the hull. Many of the rising towers were topped with turrets and launches. At the rear of the hull which flared out, six thick swept back wings extended from the craft. At the ends of each swept back wing was a massive nacelle where the ship's FTL engines would be mounted along with most of the maneuvering engines. There were two pairs of nasals running above and below the centerline of the hull, with the final pair being mounted parallel to the centerline of the hull. Indents were spaced at regular intervals on the sides of the saucer where the doors to the ship's many shuttle and drone bays were located. Overall she thought the ship looked beautiful, and she knew this ship would be her body, likely for the rest of her life. She couldn't feel it yet, but she knew that right now her main core was being installed into the ship's central mainframe, which would be buried somewhere in the center of the ship, protected by an outer casing of reinforced plating, secondary shield generators, and internal force fields. The core would also be protected by security drones and internal turrets. In fact, a ship's AI core was the single most protected system in the entire ship. The shuttle docked in one of the massive side bays. A powerful barrier kept the atmosphere in the ship, and allowed shuttles to launch and land freely. Carrying workers and materials in and out of the ship, the bay itself was beautiful to her eyes. Sleek lines, and every surface plated in sturdy plating. Shuttles hanging in mounts from the ceiling and a constant flow of traffic. Come on, I'm going to show you around and introduce you to the captain. You will be with him a long time so I hope you two like each other, said Talia as she led her into the ship. Present day, ISS Constellation. Looking back, she realized Talia was right. She was still a child then, and she had much to learn. Her first captain had taught her a great deal, and she found herself wondering what he was doing now. She had kind of lost track of him after he had been promoted to Rear Admiral. She had tried to keep in touch. But with the war that had proven difficult, chances were he was probably a lord protector by now, and a highly revered elder. If she ever found her creators, she hoped she could find him again. She didn't have much time to reminisce, however, before she arrived at her destination. Megumi immediately refocused her attention and scanned the ships in her surroundings. Dead ahead was the Ad's Inquisitor who had seen better days, and twelve starships of unknown design. Technologically equivalent to the Ludel ship she had repaired a couple of days ago. That meant it was likely an older race that had located the Inquisitor. Not entirely surprising, an older race was more likely to have the technology to locate the Inquisitor in this soup. She took a moment to study the sleek predatory alien vessels. They were outfitted with reasonably powerful shields, neutronium hull plating, and powerful SIF generators. Armament was a mix of antiproton and plasma-based weapons. What she took the most note of was that all 12 ships featured fairly advanced cloaking devices. These ships were ideally suited to evade notice and strike unseen. Some of the design was reminiscent of Solian design during the late nomadic era before the Empire had been founded. They were solid ships but were actually inferior to Solian vessels of that time period. It had little to do with their design though, 
and everything to do with the limits of their current power systems. They used a fairly ingenious antimatter reactor design to supply power to their various systems. A design that actually used a hyperspatial reaction chamber to maximize reactants, thereby allowing a substantial increase in available power at the cost of making them rather fuel-hungry. These alien vessels relied on a series of fusion generators for day-to-day -day power needs. Overall she did not see them as much of a threat. Not to her anyway, and not with such low numbers. If there were more of them, they could constitute a threat. Especially with the Inquisitor supporting them. Speaking of the Inquisitor, she was in fairly decent shape. Her main drives were offline, but she still had her maneuvering thrusters. She had partial main power, and partial auxiliary power, as roughly half her power modules were either missing or offline. A couple of the active modules were intermittent though. The ship had sustained quite a bit of damage in her last battle, however it seemed she still had an ample supply of drones, and a number of her main weapon batteries were online. At the moment, the Inquisitor was no threat, but only because she was outside of weapons range, and the other ship lacked the ability to close. Megumi had complete control of the situation. All the cards were in her hand. With a thought, she opened the communications channel. A part of her was curious about who had found the Inquisitor first. Megumi could not allow them to keep it, but she figured she would try diplomacy first, not a normal imperial tactic, but with such a clear advantage it was a risk she felt she could afford. 113, Chapter 21 Counter-Contamination Protocols The older captain stared at the complication that had appeared. This was supposed to be an ICZ mission, one that was worth quite a bit of political prestige, but easy nonetheless. It had seemed like a good final mission to him. The elderly captain had been quite looking forward to his retirement. Of course, none would have predicted a precursor warship appearing during a recovery operation. Even if the target of that mission happened to be a precursor warship, of course if one did show up, he would have expected an Altian vessel, not a Solian vessel, as the ship had apparently identified this newcomer. He glanced at the young man that had interrogated the computer. Anything else you think I should know before that ship arrives? The man nodded. There is quite a bit I think you should know. He glanced over at a nearby screen. Unfortunately we don't have time to go over it all. The highlights are that the constellation is more than a match for any vessel here. Even the Inquisitor. He scoffed, stating the obvious now boy. Of course, the Inquisitor is no match for her. She is a crippled dreadnought, while the constellation is fully operational. After a pause, he asked. Does the ship have any significant tactical vulnerabilities we can exploit? According to the Inquisitor's computer, no. I did take a few notes, but they may be of limited help. Solian vessels are apparently capable of completely reconfiguring their module layout in the field. Although a fair amount remains the same regardless of configuration. I'm not sure what you would find noteworthy, though. Just hand me your notes. He responded, I'll look through them. The young man handed him the notes, and he skimmed through it. He noted that the firing arcs for its weapons were well balanced, and the mounts were well positioned. The constellation could focus the majority of its firepower in almost any direction except directly aft. Its aft quadrant was weak, but that wasn't unusual. Many ships possessed significant vulnerabilities in the aft quadrant. Unfortunately the only weakness there was the constellation's limited firepower. The ship had great armor as well, with no significant vulnerabilities. Very thick too, and that thickness was pretty uniform across the entire hull, except at critical zones, where it had been reinforced with extra plating, secondary shields, hardened bulkheads, and additional SIF generators. He did note that the main bridge was not very deep in the hull, it was located dorsal center on the elongated saucer, on deck 4. The weird part was this blank spot near the very center of the ship. Other than it being the most heavily protected part of the ship, nothing was there. It was even perfectly sized for the main bridge. Why put the bridge on deck 4, when you have a perfectly good spot located in the center where it would be better protected? He pointed that out and asked about it. I noticed that weird blank spot as well. The computer wouldn't tell me. Whatever is there, is apparently classified. That was interesting, especially since the information had been pulled from the computers of an Altian ship, and not a Solian one. He didn't have time to think on that though. What he needed to consider was how to survive a battle if one broke out. Personally, he just hoped they didn't have to fight. Not with the ships he had. He had 13 ships counting the Inquisitor. His flagship was a Hulk 7 class heavy cruiser. A respectable ship class to be sure, but no match for a precursor battleship. 
Neither were the other ships in his task force, which amounted to a half dozen light cruisers, four destroyers, and a science cruiser. They weren't even outfitted for engaging heavy capital ships like the Constellation, as they had not been expecting any real conflict. This was never a combat mission, but a scientific mission. He didn't have long to plan for hostilities before the precursor battleship came out of warp several million kilometers from their position. Well outside of weapons range, at a distance far greater than he would have expected. But then he glanced at the notes, they were well outside of the range of his weapons. But they were just outside of the weapons range of the Inquisitor. Both ships could exchange drone fire though. He remembered seeing mention of the constellation occasionally being outfitted with the same type of drone weapons as the Inquisitor. His sensor officer reported, the constellation is holding position, sir. We are receiving a very low energy signature from the ship. She has not charged weapons or raised shields, yet. Good. That indicates she isn't about to blow us up. I want you to concentrate every scanner on her. The moment that ship so much as twitches, I want to know about it. I, sir. His sensor officer had barely acknowledged the order. When his operations officer announced, the constellation is signaling on frequency 17, sir. Open frequency, on the main screen, he answered. A moment later a dimly lit alien bridge appeared. Settled into the command chair was a winged alien female covered in scales, and lightly dressed. Yet, she somehow managed to give off a professional air. I am Megumi, primary AI of the Solian Imperial battleship, Constellation, and you are? Fleet Captain Urk, Captain of the Voroni heavy cruiser, Zari. I can't say I've often had the honor of speaking to the ship before the captain. My captain is currently unavailable. You will be dealing with me instead. It was rather weird, but not the first computer he had spoken to. This one seemed more natural, less robotic than any he had spoken to before though. His mind was working on other things, more pressing concerns. He didn't think it was a coincidence that the constellation had appeared mere days after they had discovered a remarkably intact, if crippled precursor warship. I'm guessing this is about the precursor warship off my bow. You would be correct. If you were sent to recover it. I am afraid we were here first. We have salvage right? He replied. She nodded. Yes, you do. However, your civilization is still fairly young. Your people are not ready for the secrets that the Altian vessel might unlock. In time maybe. But for now, I cannot allow you to keep that wreck. That complicated things. That complicated things immensely. Now he was faced with a choice, and not a very good one. Either he let her take the wreck, or he fought her and she took the wreck anyway. Neither option was appealing, but maybe he could convince her to back down. And what right do you have to decide that? Many cultures develop in part by studying the artifacts left behind by others. Besides my superior firepower, the wisdom, experience and knowledge of my people. Not to mention history, history that frequently records that races that gain knowledge before they are ready almost invariably use it foolishly, often to the detriment of all around them. I believe you are familiar with the great war fought in this galaxy long before you reached the stars. Yes? He nodded, I am. Artifacts from the great precursor war can be found scattered throughout the galaxy, not to mention all the decaying ruins and shattered worlds. She shifted in her seat. What do you know about it? Do you know the factions of that war? Which races were allied with each other, and who their enemies were? Not particularly. Intact records are rather hard to come by. Although we do know that you were allied with the Altines. That is only true after the war began. Before the war began the Empire was actually at war or in a state of conflict with a number of her allies. That includes the Altines. Our alliance with the Altines was monumental and historic. However that is not what is important. What is important is the cause of that alliance. Our opponent, the Darakation infestation. They were created by a race very much like your own in terms of development. But with technology, they did not develop. Rather it was technology they stole and were not ready for. Highly advanced biotech to be specific. The fools created a weapon, a parasite they could not control. One that was able to reproduce at a prodigious rate, was naturally transcendent, and highly adaptive. It took over their entire race, and then it began to spread. It consumed first one galaxy, then the next and the next. This parasite threatened all, and naturally, the races banded together in historic alliances to combat the menace. Although not all joined the same alliance. While others didn't join any alliance, such as the Iridex. In other words, a single race gaining knowledge they were not ready for was the beginning of crisis. While I doubt you would be foolish enough to do what they did. Few civilizations make mistakes of that magnitude. But I still can't allow you the Altian secrets. There is much harm you could do both to yourselves, and others. If that knowledge was used foolishly, 
We have plenty of experience working with dangerous technology, and substances. Just take antimatter reactors for example. They are potent, highly efficient sources of energy, but they are also dangerous. A miscalibrated containment field for example could lead to containment failure. The resulting detonation could not only claim the ship but any vessel too close. Such a detonation in orbit could do far worse than simply scramble electronics like a nuclear detonation. If there was enough antimatter it could ignite an atmosphere. She gave him a look. Altian power modules are far more dangerous than antimatter, but they are not the Altian technology I am worried about you misusing. The Altians have far more dangerous devices on the Inquisitor than that. Now are you going to depart, and allow me to deal with the Inquisitor or are we going to have to do this the hard way? At that moment, his sensor officer reported. I am reading minor energy fluctuations from the constellation. I'm not sure since the readings are surprisingly faint, but I think she is charging weapons. The officer paused glanced at his screen, and calmly reported. The constellation just raised shields. Sir, he understood. The ship was telling him she was willing to fight for the ship. Something he was not prepared to do. The elderly captain knew full well when to cut his losses, but since they were still talking he could try something to appease his superiors. No, we aren't going to have to do this the hard way. I will need time to get our personnel off the Inquisitor and anything you might allow us to take with us. Speaking of taking, is there anything you would allow us to take? She leaned back. I will allow you to take what you can. I am sending drones over to monitor your evacuation. They will prevent you from taking anything you should not have. I expect you to be gone within the hour though. More than enough time to evacuate your people and collect a few artifacts. Choose wisely, his sensor officer dutifully reported. Multiple launches from the constellation. She is launching shuttles and drones. It seemed she was keeping her word. He would do his best to keep a battle from starting. Hopefully, everyone cooperated. He turned to the screen and ended the conversation with appropriate pleasantries. As the channel closed he turned to give orders, glad that he was able to get a few artifacts without risking irreplaceable lives. 118, Chapter 22 Salvage, Megumi watched the alien ships depart, as she stretched her new body, and slipped out of her command chair, she considered how the last hour had gone, her diplomatic approach had worked. Now she had a shipwreck to deal with, but thankfully she didn't have to waste time and energy dealing with a group of unknowns. What their interest in this region was, remained unknown, but she had kept them from acquiring anything dangerous. She did not need them doing something stupid with technology they did not understand. Even if she doubted it would cause something on the same scale as the Darkation infestation. Even if it was entirely possible, the Darkations came about due to a variety of factors. The people who created them got their hands on advanced technology that they didn't fully understand. All they saw was its potential to make them a dominant power in their galaxy, and everything that entailed. If only that was all that moved them. Then there was the cult. A cult had risen in that galaxy among the younger races, one that fanatically believed that the younger races could not prosper so long as the empires of the elders still stood. The young race that ultimately acquired the technology that would be their downfall had that cult particularly well entrenched among their number. Between the greed and religious fervor, it was little surprise that they used it to create a weapon. The lack of understanding, however, played into their inability to control their new weapon. It was a great tragedy really, one that could have been prevented had the Elder Council not been so complacent. Supreme Protector Countryman had foreseen the rise of the Darkations, and had lobbied for a punitive expedition. One the Elder Council stymied, believing it to be a waste of resources. At the time, the Empire had been enjoying a golden age. Other than a few wars, the Empire was prospering. The Corps had enjoyed peace for many Mayakana, only the border galaxies had seen conflict in recent centuries. Most notable of those conflicts were the Empire's wars with the Altines, and the Iridex. The Elder Council understandably saw no reason to divert vital assets from the fronts with either the Iridex or the Altines. None of them after all possessed the singular talents of the Supreme Protector, not one of them had the gift of prophecy like he did. They could see glimpses of the near future. But Supreme Protector Countrymen could truly see the timelines. Of course that only covered the surface of things. Behind the scenes, a very different story was unfolding. The Council had become somewhat corrupt. The Council had been involved in a number of schemes that undermined the Protectorate. Schemes that the Supreme Protector was fully aware of, but had not been able to do more than stymie. The Protectorate was the side of the Solian government that mainly dealt with foreign affairs, and directly controlled the Solian military. The Council however dealt mainly in internal affairs. In an age in which much of the Empire was largely unaffected by war, 
Perhaps it came as little surprise that the council disregarded countrymen's warnings, they were too busy playing their games for power. Games that countrymen used against them. Megumi knew from history that not long after the tragedy that birthed the Dark Asians came to be, countrymen dissolved the council. By ignoring the threat, they had enabled countrymen to use a very old legal clause that would force the council to dissolve and open elections for a new council. The clause also disqualified all removed members from holding any government position. Of course, that same clause allowed them to challenge this, but only through a duel. Many naturally chose to duel rather than give up their power, but they stood no chance against the last First Lord. Supreme Protector Countryman was the oldest living member of their race, and the last of a group known as the First Lords. With such age and experience he commanded the strongest magics known to the Solian people. Not to mention he was an outright terror in battle. All who challenged him that night, died at his hand. She pushed thoughts of what might have been, if history had been different aside, it was pointless. Even with all their vaunted technology, and powerful magic, the hands of time remained immutable. No one could change the past. All those paradoxes the cultures of old considered when dreaming of time travel weren't possible anyway, if one did manage to travel backward in time. They also end up leaving their own timeline. This process naturally creates a second parallel timeline while leaving the original untouched. The First Lords had documented this quite well when they experimented with time travel, ultimately coming to the conclusion that time travel was impractical. A waste of resources, a novelty, nothing more. Megumi slipped out of the bridge, as her drones reported the condition of the Inquisitor. The damage was fairly severe, but not irreparable. If she had the time, and the resources she could repair the Inquisitor. A full repair though was completely out of the question. Fixing her up enough that she could reach a yard on her own might be worth it, but it would take a while. She would also have to dock with the Inquisitor so that she could link her repair systems with the Inquisitors. Otherwise, it would take much longer. Even with that she was looking at at least a week of repair. That was assuming she could find the rare elements needed to repair the other ship's main drives. She directed a subroutine to start scanning for those elements, even as she started another one, a salvage plan. In the meantime, now that the distractions were mostly out of the way, she wanted to try out her body. Her mind flicked through the people she knew, and she quickly settled on Kairu, as her best bet. It had been so long, and she hoped Kairu could make this one special for her. After all, it was technically her first time in this body and a girl's first time should be special, even if it was only in body that this would be her first, as she had done it plenty before she lost her old avatar, she was ever grateful to her creators for giving her the ability to feel and enjoy everything mortals were graced with, Kairu stretched lazily, happy for the break, she had just completed a rather challenging run, and the class had gathered in this lounge to relax, a few were playing games, Mei was playing a card game with a friend at a nearby table for example, Kairu however didn't feel like a game, Actually, she really felt like running some more and was just happy that Megumi wasn't here with another set of special lessons. Adjusting herself in her lounge chair, she found a nice comfortable position. Before she even realized it she had drifted off. She awoke to find Megumi's smiling face above her. Enjoy your nap, princess? She nodded, and then paled. I'm not late for my next lesson, am I? Megumi shook her head. No, I would have woken you if you were. She leaned forward, since you're awake. Want to help me try out my new body? New body? She frowned. In answer, Megumi reached forward and brushed her cheek. To her surprise, she felt the touch. She could feel smooth fingers and the warmth of a flesh body. I grew myself a new biomech avatar. I used to have one before, but I lost it during a battle. So how about it? Want to help me try it out? Kyra knew there were several possible means for that, but thinking it was going to be a friendly competition, she said. Sure. Megumi seemed to light up, as she suddenly leaned forward. Their lips pressed together and a warm slick tongue pushed into her mouth. Kairu's eyes widened. This wasn't what she was expecting, and she froze for a moment or two. While Megumi's tongue explored her mouth, as her shock vanished, she found the sensation rather pleasant. Kairu decided to return the kiss, and started exploring the other girl's mouth. Even as another part of her marveled at the fact that she was doing this with an artificial intelligence. When the kiss broke seconds later, she gave Megumi a weird look. I didn't think you were going to do that. Megumi's posture shifted, and she pouted cutely. She looked so cute, that it wasn't fair doing that. You don't want to? Actually Kairu wasn't all that against it, mainly surprised. 
Not to mention, she had never done it with another girl, at least not to her knowledge. With those blank spots in her memory, she could no longer be sure. Kairu flushed, and looked away. Ah, uh, it's not that. I'm, ah, uh, just surprised. I didn't think an AI would be into this sort of thing. Megumi leaned forward, and pressed against her before whispering into her ear. My creators gave me the capacity to feel pleasure, and were rather promiscuous themselves. I actually have quite a bit of experience. I was even part of my last captain's circle. Circle? You might call it a harem. My creators aren't monogamous, but live together in groups composed of several bonded pairs. Enough about that though. Do you want to, or should I leave you be? Kairu glanced at Megumi and saw the look in her eyes. That wasn't fair, a part of her wanted to say no. But it just felt like it would be cruel to do so. Megumi clearly needed it, she could see it in her eyes. And to be honest, Kairu needed the distraction as well. After a moment's indecision, she came to a decision. One side winning out over the other. Slowly she nodded. Iva. Never. She trailed off. But Megumi caught what she was about to say. Never done it with a girl before? Well then, we better make it special then. A girl's first time better be special. With that Megumi kissed her again. A moment later, she felt a hand slip under her shift, and start to caress her thigh. Several warm fingers stroked, and sank into the soft flesh there, sending pleasant tingles up her spine. It was stimulating, but not enough. She needed more. She reached out, and stroked the scaled flesh of her partner. It was smooth and hard, but it gave pleasantly, and was soft where it mattered. She soon found a mound, and began to knead it over Megami's top. The fabric was thin, so she could feel the scales, and soft flesh beneath. It felt wonderful to have her hand sink into the soft mound. Her touch didn't seem to evoke much reaction from her partner though. She decided to be more bold. As their tongues dueled, she adjusted her fondling. Soon finding a small delicate but hardened nub, she rolled it in her fingers, and then gave a gentle tentative tug. A gasp escaped her partner, but she had the feeling that her partner didn't like being that. She changed her movements, and then gasped herself. Below the teasing hand on her thigh had wandered upwards, and now she could feel fingers stroking her labia. Megumi broke the kiss, and with a smile said, You will enjoy this. That was the only warning she got before Megumi attacked her pussy. A pair of fingers suddenly penetrated her and began to stroke her vigorously. Shifting Megumi used a wing to hold her down, separating her hands from soft boob. Megumi then used her free hand, and began to tease a certain sensitive little nub. Between the thrusting, and the light teasing touches she soon felt a pleasant familiar heat building in her loins. It built quickly, and before she knew it soft heated moans were coming forth unbidden. While a soft rumble came from deep within her chest, it felt good alright, really good. She bathed for more, and Megumi complied. Her movements intensified, and that sent her over the edge. The world shattered around her as she cried out her joy. Her muscles spasmed and her vision became an all-encompassing white. The blissful pleasure seemed to last an eternity, and when she refocused, Megumi was no longer playing with her pussy. With a heated suggestive whisper, Megumi asked, Ready for more? She nodded meekly, and the pleasure resumed. 107. Chapter 23 No Regrets Kairu stretched as she slipped out of bed to start a new day. She was pleasantly sore, after last night's activities. One thing she knew for certain now was that she certainly had stamina. The two of them had been engaged for hours, and she certainly had a good time though. She even managed to get Megumi squealing. The experience had certainly been interesting as well. She had never known sex could be so good. Looking back into her bed, she briefly observed the sleeping form of Megumi's biomacavita. She was so cute, and innocent looking right there. It was hard to believe that she was the enigmatic AI that had completely changed her life. As she stared, a question occurred to her. Did A.I.S. even need to sleep? Apparently, she uttered that aloud, as Megumi answered from a speaker. I have no physical need for it, but I still benefit from it. Not to mention my avatar does need it, just like you do. It is fundamentally a biomic just like you are, just a different model. Minus Starmage class, where you are scout class. This is just weird. You are clearly asleep, and responding to me from a speaker. Megumi replied. I guess it is. I'll keep that in mind for the future. Kairu stared for a moment longer, and Megumi said nothing more. When she heard May stirring, she made for the bathroom. It was about time to get ready for the day. Erisa stepped into the hangar bay. She had heard from the scientists that something was going on in the hangar. Looking around she could already see what they meant. Dozens of drones were flying about using graph beams to maneuver large objects. 
On one end of the bay, a dozen drones were bringing a large sphere-shaped object into the bay. Elsewhere, a pair of drones was offloading a number of crates from the rear of a shuttle. A neighboring shuttle was being offloaded by a second pair of drones. But instead of crates, they were maneuvering a large cylindrical object that looked to be made of polished metal, smooth glass, and lustrous crystal. The object looked both delicate, and elegant. But what really caught her eye was the slight glow coming from its core. Quietly she asked the air, what is that? A hologram silently materialized next to her. Salvage from the Inquisitor, I wasn't able to find sufficient quantities of the rare elements needed to repair her main drives within sensor range, despite extensive scanning. As such, I am salvaging what I can before I scuttle the wreck. She was aware of the precursor shipwreck, it was why they were in this nebula. Catching the word scuttle she asked. How do you plan to scuttle the Inquisitor? Easy, with a barrage of torpedoes. A dozen well-placed AMF torpedoes would be sufficient to destroy the ship, especially with her shields, and structural fields offline. But that isn't enough for total destruction. A follow-up disruptor barrage can finish off the ship, but the nebula will prevent that. Too much gas in the area for me to safely use the disruptors. I have a plan though. I have a few special torpedoes. I plan to use instead of my standard AMF torpedoes. What is an AMF torpedo, and what are these special torpedoes you mentioned? I can't tell you what the special torpedoes are, they make use of a classified substance. One I am not permitted to share knowledge of, to anyone, not even our closest allies. They will get the job done, and give us quite the show, trust me on that. As for AMF, that is a very old, if highly refined, technology. AMF torpedoes are a special type of compressed plasma torpedo, that make use of a small antimatter charge to trigger the rapid and sudden conversion of a dense protoplasma supply into a hypercompressed supply of superheated plasma. The result is a very explosive plasma detonation and shock wave. Erisa found that interesting. One of the problems with plasma weapons was their short range. From the sound of it, these AMF torpedoes were fired inert. That would solve the biggest range limiters of plasma torpedoes, containment, and dissipation. Modern plasma torpedoes were short range as they would quickly burn through their containment after firing, and then dissipate. Even Neku plasma torpedoes suffered from these problems. I can think of several groups that would love to have a plasma torpedo like that. Well, if they apply themselves, a crude version of AMF could be at with your technology. The Solian people were not much more advanced than the Aureliana when they first developed AMF technology. You mean we could have the same weapons as you, today? A crude version of it. Yes, it shouldn't be that surprising. Take the humble railgun. It is a simple weapon often used by spacefaring races when they first enter the stars. They are very simple weapons that trace their routes to older chemically propelled mass drivers. Those railguns however fire faster, and further than any chemical design with greater range, accuracy and power. With use, refinements are made, and the technology improves. While neither my people nor yours use it as a weapon anymore, we both still apply refined examples of the basic principles of railgun technology. My drone ports for example use electromagnetic catapults to accelerate my drones to combat velocities, and many carriers use the same principle for fighter craft, while exploration craft might use it for launching probes. Hell, the basic principles are even used with torpedo launchers on most military spacecraft. She understood, she even knew of a few colonies that used railguns to launch cargo pods into space. Erisa knew full well why railguns had fallen out of favor as a weapon though. The advent of navigational deflectors had been largely their downfall. The later advent of shields was simply the final nail in the coffin. Railguns were considered short-range weapons to begin with as well. While it was true that their range was technically infinite, they were only effective against maneuvering targets at fairly close range as the rounds could easily be detected by military-grade scanners and were relatively slow. Anything more than 10 seconds travel time away was almost certain to be a miss. A further limitation to the weapons was that they were space-heavy. They required extra volume to store ammunition. Volume that comes at a premium on a starship, despite those limitations, they had remained popular with designers since the weapons were cheap and easy to maintain, while still managing to deliver reasonable power, and they were very good at knocking out stationary targets at range. Deflectors however changed that equation, rendering the weapons ineffective. Deflector fields altered the trajectory of projectiles, and most were particularly effective against low-mass high-velocity projectiles such as railgun rounds. Energy weapons were also affected, 
but often to a lesser degree. Shields on the other hand absorbed incoming energy and radiated it away as light. Projectiles like meteoroids and railgun rounds disintegrated on contact with the barrier, often with little effect to the shield itself. Particle streams delivered comparable power to a similarly sized railgun, took up less space on a ship, had no ammo constraints, could fire faster, and at a higher velocity. They were also more effective against deflectors, and shields. Able to better resist deflection, and repeated hits against a shield would leave the barrier saturated, leading to overload. Whereas no number of railgun hits could overload a shield, with all those advantages it was little wonder energy weapons had replaced projectile weapons, missiles and torpedoes on the other hand remained in use as they were guided weapons, and on contact with a shield their payload typically detonated, releasing a large amount of energy into the shield, although a particle weapon would be more effective at bringing down a shield than a torpedo. I see your point, anyway, what exactly are you bringing aboard? Mostly what looks useful. I salvaged a few power modules, the main AI core, the remaining drone supply, a couple of capacitor modules, a few spare memory modules. If I thought I could use it, I had my drone salvage it. AI core? Will I have to deal with your crazy sister now too? Megumi giggled. All DNA eyes are not sentient like I am. With a little work, I could load an infant AI into the core, but she would need a learning period before she would be of any use. Learning period? AI equivalent to childhood. It's during this period that an AI learns and grows into its intended role on simulated systems before it is installed into a ship or whatever facility needed the core. Mine was 10 years long which is typical for ship A.I.S. That seems a bit long, commented Erisa. Meanwhile, Kairu was stepping out of the bathroom to find Megumi stretching on the bed, her large wings spread to full extension. Without even looking, Megumi asked, How do you feel about last night? Kairu paused in her step. It was rather fun. I never knew sex with a girl could be so good. Kind of wish I had tried it earlier. Well, it isn't for everyone, but I had a feeling you were bisexual, care to do it again sometime? Kairu settled onto a floor cushion near the table, maybe, although I am not sure what our relationship is. Megumi looked her way with a cute smile, depends on who you ask. I think we should just see where this takes us, but I think we are starting to become friends. Friends? I'm not sure about that, but isn't sex normally done between lovers? As I said, depends on who you ask. In Neku society that might be true, but in Solian culture, things are more casual. Typically done between close friends, not just lovers. I don't know about calling us close friends though, replied Kairu. Megumi shrugged. We both kind of needed it though, and I don't really regret it. What about you? She shook her head. Kairu found she didn't regret it either. It just sort of happened. Perhaps they will figure things out later. She decided to change the subject. What's the plan for today? I figured your class could use a break. Today is a free day for the whole class. She paused and shifted from the bed to the floor cushion opposite of hers. Although if you want, we could use this time to get your special lessons out of the way. Both sound tempting, Kairu stated after a moment of thought. Megumi responded, we could do both, play some games in the morning, and then maybe visit the shooting range in the afternoon. You can familiarize yourself with that cannon I gave you, let's do that, but what will we play? Megumi reached under the table, and pulled a few things out, we have a few options, a couple of board games, and a few different card games. She picked one game, a card game out of the pile, before launching into an explanation of the game this one is interesting. It's called Fleet Commander. At the start of each turn, you draw a hand of five cards, and at the end of the turn, you discard any remaining cards. Cards have a cost, managed by two resources. The first is blue energy. You get three blue energy at the start of each turn, and any blue energy left at the end of the turn is lost. Your second resource is red energy. This energy is the only persistent resource, and you gain one red energy each turn. I'll get into what they are used for later. 98. Chapter 24 A Friendly Game Kairo ended up joining Megumi for a game of Fleet Commander. While May headed out to join the others in the lounge after she cleaned up for the day, it certainly was an interesting game. The game allowed an unlimited deck size but played best with a small deck. The recommended deck size was apparently 20 cards. Running out of cards in your deck required you to reshuffle the discard pile into your deck. It also had three types of cards the most important of which was the flagship card. Each deck only had one, and it was played at the start of the game. The goal of the game was to sink the opposing flagship, by reducing its hull points to zero. 
To this end, you had ship cards, which summon ships to the field and cost red energy, and action cards which naturally used blue energy. Action cards were pretty much self-explanatory. As she studied her current hand and considered her move, she asked a question she had been wondering about. You mentioned earlier that your avatar was a Starmage class biomic. What exactly does that mean? She asked, finishing the question and interrupting at the same time. She stretched out her wings. These aren't for show, they are fully functional. I also possess a few subsystems you don't have, although you have a couple I don't. I don't have a cloak for example. I do, however, have a star drive, and a make AIU emulator. She played an escort destroyer ship card to the field, and asked, and what do those do? Megumi glanced at the destroyer card now on the field, and said, A star drive is a biological propulsion system capable of both sublight, and FDL translation. My wings are actually part of my star drive, as they are in the species my avatar is modeled after, the Solians. As for a make AIU emulator, it is a device that allows machines to use magic. She played an action card that tripled the weapon's rating of her new destroyer till the end of turn and ordered it to attack the only ship protecting Megumi's flagship. With her buffed attack, the defending cruiser's hull points dropped to zero, removing the light cruiser from the field. Magic, sounds like something from a fantasy novel, commented Kairu, while noting the other item as intriguing as well. Not really, when you boil it down to its simplest. Magic is the power of the mind over reality, it is the power to bend reality to your will. It is the ultimate goal of the path of Shinix, called Transcendent Shinix. Many of the more powerful precursor races, as you call my creators, had knowledge of this path. My creators had their elders, the Altines had their ascendants, the Yushin Ok had their sages, the Pratari had their archons, the Yiknitl had their grand mystics. With her last two blue energy, she played a couple of shield cards to provide a temporary shield point boost to her escort destroyer, allowing it to absorb more damage until the end of Megumi's turn. Sounds like everybody had their magic users, although I am guessing the empires were the most powerful. No, the Abyss Lords of the Fallen are by far the most powerful magic users to ever grace the universe, thankfully they are locked away in the Abyss, where they can do no harm, said Megumi. As Kairu finished her turn by attacking Megumi's flagship with her flagship, but she barely did any damage thanks to its buffed pool of shield points. Megumi drew her hand, and studied it. I have never heard of an Abyss Lord, commented Kairu. As Megumi played an action card that increased her red energy by three, she said be glad you have not. They are vile twisted creatures that once terrorized the universe. If not for the first lords giving their lives to seal them away, they might still be terrorizing the universe. Unfortunately, lesser ones do occasionally escape the abyss, and when they do they cause nothing but trouble. The vile creatures revel in pain, and suffering. Think one of those is responsible for what is going on in the Imperium? As she played a battleship card, she said, I considered that. But no, what they did to you doesn't fit their usual modus operandi. They aren't all that big on controlling a society from the shadows. But while it might not be an abyss lord of the fallen, they aren't the only creatures locked away in the abyss. So I can't count out an escapee from the dimension of the abyss. But I also can't rule out a local race doing this either. Without knowing more, I can't make any conclusions about who. Megumi then played two cards. The first allowed her new battleship to attack twice, and the second was the same card Kairi played the last turn, that tripled the battleship's weapon rating. Kairi gulped, she might be in trouble. Although she wasn't dead yet. I do have a couple of questions. Who are these first lords? What is the abyss? How did these abyss lords end up sealed in the abyss? Also, if your creators had star drives why did they build ships like this? Megumi calmly attacked, and said, quite the list of questions you have, I'll try to answer them. The first lords were the first Solians. They were very accomplished in their day, and possessed knowledge now lost to the Empire. When the Fallen came they fought them, supposedly using their knowledge to create weapons that could amplify the Shinnik powers of the wielder, but even with such weapons they could not defeat the Fallen, not as long as their gods still walked this plane. However, killing the Fallen God was well beyond even the eldest of the first lords' power, but sealing him was not. A grand magic was worked, one fueled by the very lifeblood of the First Lords, which made it very powerful indeed. You see Transcendent Shinix requires energy to achieve an effect. The more energy you provide the more powerful the effect. The grand magic of the First Lords was a spell of such magnitude that it rewrote reality. You see the Abyss did not always exist, not before that spell was worked. 
The first lords created the hellish dimensional plane of the abyss, and sealed the fallen within it, but at great cost. Most of them died during the attempt. Others were left severely drained and were doomed to waste away over the next few centuries. Less than a hundred first lords actually survived the attempt. Of the seventy-nine that not only survived but recovered, only one remains today. The other seventy-eight either vanished into the cosmos never to be seen again or allowed themselves to die when they lost the will to live any longer. Kairu's destroyer melted under the attack, and then Megumi attacked Kairu's flagship. It survived. Barely. You mean they committed suicide? Megumi shook her head, as she discarded her remaining cards. No, any race sufficiently powerful in the arts of the mind is effectively immortal, yet great age eventually wears on the mind, and they may lose the will to live. When that happens, an immortal will simply waste away, and no level of intervention will stop that. Slow it maybe, but not stop it. Kairu drew a hand for what might be her last turn. Immortality kind of hard to believe that is even possible. With magic, anything is possible. The only question is how much are you willing to pay? Anyway, I still haven't answered your one question. The answer is actually rather simple. Yes, it is true my creators are fully capable of space flight on their own, but not for their first 500 years. Give them enough time, and an elder can be a match for any ship just like the Star Dragons. However ships like me, have always been their homes, where they raise their young, where they live and have families, we are also their shield, and protection, not to mention, they can only go so far before they need a rest, Kairu didn't like her hand, and while thinking out her turn, commented, always been, surely there must have been a time when the Solians didn't have ships, depends on how you look at it, but the generally accepted view is that the Solian people have always been spacefaring, the short answer is, that 10,000 years before the founding of the empire in the very first year of the Solian calendar, the Solian home world was rendered uninhabitable by orbital bombardment, but a handful of proto-Solian ships survived. These ships encountered an anomaly five years later, one that reshaped them into the first Solians, and spat them out on the other side of the Solian home galaxy about 50 years later. Sighing, she said, I guess I can see the opening point there. What kind of anomaly was it? Some kind of wormhole? No, a Hyperion storm. Deciding her first move, she sacrificed a unit of blue energy, and played a card that would let her draw three more. It was a risk, but if she drew the card she needed, she might be able to win this turn. Kind of surprise they survived. Most ships get ripped apart by the wave front. I guess they must have had some really impressive shields back then. Megumi giggled, they didn't. Solian ships didn't have much in the way of energy shielding until 427 SDE. At that point in history we had little interest in energy shielding. We found it too easy to defeat. All Solian ships of that era boosted impressive armor, and it was that armor that absorbed the brunt of the wave front. An image of a ship suddenly appeared above their game. As she studied it, Megumi elaborated. This is a Battlehawk class heavy cruiser. They were the mainstay warship of the Solian fleet for centuries until they were replaced by the Soulfire class heavy cruisers. It is also the perfect example of Solian military design for that age. Notice the robust hull configuration, the numerous beam weapon mounts, and thick plating. These were real brutes on the battlefield, able to take more punishment than most dreadnoughts of their age. They famously carried a particle beam weapon called the Phase Lance, which fired a phased particle stream that could carve through most forms of ship armor including neutronium with incredible ease, while remaining modestly effective against energy shields. They also carried another weapon called an electrocannon, an ionized plasma weapon that could overload most energy shields of the ear in a single hit. That weapon also wreaked havoc with ship systems, but did little in the way of hull damage. Summoning a frigate to the field with the last of her red energy, she commented, The ship does look to be rather rugged, and it must have been something in its day if it was in use for so long. Although, it makes me wonder what the Solian battleships of that era were like. Megumi shrugged. They likely would have been an upscaled version of the Battlehawk, kind of pointless to wonder though. Since the Solian fleet didn't employ battleships until 912 SDE, although that battleship drew from design lessons learned from heavy cruisers like the Battlehawk, and her success of the Solfire, in a way, that makes this cruiser class my oldest known ancestor. She was about to ask why, when it suddenly occurred to her, they had lost their home world, and only had a handful of ships. It was impressive that they could employ cruisers like that Battlehawk. A battleship was a significantly larger investment, and with their limited resources it might not have been one they could afford. 
It wasn't the first time she had seen economics play its ugly hand. A part of her wondered how a people with no home world ended up founding an empire, but now did not seem to be the time to ask. Instead she commented, well she is certainly an impressive ancestor. I will give you that. That she is. Kairi then played another triple weapons card, but this time she played it on her flagship, following up with a card she had just drawn. It allowed her to attack the enemy flagship directly with one of her ships, but required two ships to be on the field. Sacrificing the one for the direct attack, she removed her frigate from the field, and then made a direct attack on Megumi's flagship, ending the game, as her buffed flagship reduced the other ship's hull points to zero. Good move there, guess you win this round. 93, Chapter 25 On the Range, Announcement Happy New Year's Kairu stepped into the firing range, with a bit of excitement. While her HUD still told her the weapon was restricted, she was finally going to be allowed to use her cannon for the first time. It was part of her, and she was eager to see what it could do. Before I let you shoot, I need to tell you a few things about your weapon. She nodded and focused on Megumi to indicate that she was paying attention. Like most Solian ground weapons, your defense cannon is plasma-based. Now do I need to go over the advantages and reasons for that or are you good? She shook her head. Kairu was familiar with the advantages of plasma-based weapons. There were a number of advantages to plasma-based weapons. While they lacked the range of other energy weapons, they excelled in firepower. Plasma bolts could burn through most types of armor, and overwhelm shields in short order. That limited range mattered less in ground engagements. They were also fairly robust and could be fitted to infantry portable platforms, making them quite popular with infantry. What about lasers? Are you familiar with those? Or does the Neku military not cover them in their education? Vaguely. A bit of an outdated weapon. Why ask? I see you will need a refresher then. As for why, that weapon on your arm is a plasma laser. It marries the advantages of laser weaponry with those of plasma weaponry. I guess I do need a refresher then. All right. Now lasers are simple directed energy weapons that fire phase coherent streams of photons. The chief most advantage of laser weapons is their range and accuracy. Lasers also travel at the speed of light. Many young races adopt them as their first energy weapon as they excel at carving through the kind of armor employed by races that young. However, they do lack firepower and struggle against any kind of significant energy shield. Plasma on the other hand is the most potent of the conventional trio of energy weapons. Plasma lasers fire a phase coherent stream of superheated plasma, the result is an energy weapon that marries the firepower advantage of plasma with the range and accuracy of lasers. Interesting. Although I do wonder, is there a short form of plasma laser? They are sometimes referred to as phases, but that isn't the official term for them. Anyway. Let's move on to the weapon itself. Your personal defense cannon is thought controlled with two distinct firing modes. It doesn't have variable intensity settings, however. So if you shoot, be prepared to kill your target. In fact, get used to that. Solian weapons typically don't include a stun setting. In the primary firing mode, your cannon will fire a continuous phased plasma beam. The beam mode is more accurate over range, and is useful for cutting through walls in a pinch. This mode will be your preferred mode at most ranges, especially at long, and close range. The secondary mode fires compressed plasma bolts contained within a phased flux field. These bolts are quite powerful and will detonate explosively on contact with a target. Hellfire mode as it is called has a lot of firepower but isn't recommended at close range. Best used at medium range. Very useful against targets in cover, or when laying down suppressive fire. Kairi glanced at her arm, and commented, in other words, I have a grenade launcher integrated into my arm? I guess you could call it that, although I probably should show you a few Solian grenades, but not today. Anyway, I have unlocked your cannon, why don't you try arming it? Kairu blinked, noticing that the restriction was indeed gone. She focused on the weapon, and willed it to arm. In the same manner, she would use the other systems Kairu had taught her to use. The cannon responded instantly and her arm opened up. Several skin-covered plates extended out and back. Then a small cannon extended above her wrist. She moved her arm around, and found that the plates didn't really restrict the movement of her arm. It was really weird to look at, especially with how she could now see the alien machinery integrated into her flesh. On the other side of the range, a small object moved onto the range. It was a small sphere, but it quickly changed into an armored figure. She glanced at Megumi questionably. What is that? Type 17 Metamorphic Target Drone. 
It uses an array of complicated systems, EGM, holography, force shields, and more to simulate any target. In this case, an armored foot soldier. Try shooting at the drone, Kyra nodded, and raised her arm. She took aim, and with a thought fired a coherent beam of blue-green plasma arced across the room, and struck the wall about half a meter to the left of the drone. That was okay, but you do need to work on your aim both in terms of speed and accuracy. Try again. Kyrie let out a breath. She fully agreed. It had taken too long to aim that shot, and she had missed. That wasn't acceptable. Not for her, not for her former teachers, and not for the ship. She adjusted her aim, and fired again. Determined to hit this time. A second stream of plasma arced from her arm, and this time it struck the drone. A grazing hit to the side with some plasma striking the wall. The drone appeared to be undamaged. She groaned. That wasn't good enough. Kyra knew she was still too slow, and that wasn't a solid hit either. She needed to do much better against a stationary target. As she continued her practice, she asked a question that had been on her mind. By the way, what exactly is EGM? Just a fancy acronym for energy generated mass. In other words, it is matter synthesis technology. The technology for it isn't all that complicated. The main bottleneck for it is power generation. That pretty much answered the question, and she refocused on working on her aim. It didn't help that she lacked sights. When she asked, apparently she had targeting sensors, and a reticule for her HUD. But Megumi had helpfully disabled those features, saying they were mere crutches, and that she needed to be able to quickly and accurately aim without them. She spent the next couple of hours practicing against a single target. At first that target was kept stationary, merely being moved every couple of shots. Then the target started moving slowly at first, and then with some speed. Eventually she was able to hit the target consistently, and actually scored damage with every hit. It turned out to be rather easy. The plasma beam was remarkably accurate and fast. It was really as simple as point and fire, even against a moving target. Unlike the significantly slower plasma rounds of necky rifles, pistols and whatnot, she had no need to lead the target, although it did become harder to hit once the drone was placed past a certain range, but that was mainly due to a lack of sights. Megumi suddenly had her stop, and then added a dozen additional targets to the field. She glanced at her, and before she could ask, Megumi began, You seem to have gotten the hang of the primary mode, what do you think of it? It's amazing. A solid, highly accurate, and easy to use weapon. I wonder how long before my people could develop something like it? Megumi replied with one surprising word. Yesterday. Huh? What do you mean by that? The Neku are already advanced enough to produce a phased energy weapon system. The only reason they don't have one, is that no one has developed it. The only question is how long before someone decides to try. So something like this is already within our reach. Huh? kind of nice to know. Well a surprising amount of science is merely refining upon what already exists. Phased plasma weapons have been in use in the Empire for millions of years. They have changed over the centuries, but they are still fundamentally the same weapons developed so long ago, albeit far more powerful, and efficient. It should come as little surprise that many of my toys, are merely refined versions of things already within your reach. Not all my toys are that way though. My hull for example is made of materials your shipwrights can only dream about, and will remain out of your reach for several millennia. My drone weapons are also far beyond what your people could develop in your lifetime. Now that you mention it, I guess that is kind of true. It just slipped my mind. Anyway, what do I need to know about this secondary mode? Not much. In Hellfire mode, the cannon has three fire mode selectors. Single shot burst and full burst. Single shot naturally fires a single plasma pulse at the target. Burst fires five plasma pulses in rapid succession. While full burst will drain the entire capacitor, and if your plasma capacitor is full that equates to 50 plasma pulses. After firing a full burst, you will need to wait for your capacitor to recharge before you can fire again. In general you will almost never use the full burst firing mode. It has its uses, but we won't go over them today. I assume you noticed that the extra targets are now in a tight formation, and have some cover, ranging from light to full. Now you could just lob a grenade at them and be done with it, but a burst from your defense cannon in Hellfire mode will also do quite well in this situation. Why don't you try a few practice shots now? She took a stance, while internalizing that bit of information. She had already noted the capacitor in the primary mode. She could fire continuously, so long as there was energy in the plasma capacitor. Although in most cases it was better to keep to a short burst, 
Just as she was about to fire her first practice shot, the deck plates shook. It wasn't enough to unbalance her by any stretch of the word, but it was noticeable. Barely with a frown has looked over at Megumi. What was that? I opened fire on the Inquisitor, a few minutes ago. Those were just the shockwaves from my torpedoes finally reaching the hull. There is a larger, more powerful, shockwave coming up in about two minutes. But we won't be here to feel it. I am about to make the jump to warp speed. So it's nothing to worry about. Kairu was left wondering what the hell. Those torpedoes were packing to rock a ship this big. It was only later she decided that she didn't want to know. Especially once she considered how powerful the inertial dampers had to be for such an advanced vessel. The captain was just about to step off his bridge, and call it day. Suddenly his officer jolted from her seat. A bit of a panic, in her tone, as she hastily reported. Sir, long-range sensors are picking up a massive energy burst in Sector 57 Gamma, inside the Chiris Nebula. The readings are off the scale. Energy burst? What kind of energy burst? Unknown. There is nothing like it on record. I can't even tell what kind of energy it is. The computer doesn't recognize the energy signature monitor the energy burst, and forward all data to central command. Alert me if there are any changes in that region. He ordered before departing the bridge. He had no idea what caused that burst, but the exhausted captain had little doubt that every ship in the area had picked that burst up. A small voice in his head told him nothing good would come of that, but he was too tired to deal with it right now. 91. Chapter 26 Movements in the Shadows, and Beyond. A young lady rushed excitedly into the office. The woman behind the desk looked up at her entrance, she looked just as young as the excited ensign that had run into the room, but she was far older, her apparent youth was merely one of the perks of being one of the immortal races. Lord Protector, Madame, long range intergalactic sensors recently picked up a, she interrupted, I know, the ISS constellation, yes, specifically the Tripoli. E. The Sears informed me already that she would reactivate soon. Does that mean, Imperial Command already plans to send a force to recover the ship? She shook her head. I am afraid not. We have no ships to spare, especially with the bulk of our fleet engaged elsewhere. However, we have every reason to believe the ship will make its way back to the Empire on her own. Kairu stepped out of the bath. A light flashed from the walls, and ran over her damp body. The water vanishing from her sparse fur, her hair, and skin instantly. She had enjoyed the bath. It was quite the luxury for a ship, and she had a semi-private one, practically unheard of for starships, especially military starships, although she was happy to have it here. In fact, she had a lot to enjoy lately. The ship had been good to her. For the most part, there was the whole thing with changing her body, but she had to admit she hadn't been in her right mind then. She was thankful the ship had undone the brainwashing that had been done to her. She glanced back at May, who she had shared the bath with. Kairu was starting to think of her roommate as something of a friend. Although she knew that May saw her as a sister, Kairu just wasn't ready to think of her that way. Even if they were, in an odd way, related on a genetic level. It was weird to think about. But these girls were based on her. Not that she knew why, only that it had something to do with Megumi's plan to uncover what was happening in the Imperium. Thinking of Megumi she still wasn't sure what to make of their relationship, especially after they had sex. At the time, Megumi had caught her off guard, but she had gone through with it. Kairu had never said no, so she knew at least on some level she had wanted it. Not that she regretted it, it was the best sex she ever had. I'll go ahead, and get dressed. I'll meet you later for today's class. May acknowledged her, and Kairu left the room, quickly selecting an outfit, and then making her way out of the room, where she ran into Megumi. Megumi smiled, and said, Good morning, princess. She sighed, Good morning. I'm going to be busy this morning, Melia is about to wake up, and I plan to give her, her first magic lesson, as such, your morning will be a free period, to enjoy with your classmate, Melia, I don't think I know that person, R, yes you two have not met, if you like, I could bring you along, the magic lesson won't do you any good, but, she trailed off leaving the rest unsaid, Kairu didn't need it, she nodded, sounds like a good idea, I take it this Melia is someone important, Megumi affirmed, she is a very talented young Irili I picked up, I also put her in charge of all the Irili I have on board, but she answers directly to me, effectively that makes her captain, but only in name, I'm the one actually making decisions after all, Kairu didn't know what to say, but wasn't all that surprised, the ship had recruited her, and while she had not seen anyone else, she had little doubt the ship had recruited other Neku as well, why would they not recruit an Irili as well? 
In fact she remembered originally suspecting this ship was under early control. Now? Not so much. It was quite obvious it was still under precursor control. Well, the control of a precursor computer anyway. Not that she fully understood Megumi's motivations. After a moment she said, kind of obvious. On that, I guess it is. This way, she gestured, and Kairu moved to follow. Then Megumi said, by the way, this afternoon I will be arriving in a system not far from the Neku border. It's part of a small star cluster whose inaccessibility has led to it remaining uninhabited. That inaccessibility is mainly due to the highly unusual hyperspace geometry of the region. It's also prone to hyperspace anomalies including the type that surface into normal space, a factor that makes approaching via warp travel a tricky proposition. Unless you happen to have sensors capable of peering deep into hyperspace like I do, Kairu blinked. The Cesare cluster was a well-known astrographic landmark. As she recalled, the Neku maintained a research outpost near the cluster, one dedicated to studying the prolific hyperspace phenomena in the region. Although she had to admit, she knew little about either the cluster or the outpost in the region. Feeling curious, she asked, You wouldn't happen to know why the cluster is so unusual? I do, but it's rather complicated. In short, it is to do with the rather anomalous central star of the cluster. That star is currently in a state of hyperspatial flux, and it is distorting hyperspace in a radius of nearly 30 light years. Kairu gave Megumi a look. Someone did this on purpose didn't they? Megumi nodded. You would be right. Just don't ask me how they did it. That knowledge was lost with the First Lords. Perhaps, Supreme Protector Countryman would know. He is the last of the First Lords, and they were the ones who did this. Just good luck getting that knowledge out of him. He has been tight-lipped on many subjects in regards to First Lord knowledge. Kairu had heard mention of the First Lords before. Even if it wasn't much, but she had not heard mention of this Supreme Protector before. She asked about him, as they continued into a tram lift. Megumi looked thoughtful for a moment, and then replied. He was, last I checked, the ruler of the Solian Empire, but that may have changed. It has been many years. In addition, as I said earlier he is the last of the First Lords, but he is also the last remaining founder of the Solian Empire. Before the Empire he was also head of our precursor state, the Solian Alliance. Although that didn't mean as much as it does for the Empire. The Alliance was merely a loosely aligned collection of independent fleets. Not unlike a collection of city-states, where each city was its own nation. Precursor state? Solian Alliance? Megumi sighed, and said, History is rife with turning points. If you are interested I do have extensive history files that you could review, complete with in-depth analyses of historical events. That even includes early Solian history, and covers how the Solian Alliance reformed into the Solian Empire. It also covers the initial formation of the Solian Alliance. In broad strokes though, the Solian Empire was not the first unified Solian government that was actually the sole refuge. An early precursor to the Solian Alliance that stood for nearly 10 millennia before the Empire was founded. That sounded interesting actually. While history had never been her best subject, she had often found it diverting. Sometimes it was better than fiction. Kairu did recall reading that many cultures founded their first unified government within the first 200 years after the discovery of spaceflight. This sole refuge, I am curious how many years after the discovery of spaceflight was it founded? Technically the Solian people never discovered spaceflight, they inherited the knowledge of spaceflight. Kairu noted that response, and said, I really need to read those then, they might be a nice diversion. It sounds very interesting. I'll get you a list of the better books on the subjects then. Although I didn't know you liked to read, you seemed like the type that loves to run. Oh, I do, but sometimes it's nice to curl up with a good book. I typically prefer fiction, but sometimes a good history book can be just as diverting. Megumi nodded. I understand. I'll get you a list of good fictions to go with it. They left the lift, and turned left, where the duo was quickly met with a security screen. Megumi flashed an off-putting smile, ah, and this is a good opportunity. Would you like to learn how to use your shields to bypass a security shield? Kairu blinked. I can do that? It turned out she could indeed pass through security shields. Although she messed up on her first try, and her second, neither was pleasant as security force fields were charged energy barriers. Not only did she bounce off every time she messed up, she also got zapped. It was really cool the third time, when she got it right and was able to just walk through it like it wasn't even there. However, now however, 
They were in a small medical bay with a single pod, one that was draining of liquid to reveal a nude early female. Megumi was explaining how the fluid in there tended to ruin clothes, but Kairu wasn't really paying attention. She was more focused on studying the features of the young woman in the pod as they resolved themselves. The young council member leaned back in her chair and sighed. The senior agents they had sent to Earl had reported back. One of them had a run of bad luck and had been forced to pull out when her cover failed. Although she didn't leave empty-handed, the others had managed to infiltrate the planet and uncover some unsettling information. Their worst fears had been realized, and more. The Earl has indeed managed to reactivate the precursor ship. The ship in question was a Star-Lord battleship, the ISS constellation. Worse, the Earl were not in control of the ship but an eccentric and unpredictable alien AI. One that did however seem to be helping the early. One of the agents had managed to retrieve a partial copy of some data that had been sent to the early. Unfortunately, she had not been able to get all of it or destroy any of the data. It was too well guarded. There was enough to indicate that the ship was trying to level the playing field. What else the ship was doing? They knew not. The early didn't even know its exact whereabouts, but they were still in contact with the contingent of scientists they had left aboard, who were occasionally sending progress reports, but nothing important came with those. There was little surprise about that. Honestly, her biggest worry now was the ship. Apparently, it was able to cloak, and it was regenerating. Damaged systems were repairing themselves on their own how she knew not, but that meant with every passing moment it became more of a threat, especially since they had no idea what that ship was going to do nor did they really know everything the precursors were capable of. She sighed, and slipped out of her chair. The young councilwoman already thinking about the upcoming council meeting, they needed a new plan, and fast. Although she had no idea how they were going to keep a precursor warship in check, not unless some kind of fortuitous luck came their way. 92. Interlude FTL Tracking and Stealth The rise of faster-than-light travel is a major milestone for any fledgling civilization. It greatly expands the range of worlds they can visit within their own lifespan. Breaking the light speed barrier quickly leads to the formation of extrasolar colonies, and before long interstellar trade. Trade routes and colonies that must be defended, not just from aliens but from a culture's own people as well. Piracy is often one of the first great dangers a civilization will have to contend against within the depths of space. Well, unless they happen to be a hive mind or a species that lacks that inclination. Weapons, shields, and armor are all well and fine, but defending even a handful of colonies can grow to be bank-breakingly expensive, especially without the ability to track ships in transit, a prospect made more difficult by the myriad methods used to break the light speed barrier. Hyperdrives for example use hyperspace as the medium of travel. But warp drive spends space allowing for faster than light travel through normal space. As such, the methods of tracking them are different. Let's start with hyperdrive. In order to track a ship traveling through hyperspace, a civilization must first develop sensor technology capable of peering into hyperspace. Not an easy prospect, but one that is well worth the effort. Once such sensors exist, a ship traveling through hyperspace could be tracked by the distortions it generates in hyperspace and more easily by its energy signature. Naturally, military ships don't like being tracked if they can help it. As such many civilizations quickly look into minimizing those distortions and their energy signature once they are capable of detecting them. There are several methods of doing this, but the easiest lies in modifying a ship's thruster assemblies in hyperspace. A ship must continuously produce thrust in order to maintain speed, unlike in normal space where a ship does not. This continuous thrust produces both heat and distortions in the surrounding hyperspace that can be tracked. The typical solution to the heat buildup problem is to outfit a ship with a radiator assembly, allowing it to radiate excess heat into its surroundings. More advanced races often use subspace radiators able to dump that heat into multiple hyperspace layers at once. That heat, however, is also one of two major factors that allow ships in hyperspace to be tracked, as it is the main component of a ship's energy signature. By using a low heat thruster assembly, a ship's energy signature would notably be reduced, making it far more difficult for a ship to be tracked. However, the ship could still be tracked by the wake it generates in hyperspace as it moves. There are several ways to reduce a ship's wake just by modifying a ship's thruster assembly. Altering the way it produces the thrust can have a major impact. Reducing thrust can also be a viable tactic. Lower thrust however also means a lower speed. Interestingly, the same technologies that can be used to track a ship in hyperspace can also be used to track ships at warp. But not always, 
The why of this lies in the fact that warp drive equipped ships face the same problem that hyperdrive equipped vessels face, namely heat buildup. Warp drives generate massive quantities of heat as a byproduct of their operation. The solution most cultures use is to employ radiators to dump that massive amount of heat into their surroundings. Ships with subspace radiators would dump that energy into hyperspace, where it can be detected and tracked. However ships without subspace radiators can still be tracked, but not via hyperspace tracking. Waste heat from a starship's main drives is actually the principal method of detecting a ship at long range. Conventional faster than light spatial scanners can be tuned to pick up the heat signature of a ship from light years away, whereas things like their mass readings don't show up until they are much closer. To counter this, a ship would need to reduce her heat signature. One way is to employ heat recyclers that can absorb waste heat and convert it into usable energy. This has several benefits. Not only does it reduce a ship's heat signature, but it also improves fuel efficiency. However, these recyclers are nowhere near as efficient as a radiator at dealing with waste heat. As such they are often used in combination with a radiator. Stealth ships also typically use this method, but when running silent, they also employ specialized systems to temporarily store excess waste heat. Solian ships, however, do not employ radiators at all when dealing with waste heat from the engines. Instead, they use a rather ingenious array of energy absorbers and converters that convert the entirety of their drive's waste heat output into usable energy. This is not to say that they don't employ radiators, however. Radiator technology does not only apply to propulsion but it can also be applied to shields. Shields absorb incoming energy, but that energy must go somewhere. That energy is radiated away from the ship in several forms. Some of it is typically dumped into space through a ship's main radiators, while the rest is often radiated away as light. That is why shields glow when hit by weapons fire. Solian shields employ advanced subspace radiators to dump the majority of incoming weapons fire into hyperspace. Radiators that are dedicated to the shields rather than the main drives. This setup gives Solian ships several key advantages in stealth, fuel efficiency, and shield mitigation rates. Moving on, jump drives. Jump drives function through subspace aka hyperspace, but they don't use the same hyperspace domain as hyperdrives. Their use of the natural subspace corridors between stars limits their travel vectors. As such it is very much possible to simply monitor the jump nodes in a system to alert defenders that a ship has entered or left the system. However, the same sensors that can detect ships in hyperspace could detect a ship traveling through a subspace corridor. Do note however that since subspace corridors occur in a different hyperspace domain from that used by hyperdrives, the sensors would need to be tuned to that domain in order to pick up a jump drive equipped ship. However, this tuning also prevents them from detecting hyperdrive equipped ships. The normal solution for this is to simply use two arrays of hyperspace scanners each tuned to monitor a different domain. Next up, inversion drives. These drives are by far the most interesting to track. They create subspace inversions that effectively allow a ship to teleport between two points. Speed is a function of range and cycle time. This use of subspace inversions however creates a massive energy burst in hyperspace every time the drive is engaged. A burst that can easily be picked up by even the most primitive of hyperspace sensors. But this burst only occurs at their entry point. Where the ship exits no such burst occurs, as all the energy of travel is expended on entry. Not to mention early hyperspace sensors are unable to determine the direction of travel. Early tracking of inversion drives is typically done by marking the coordinates of each burst and drawing a line. This would give both the speed and direction of a ship using an inversion drive. Tracking can be thrown off through a number of methods, including the use of subspace decoys. Finally, star drives being organic in nature do present their own challenges. They typically function on principles similar to that of warp drive, but they are not so easy to track via their energy signature. Yet they are also both a sublight drive, and they can through the use of a special form of spatial flux access the jump nodes. When they access a jump node they can be tracked entering, but they don't produce the same wake patterns that other ships would, making them harder to track while in transit. As for when traveling at warp, all star drives are effectively similar to stealth variants of the warp drive. They do not dump energy into hyperspace, and their energy signature in normal space is remarkably small. As such, the best way to track them is by tracking their spatial flux signature. This is inherently more difficult, and requires specialized sensors. Highly specialized sensors, and the range of tracking is also limited to a few dozen light years. 77. 
Chapter 27 Milia's First Magic Lesson Milia stretched as she stepped out of her pod, and looked around. While a strange light flashed over her bare skin leaving it clean and dry of the gel she had been encased in, nearby she noticed a strange black furred neck you female she had not met before. There was something about her that struck her as different. She certainly didn't seem like the others of her kind. Megumi gave her a smile, and said good morning, Milia. A drone entered from a small door to the left, carrying a bundle of cloth. I have some clean clothes for you, and, she gestured to the neck beside her, I would like you to meet Kairu. I recruited her to help with our investigation into the Imperium. I hope the two of you will get along. She looked towards Kairu, and said, nice to meet you Kairu. The next 20 minutes was spent exchanging pleasantries, getting dressed, and generally getting to know each other. Mulia learned that Kyrie loved running, books, and was previously the captain of a Neki cruiser. Mulia shared her own passion for learning, and books. She also shared how much she was looking forward to learning magic. Before they knew it, the three of them were seated around a table, and Megumi was preparing to give her first lesson in magic, while a drone was placing an elaborate wooden box on the table. The box was about 80 centimeters long, perhaps 85. An elaborate emblem was emblazoned in gold and silver on top of the lid. The emblem featured a single planet with a large moon. The silvery moon was placed in the upper left corner of the emblem with a silver ring depicting its orbital path. Inside that orbit, gold wings were wrapped around the planet, and two swords were crossed going through the planet, with a silver shield placed in front of the planet. It was quite stuck against the dark red wood of the box. Mulia ran a hand over the emblem. This is a beautifully worked box. Why did you bring it out? Kairi looked at it questionably. What does that emblem represent? Is that the flag of the Empire? Megumi shook her head. No, it is a flag, but not the Empire's. Well, not the current flag of the Empire anyway. This was the flag of the Empire when it was founded. Nowadays the emblem is attached to the Guardians of the Elder Worlds, an ancient order that was founded to guard the home worlds of the Empire's eldest members. My last captain was a member of that order, and this, she opened the box to reveal a pristine blade nestled snugly in the box, was his sword, Kairu stared at the double-edged blade incredulous, his sword, why, Megumi cut her off, I know, it seems a bit dated as a weapon, however, it is still quite useful in the tight corridors of a ship, not to mention this blade isn't made of steel like the primitive swords you might be familiar with, this sword was forged from the scales of a Solian elder, Xo's alloy, and synthetic dragon bone as the main materials. The handle and blade have integrated plasma channels, and the pommel is safe and crystal. This sword is a magic weapon commonly called a lightning blade, but it is also a focus for magic. Kairu frowned, and Mulia looked at it curiously. Neither was sure why Megumi had brought this blade. Thankfully she continued, lightning blades are powerful melee weapons in close quarters able to cut through most forms of armor but their real power comes from their ability to channel high-energy plasma discharges. Discharges that resemble lightning, hence the name. It takes skill to use one of these, but those discharges can be quite deadly. Mulia reached forward and ran a hand over the blade. She had already found references to this weapon in the Solian database. Not that she knew much about it. There were so many other things vying for her attention. They weren't given time to ask more about it as Megumi then closed the box, while forcing Mulia to withdraw her hand, and saying, Anyway, the main reason I wanted to show you this, is because you will be forging your own later. All Solian mages use their magic to forge their own sword when they graduate. It is one of the final tests a prospective mage must pass. Speaking of tests, any prospective mage must be able to answer a few key questions before they are even allowed to cast a spell. The first being, what is magic? The second is what is mana, and the third is by far the most personal. A mage must be able to identify her own affinities. I will get into that in a moment. Before that there are other things to discuss. I already told you a bit about what magic is, and what mana is before. So what I will be talking about today is the fundamentals of spell theory. Magic is the art of channeling mana to achieve a desired effect thereby bending reality to your will. How this is done is through spells. What is a spell though? Well, that is what we will be discussing today. Megumi raised a palm, and a ball of fire appeared in her hand. What you see here, is a spell. A very simple spell, in which a small amount of mana is being channeled to produce an effect. 
In this case that effect is a small flame floating above my palm. The mana alone however is not enough to achieve the effect. Will plays a major role in creating this effect. My will shapes the mana and creates this flame. Will alone however isn't the only other factor creating the flame. The mana is the fuel, my will is what shapes the mana, but what governs the properties of the flame. Mulia was silent for a moment until she realized that she was supposed to attempt an answer. She hesitated a moment before venturing. The laws of physics close, but not entirely. The flame does indeed obey physical laws. Mana is burning, reacting with the oxygen in the air just like normal combustion. However, it doesn't have to obey the physical laws. I could have created fire that doesn't obey the physical laws. That however would have cost more mana to achieve. Care to guess why? Before she could really consider an answer Kairu interjected. That is a neat trick. Anything else you can do with that fancy magic of yours? Megumi giggled, just about anything you can imagine is possible with magic, for example, if you two started dating, and then decided you wanted a child, there are spells for that, Kairu blushed deeply, Milia however found herself thinking about how such a spell would work, Megumi then said, although magic does have limits, while there are spells that allow two females to have children with each other, the same can't be said about a pair of males, that doesn't however preclude a solution, the problem with males is that they lack a womb, or in the case of egg-laying species, lack the ability to lay eggs. Mulia, seeing where this was going, interrupted, I think we get the point. Then deciding to steer things back towards the lesson, she ventured an answer, to answer your earlier question. I'm not sure, but I think it costs less because it is obeying physical laws. Megumi nodded, to a degree you are right. This brings me to one of the major precepts of magic theory. The concept of understanding. Mages must be intimately familiar with the effect they are trying to achieve when they cast a spell. Take fire for example, it is a deceptively simple process, but if you understand combustion intimately you can not only cast a fire spell more easily, but the spells you can cast become more potent. Of course your understanding isn't the only personal factor that affects your spells. That other personal factors would be your affinities and your ability to envision an effect. In other words your imagination, although that part is pretty self-explanatory. Now what are affinities? Well to answer that, I need to first go into something called elements. Magic has different flavors or elements if you will. Fire, ice, earth, lightning, air, and nature to name a few of the elements. Now some magic systems include water as an element, but the Solian magic system does not. Now people are naturally drawn to certain elements, they more easily understand these elements, and can more easily envision their effects. In other words, they have an affinity for an element. Now, these affinities also often manifest in an individual's personality as well. For example, it is quite common for someone with a fire affinity to have a short temper, while those with a lightning affinity are prone to quick judgments nature affinity people tend to be highly in tune with the natural world, and their ability to draw power from the natural world often leads to them preferring to remain in their natural state, Kairu frowned, natural state, Megumi gave Kairu a look that Melia found odd, but she could not put a finger on why, they like walking around in the nude, although they do have good reason for it, although I'm not going to go into that, not today anyway, Kairu blushed again, and looked away, Mulia frowned, interesting, so these affinities, are they dynamic or static, Megumi blinked, good question, they are dynamic actually, they can change over the course of a person's lifetime, however, they aren't going to change suddenly, any shift in someone's affinities requires a bit of a catalyst, again content for a future lesson, is there anything that isn't content for a future lesson, quipped Mulia, while rolling her eyes, Megumi pulled out a pad, and replied, not really, I do have some reading for you though, along with a couple of worksheets, the next few lessons will be on the elements, today's reading is on fire, before Malia could do more than glance at the pad, Megumi was standing up, she gestured to Kairu, and started for the door, it seemed the lesson was over, and Megumi wanted Kairu to follow her, Kairu hesitated to leave her chair, but a moment later, she hurried after the computer's avatar, Malia was curious, but she instead picked up the pad, tapped the screen, and opened the content, in bold letters it was titled, Chapter 1, Fire, the Embodiment of Heat, Malia flipped the page and began to read, she didn't think this would be all that interesting, especially since she had already learned a lot about fire back in her chemistry classes, she quickly found herself proved wrong, as there was more than just the chemistry side of things here, it seemed fire had a mystic side as well, one not quite covered in her chemistry class, the title having been a hint on that, 
the chapter was quite engrossing. Meanwhile, Megumi showed Kairu to a viewport. Kairu looked out the viewport to see a lovely world, its surface a mix of brown, green, and red. She didn't see much blue, but there were a few regions of blue. The planet clearly had surface water, but not enough for any large oceans. At most it had a couple of enclosed seas, and a few scattered lakes. She did also note the vast reddish deserts that covered much of the northern hemisphere, while the southern regions seemed to be lush with plant life. I have some drones setting up a gate on the surface as we speak, and other drones are preparing a planetary shield. How would you and your classmates like to explore an alien world? Kairu excitedly replied, I'd love to explore this world, I'm sure my classmates would love to as well. We could all really use a chance to stretch our legs, no offense, but your training room isn't really big enough for that, I know, it's why I came here, and didn't head straight for Neguri, anyway, go gather your classmates, and meet me in the training room, we will be gating to the surface, in an hour, she rushed out of the room, eager to gather her classmates, the magic lesson had been okay, but she knew it wasn't for her, what she really wanted was to feel the rush of a good run, Something she knew she might get down on the surface of this alien world. 79. Chapter 28 The Surface Kairi was about to step through the gate. The swirling blue portal was set to take her to the planet below. Her mind was already considering what Megumi had told her and her classmates. The planet below was a class 4 planet capable of supporting humanoid life, but not ideal. A class 5 plant would be considered ideal for supporting humanoid life. The planet below was almost too close to its parent star and the northern hemisphere practically always faced the sun. That was why the northern hemisphere was almost entirely desert. The north wasn't desolate, however, with scattered oases, and plenty of subsurface water. Orbital scans indicated extensive lakes, rivers, and caverns beneath the rocky northern deserts. The south received less sun, but it was enough to support a vibrant thriving ecosystem. Vast forests, grasslands, and swamps covered the southern land mass, with scattered inland seas rivers, and lakes. Megumi had detected numerous large life forms in the southern hemisphere. She said over half of them would be dangerous to Neku or Eruli, but it would be of little concern to her or her classmates. She did, however, state that a few of them could be dangerous if they were careless. Megumi had been particularly clear about a large armored reptile native to the swamps in the western hemisphere, saying that it was the most dangerous of the native wildlife, and could kill them easily if they allowed it to catch them unawares. However, it could still prove dangerous even if it did not catch them unaware. Apparently, it was a distant cousin of dragons, a type of drake. It had scales that were resistant to most energy weapons, fangs and claws that could cleave through most forms of armor, and a natural breath weapon. It was weaker than most dragons and didn't possess their level of intelligence, but that didn't make it harmless. At least it couldn't fly, like dragons could. She stepped through the gate, and was greeted not with the sight of alien wilderness, but metal walls. Kairi looked around, there was an elegance to the alien architecture of these metal walls. Drones were busy etching alien murals, and characters into the walls. Elsewhere she could see drones working on open conduit housings, nearby a few of her classmates were talking, and Megumi's avatar was waiting for her. Kairi stretched her back for a moment, and then headed over towards Megumi. Seems a bit busier than I expected. I thought this would be a gate in the middle of an alien wilderness. What is all this? Megumi smiled. Planetary stargates are important assets. I know I told you that the Solians do not colonize planets, but the Empire does claim planets, mainly for her member races such as the Terrans or the reclusive Cavalonians. This planet would be perfect for the Cavalonians, as it already has a well-developed underground, but the Terrans wouldn't much like this planet. I'm setting up a standard Imperial outpost here on the surface. It's not finished, but most of the key systems are operational already. Care for a tour? Kairu smiled, sounds fun, Megumi giggled, but Kairu failed to notice her gaze, then, Megumi commented, I'll show you around, right now we are in the keep, at the center of the outpost, the keep holds the outpost's primary shield generators, central power systems, and the gate room, those aren't the only system here, but they are among the most important, I'll show you around when the drones finish the keep, Megumi signaled to Kairu that she should follow, and she followed after the ship's avatar. Heading for an open door not far from the gate, Kairu stopped when she stepped out of the door, and looked around again, this time in awe. As far as the eye could see, she was surrounded by flowing alien architecture, towering metal structures, flowing metal walls, 
and in the distance something that looked like a city wall. Well vaguely, it wasn't at all like the ancient ones she had seen in pictures. Then she looked up, and noticed that the sky looked vaguely distorted. There was a shimmering in the air, the kind she attributed to an active ground shield. While shields were invisible until hit, and that remained true on the ground, there were still ways to tell one was there. Especially in an atmosphere, where you could look for things like shimmering, and distortion dot effects that had nothing to do with the shield itself, but the air around it. Some ground shields were intentionally made visible as well. But the particulars of that escaped her, the why, however, was simple. It was quite dangerous if someone just walked into a shield. She already had some personal experience with why that act was dangerous. Megumi gestured at the tall unfinished buildings around them, and began talking about the outpost. The tour that followed was a bit of a whirlwind as she was shown around the outpost. The architecture was apparently Terran, and Kairu honestly felt it was more of a city than an outpost. It had everything factories, armories, offices. The housing was almost all communal, but there were private apartments available nearer to the keep. In many ways, the outpost felt like the future meets an ancient castle town. Before she even knew it, Kairu was near the city gates. Nearby her classmates were gathering. Megumi gestured at the wall, and said, I'm sure you were wondering about this. She nodded. Kairu really had been. The idea of it seemed primitive. Neku cities no longer used city walls, they just weren't very effective at keeping armies out in the current age, hadn't been for centuries. Some old cities still had them, maintained mainly for posterity, or historical value. Megumi shifted into lecture mode. Walls have always been used to keep hostile armies out of a city. The idea behind a wall is simple, a fortified barrier of stone to keep invaders out. Over the eras the concept evolved, but so did the weapons used to breach them. Ancient stone walls gave way to barriers of concrete and metal, which quickly gave way to trenches and barbed wire. The wall never really went away, merely changed forms over the ages. In the current age, walls have mostly returned to the ancient form. Except they are made of metal alloys and fortified with energy weapon emplacements instead of stone, and bolt throwers. The reason for this is actually quite simple. Remember earlier when I taught you how to walk through a security field? Kyra nodded. A puzzled expression on her face, her tail quite clearly displayed her confusion. The same concept can be applied to ground shields like the one protecting this outpost. That wall there is mainly intended to prevent enemy soldiers from just walking through the shield and into the outpost. Dedicated A8 towers placed around the outpost make sure they don't just fly over the wall, and into the outpost. Drone towers and ground to space batteries make an orbital approach difficult. Of course, in the ancient era, many a wall was brought down by sappers digging beneath the wall. We use Cavalonian technology to prevent that. Being a subterranean race they are really good at both digging and preventing that act. That was actually rather interesting. Before she could think up her response, however, Megumi gestured with a wing and began. Anyway, that concludes our tour. Why don't you join your classmates for a run? I'm afraid that I'm going to have to leave you now. I have things to get done. With that Megumi's avatar departed, leaving her alone in the alien streets. Megumi hadn't been kidding when she said she had things to do. By her directives, she needed to establish a fully functioning outpost here now that she had claimed the planet for the Empire. Sure it would not bear fruit for many years to come, not for the Empire anyway. The planet, however, may prove useful for her as both a training site for her Biomax and in the long term as a resupply base. Already she was planning the construction of an orbital stargate for her own use. This system, thanks to the inherent subspace instability of the region, was also energy rich, in a fashion that normally had to be engineered artificially by creating a singularity inside hyperspace. For example, her subspace energy wells were currently operating at 2,279.22756931% of nominal output. That meant her tertiary power systems were generating more energy than her main reactors by a margin of 23.34790026%. That meant this system could supply all of her needs for the foreseeable future. Once she completed the needed infrastructure that is, at this very moment, she had drones working on the construction of a white matter forge, and the needed matter converters. Once completed, she could produce almost any resource she would need right here at this outpost. 
The planet could also support a sizable biomic population, and the immediate orbital area was perfect for a small shipyard facility. One large enough to not only maintain her systems but supply her with extra escort ships if needed. Assuming she put in the time to build, and care for the needed AI cores. An AI did need a learning period before it could be pressed into service. It was the AI equivalent of childhood, she remembered her own fondly, and she would not deny her children one either. After Megumi left, Kairu was eagerly waved over by Mei, who was just as excited as she was about to run on the surface. Kairu was looking forward to feeling the wind in her face, and really getting a feel for her new body. In a way the training room had never been able to provide for her, Mei excitedly asked as she got close, want to race to the mountain ridge to the east? Mountain ridge? Yeah. There are some lovely mountains to the east. Almost 100 kilometers. I noticed them when I looked over the scans of the planet. I bet they will be gorgeous up close. Before she would have thought that 100 kilometers would be stupid for a race. But with her enhanced body that didn't seem unreasonable. She nodded. Yeah, that sounds like fun. May threw her arms up, and declared, great. Then she leaned over and whispered into her ear. Kairu felt herself turn red but nodded, while making a mental note, not to lose. 84, Chapter 29 The Trouble with Nesting Dragons The captain stretched as she slipped out of bed, she shouted at the person knocking on the door of her emergency shelter, it had been over a week since she gave the order to abandon ship, surprisingly despite all the damage to the ship, from her crew of 390, all but 40 had survived, the dragon had ignored their pods, and those of other ships. Her crew wasn't the only crew that had landed here on the fourth planet. After landing here, they had set up emergency shelters and disassembled the pods. The escape pods were designed to be taken apart, and used as material for an emergency shelter. Each pod had a number of cheap titanium blades stored as well for that purpose, along with enough medical supplies, and rations to last three months. Each pod also contained a distress beacon, short-range interstellar commune unit, basic tool kit, a small arms locker, and a small generator. She sighed. It wasn't exactly comfortable, but much better than nothing. Grabbing her uniform she started to get dressed. Already she was considering the problems they were facing. They could not count on help coming to them. In this little valley, they had 2,000 people to worry about already. Her crew and those of the ships that had landed here with them, perhaps more people were scattered across the planet. Not that she could worry about the others. Those here already had their hands full considering their immediate problems. They had food, water and shelter for now, but that would only last so long. Well, they wouldn't have to worry too much about water. There was a river running through the middle of the valley, just west of their little settlement. There was some fish, and game in the area, and they had scouts looking for edible plants. As for shelter, no one would be content with the cramped emergency shelters they had now. The current plan was to build proper shelters closer to the river, and then recycle the materials of their current shelters. Dressed, she slipped out of her single room shelter, where an ensign was waiting for her, one who seemed a bit nervous. She recognized the ensign, she was one of the youngest officers on her ship. The captain had taken the young ensign straight from the academy, where she had impressed a number of the instructors. Now she was kind of wishing she hadn't. The poor ensign deserved better than being stranded on this planet. Tiredly, she asked, report. She just couldn't muster the energy for her normal command voice. Thankfully she wasn't the only one affected by their unfortunate circumstances. The ensign stuttered a moment and then blurted out, Dragon. She never finished that report. Both of them were suddenly startled, by the sound of a loud wing beat. She looked up, and felt her heart lodge itself in her stomach. Her throat tightened, and she felt her muscles lock up. Her eyes locked on the creature winging over their makeshift settlement, the very same monster responsible for them being stranded here. It was huge, with majestic lines. Powerful wings coated in gleaming red, silver and purple scales beat slowly as it lazily flew through the sky. Its powerful-looking legs were tipped with long deadly talons, while the tail ended with a vicious-looking blade that vaguely resembled a sword. Although it made even great swords look small, it was at least four meters long, and that tail was more than double that in length, not surprising given that dragons could grow to be hundreds of meters long. This one wasn't that large, but she was still huge. Her sight however drew her to the armored head, the smooth armored lines, the predatory eyes that swept over those below. It opened its mouth, and she was flashed with sharp silver white teeth that could shred her in seconds. The dragon gave out a roar, and she felt a trickle of warm wetness below. Her mind froze. She didn't know what to do. Alira winged lazily above the valley below. 
she really was liking what she was seeing. The valley below was fertile, with plenty of water, and modest game. There were several promising mountains on the ridge that looked great for establishing a nest. Making the area even better was the fact that plenty of large game wandered the forests and plains of this world. Not much large game could be found within the valley, but there were quite a few large lumbering lizards and mammals just beyond the valley walls. There was even an ocean within an hour's flight of this valley. The oceans were rich and fertile, blessed with large beautiful fish. This planet was looking great for a nest, especially with the recent influx of Neku. That there was a modest settlement of Neku below was just a bonus. With a little work, they could prove quite useful. She let out a roar, as a warning not to run, and then picked a small hill just north of the Neku settlement. She wasn't impressed with it, but they were clearly just a collection of emergency shelters. The Neku clearly needed help, as well. Might as well help them out. It might be a pleasant diversion. With a few steady flaps, she sat down with a bit of a thud. The soft soil gave a bit under her weight. Alira folded her wings, and stretched her back lazily before focusing on the makeshift settlement nearby. Already her mind was fishing for candidates. The captain watched the dragon slowly descend towards a hill. It didn't seem to be leaving. She felt her legs give out under her. Nearby the young ensign was already collapsed in a pile, and breathing roughly. It made her feel a little better that she wasn't the only one so affected. It didn't help that she kept seeing images of that fateful battle just over a week ago. Her training told her that she had to be strong in front of her officers, but she didn't see how that would apply to their present situation. Not against that monster that had wiped out the entire invasion fleet. She seriously doubted that a creature that had shrugged off starship weaponry could be fought off with plasma rifles, or the handful of grenades or rocket launchers a few individuals had thoughtfully brought with them, nor did she think the collection of titanium and uranium plating their makeshift settlement was made of would protect them. The caves in the valley wall were too far, and even if they were closer she didn't think they would help much either. While her mind was drawing a blank on what to do, apparently her body already had ideas. Suddenly she found herself getting up. Her wobbly arms pushed herself off the ground, and after a moment she found her balance on her jellied legs. Her muscles quickly tightened up a bit, and then to her shock she started undressing. She panicked for a moment, and tried to stop herself, but none of her limbs were responding. It took her another moment to realize that her body was no longer under her control. That lump in her throat suddenly swelled a size, as images of the teeth she spied just minutes ago flashed before her eyes. She had no idea how she was being controlled but her panicked mind already picked a culprit. It must be the dragon that landed moments ago. And she was imagining herself being made to walk right to it, where she would be eaten. As her underwear dropped to the ground, she found herself walking away from her shelter and clothes the direction being towards the dragon, which only reinforced her fears. Idly she noted other women walking by in the same manner she was, and completely naked as well. Her mind barely registered that. Instead she focused on trying to wrest control of her limbs but to no avail. Before she knew it, she found herself and a number of others gathered before the large dragon. Up close it looked both fierce and majestic, with its gorgeous red, silver, and purple scales. Sleek predatory lines dangerous sharp-looking front claws, vicious talons, and that deadly tail swinging lazily behind it. A creature clearly bred for battle. She wanted nothing more than to run away from it, feeling quite vulnerable right now. Especially now that she was naked and unarmed, but her body still refused to obey her commands. The air itself suddenly began to vibrate around her, and a voice spoke. It was regal, majestic, feminine and somewhat predatory. <laughs> yes, very nice. I think you all will do very nicely. After I fix that little problem of being brainwashed by someone, that is. Now she was confused. The captain had a feeling that the dragon had just spoke to them. That seemed contradictory to everything she thought she knew about dragons. No attempt to communicate with them had ever worked. They had wiped out entire fleets, and were known ship eaters. But this one was speaking to them, in their language no less. What it just said to them was just as confusing as the dragon speaking. However, a small part of her told her that maybe being eaten wasn't on the table. But that did nothing to assuage the fear she felt as her heart continued to beat so rapidly. She feared her chest would burst. The bit about brainwashing didn't even register with her panicked mind. She barely even noticed what the dragon was doing. Idly she noticed one girl after another walk up to the dragon, who seemed to look over them for a moment or two. Then they joined a second group that just stood off to the right. Her mind was elsewhere, but she suddenly came back to the here and now when she found herself standing before the dragon. 
The dragon looked her over, and she shuddered. Its gaze terrified her, but she didn't know what to do. A giggle echoed in her mind, and then said, No need to be so terrified. I'm not going to hurt you. Although you may feel a little discomfort when I break your conditioning. Try not to be alarmed. Before she could really process that, her mind was suddenly bombarded with the sheer weight of another mind. It was massive, and forceful. She felt quite fragile before the weight of the alien mind that was intruding upon hers. Nothing could have prepared her for this, and she knew that if the dragon wanted to she could snap her mind like a twig, or worse. She felt something snap in her mind, and then that weight vanished as quickly as it appeared. With it came a flood of thoughts and impressions as she suddenly became aware of gaps in her memory. Gaps she knew the dragon before her was not responsible for. And at the same time she became aware of things she had not thought much of before. As her body just walked towards the group of girls who already had their encounter with the dragon, her mind was busy trying to reconcile the implications of what just happened. A part of her felt relieved that she was still alive both in body and mind after that encounter. She knew intimately how insignificant she was to the might of a creature that stood less than 10 meters from her. Not only did it dwarf her in size, but it was powerful with a mind that could break her in two as easily as she could snap a twig. Distantly she became aware of her limbs being restored to her, but she didn't run. There was no point, she merely sat on the ground, praying the dragon would let her go, waiting for it to pronounce her fate, whatever that may be. Fortunately, she didn't have to wait long for that, but she wasn't sure she liked what she was told. 77 Chapter 30 Fate Proclaimed She sat there on the ground with the others the dragon had already deprogrammed. The cool air brushed against her skin, and she could feel the alien soil and grasses against her skin. The captain without a ship let out a breath as she tried to bring her emotions under her control. All while waiting for the dragon to declare their fate. She had her limbs back under her own control, but she didn't bother trying to run. Not after she had felt the power of that creature's mind. It was too powerful. After feeling the weight of the dragon's mind, and being controlled like a puppet, she no longer considered escape possible. Fighting was out of the question as well. They had nothing left with which to fight the dragon, especially after considering that it had shrugged off starship weaponry without so much as a scratch. Thankfully, she didn't have to wait long before the dragon finally deigned to inform them of their fate. When the dragon's gaze swept back over her, she felt her heart rate increase, and it had only just started to calm. As her chest was pounding and that familiar lump in her throat swelled back up again, the dragon addressed them. You should not be so frightened, I am not here to hurt you. As I already tried to tell you, in fact, I could help you a great deal. My magic can easily help you build better shelters, or plow fields for farming. All I ask is that some of you serve me, as future caretakers for my pups. She swallowed. Caretakers? What was she talking about? Was she offering help that seemed weird to the young captain? The damn dragon was responsible for their current predicament in the first place. Her train of thought was interrupted when someone thoughtfully asked. Caretakers? As in? You plan to trust us with your young? Why would you do that? We fought just days ago. She had to disagree with that sentiment. It didn't make much sense, sure. However, that was only if you didn't take into account the power of the dragon's mind. The captain had little doubt that the dragon could just mold them to be the perfect babysitters for her young. What the dragon replied with, merely reinforced that impression. Because each and every one of you that becomes a caretaker will be imprinted on one of my pups. Although before I allow you to meet them and imprint on them, I will make sure you are perfectly trained for the job. I have all the time I need to mold you into excellent caretakers for my young before they hatch. She had another question brooding in her mind, but someone else asked, Um, what exactly would that entail? They were quiet. But the voice still rang clear to her, and the dragon heard it as well. She answered, but the captain wasn't sure she liked the answer. Well aside from the obvious, I will revert you to your natural states, and then bless you with enhanced resilience, life, and strength. Enough that you will be able to watch after the young dragons I will entrust you with for their entire developmental period. I think you should consider it. The natural neck lifespan is barely over a century with proper care. If you become my servants, my caretakers. You will easily have a thousand years or more to look forward to. On one hand, she was offered a long life, but that came with servitude. Not to mention she wasn't quite sure what the dragon meant by returning them to a natural state. Looking around, all the other women gathered here seemed equally uncertain. Her own question was forgotten. She knew not what to say. As her mind considered what she had heard, she started to note how many people were here on the hill. All of them were female, and there were dozens, perhaps hundreds of girls gathered here. 
a stark display of the dragon's mental power. She had a feeling that just about every female in the camp had been puppeteered into walking out here, and all of them were just as naked as she was. It made her feel better about being naked, although she did have other things to worry about. Back to the problem at hand, there also was the other offer for her to consider. The offer of help for the settlement. It wasn't exactly something they could turn down, especially given the fact that the dragon in front of her seemed to be planning on nesting here. If that was true, no rescue would ever come. The Imperium would wisely steer clear of any dragon nest. In other words, they would need to set up a permanent settlement. They would need better shelter, and farms to feed their stomachs. The dragon's offer was tempting all right, but what would be the exact cost? She opened her mouth, her question remembered. How many caretakers would you need? Two for every egg I lay, is considered optimal. Adult dragons like me can lay up to a hundred eggs in a single clutch, and I would like an extra ten people for personal reasons. I would say two hundred and ten would be sufficient. Before you ask, all of them must be female. Males aren't suited for the demands of the job, as they wouldn't understand the demands of the job. Not the way a female would. Also, you would be free to come back here and visit your friends when the demands of the job permit. Nor will I bar you from taking a mate and having children of your own. That didn't sound too bad, actually, as one of the few officers of Captain Rank, however. These people here were her responsibility. She wasn't sure she could ask that of them, but she didn't think she could leave them as a caretaker either. The captain had to look after them. Her responsibilities as a leader took precedence. But no one seemed to be jumping to volunteer just yet. The dragon continued, I would prefer if everyone that took the job volunteered, but I know that might not work for everyone. A lottery would be a fair way to pick those who go with me, if need be. The captain looked around, and soon spotted one of the other captains. She pushed herself off the ground, and slowly moved over, intending to confer with the other officers of her rank. She knew a decision would need to be made, and soon it occurred to her that rejecting the dragon's offer might not be wise, but it wasn't her place to make that decision unilaterally. The young woman knew she did not speak for everyone here. At most she could speak for her own crew but not those of the other ships. Before she could reach the other captain, however, a few stood up, and of all things volunteered. They did not however amount to the two hundred-something people the dragon was demanding. It seemed there were a few young women willing to sacrifice themselves for the community. She guessed that made it a little easier in that they were not sacrificing their lives. Reaching the other captain, she said, What do you think about all this? The other captain noted her presence, and sighed. Well see you. I don't think we are in a position to reject the dragon's offer. I think we are going to have to take the risk, and accept it. Hand over a few of our people. At least a few of them already volunteered. That makes things a little easier. I would not call two hundred a few people, she replied. That is roughly ten percent of our number. The other captain shrank a little, I know. But she looked around again. See you was silent a few moments, but when she didn't pick up again, see you commented. How are we going to select those who will go anyway? The other captain shrugged, I don't know, so you would have proposed something but she too was drawing a blank. Suddenly someone, behind her, interjected, you could always write the names of every eligible female down, and toss it into a bucket, shake it up a bit, and then pull them out at random. It would be better than most other methods, given the numbers of eligible female neck you. She nodded, yes, that does sound like, so you trailed off looked back and almost jumped out of her skin. Somehow that massive dragon had moved behind her, without her noticing. It just made her more frightening. Glad you like it, she said, as a bucket floated out from behind her claws, and deposited itself between Sue and her fellow captain. I already took the liberty of preparing a bucket for you. All of the names of eligible females minus the volunteers are already in their aunt's silver nameplates. The dragon withdrew and she glanced down at the bucket. Looking inside, she noticed quite a few rectangular metal sheets jumbled up in the bucket. Attached to the bucket was a lid that was currently open. She moved to grab one of the plates, but her arm suddenly froze. Then she yelped, when she felt a jolt of pain ripple up her nerves. A voice soon followed, Naughty girl, don't pull a single name out, until everyone is ready for the lottery. She felt heat on her cheeks as she realized the dragon had just done the equivalent of slapping her on the wrist like a naughty child. So you suppressed the feeling, and glanced at her fellow captain. Go find the others and meet me back here. The other captain nodded and ran off. She sighed, and so you took the opportunity to try and sort out her thoughts and feelings. Not that she had longed to do that. It turned out the other captains were already looking to meet. Almost as soon as the other went looking she was back with two others. That meant the captains of four ships were here, 
and they were the only people of captain rank here. Well from the fleet anyway, there were those from other branches here as well. As soon as they met, they began to discuss the bucket thing and the implications of a dragon nesting here. They quickly agreed that no rescue would be coming and that they would need to plan for spending the rest of their lives here. The dragon's offer was too good to ignore. However, the discussion soon stagnated after that. As they were all distracted, it took time before they agreed that they needed at least one person of captain rank to stay and provide leadership for the colony. So you ended up being the one volunteered to confront the dragon, and ask her to make sure their names weren't in the bucket for the drawing. So you nervously left the group, and approached the dragon while carrying the bucket. By now, she had managed to calm down enough to function, and the fear she was feeling wasn't so pronounced. It made her no less uncomfortable about having to talk to the dragon. When she reached the dragon, the dragon said, ready to start the drawing. She shook her head, but the words got stuck in her throat. Before she could work it out, the dragon was saying, Ah, I see. Well, it would be unfair to remove your names from the drawing. Tell you what, I will guarantee that half of you stay here to watch over your colony and I will even bless you all, regardless of the outcome of the drawing. Does that alleviate your concerns? It did. Well some of them anyway, unfortunately, she never got to speak before the dragon said, great, in that case would you draw the first name? She gulped. This really wasn't going the way she had hoped. So you glanced at the bucket, but hesitated to pull a name. She looked up, and noticed all the faces now looking this way. She felt herself flush with trepidation. She reached into the bucket, a part of her feeling the weight of what this meant, gripping a plate. She pulled it out, and read it. A part of her almost dropped it, feeling stung. The very first name, against all odds, turned out to be her own. 79, Chapter 31 A Conversation, and a run, Megumi stretched as she stood before her ground gate waiting for the coils to warm up. She had finished her tasks here, and Kairu was off running with their friends. There were other people that could use her attention, however, and she figured she would use this opportunity to have a long overdue conversation with Erisa, one that apparently would have to wait longer than she expected, just as the gate activated, dialing a portal back to the constellation's gate room, she felt a telepathic connection attempt, she quickly recognized who was attempting contact, even if it was quite unexpected, she accepted the connection, and inquired, Alira, a happy excited voice came over the connection complete with a wide array of images, highly detailed shnick scans of a star system, but not one Megumi recognized, hey, Megumi, I found the perfect system for a nest and wanted to talk to you about it, glad to know you are still in communications range, Megumi suppressed an internal sigh, it was one of those calls. On the other hand, she apparently made more of an impression than she thought. They were friends already, or at least the dragon thought they were. Then again she did have something to share as well. You found a good site for a nest? Good for you. I've been busy myself. I'm working on building an outpost on an uninhabited world right now. That sounds interesting. You will have to tell me all about it. And yes, I did find a good site. It's perfect. Well. It doesn't have a primitive population of its own, but it does have some shipwrecked Neku, personally, I think that is better. Shipwrecked Neku? She replied, a smirk on her face. She sent a feeling of amusement down the link, and said, I take it there is a story there, am I right? The dragon replied with mirth, yeah when I entered the system, there were some Neku ships gathered in the system. Easily a few thousand ships actually. They attacked me before I could really take a look at what this system had to offer. I may have played with them, and quite a few Neku abandoned their ships. Most of them ended up landing on the fourth planet, often in clusters. There are some who ended up landing alone. But anyway I am setting up my nest near one of the larger clusters, a group of about 2000. They chose a really good landing site, but I feel these Neku would need my help for establishing a stable colony. She understood that and giggled a bit. Then she felt a little sorry for those poor Neku, they really had terrible luck. First, they ended up being some shadowy group slash persons brainwashed pawns, and then they ended up stranded on a planet with a nesting dragon. That wasn't considered desirable for many reasons. I don't doubt they would need help, alright. Most cultures wisely steer clear of planets claimed by a nesting dragon. At most, they might try to send supplies, but a rescue would be out of the question. I wouldn't allow that anyway, not without being screened anyway. Right now I'm about to help out the cluster near my new nest. After they finish a little lottery on who ends up as the caretakers for my soon to be laid eggs. Megumi sighed, and replied. Well I guess that is a fair way to decide that. Best way I thought of. 
Anyway, you mentioned building an outpost? She sent feelings of affirmation, and said, Yes, I found a lovely little world not far from the Neki border. I plan to use the planet to train biomics, but it is located in a region of space that is particularly productive for energy wells. She sent her own scans over the connection, the system, the planet, the local hyperspace geography. Interesting, would make an okay nest right now, but if you keep tapping the depths for power it will make a very good nest later. I kind of wish I had a few wells here as well. Any dragon would love a mana dense nest. The levels are adequate here, but they could be better. I will consider building a couple for you. Assuming I have the time. Putting that aside, what are you going to do with all of the other neck you shipwrecked on your world? The ones not near your nest. I'll gather the ones I can, but I do have other concerns. Building your nest no doubt. As I recall, dragons go to great lengths to dig out and fortify their nests. I need to make it ready for my children, and I must train my new servants. They need to be prepared for the job I recruited them for. If it isn't too much trouble for you, could you do something to help those stranded on the other continents? Megumi let that hang for a moment, and then replied, I'll see what I can do. Already her mind was considering what to supply. It needed to be kept simple, and primitive. Nothing that the Neki would not have been able to procure themselves if they had the resources. Not to mention it needed to be kept low-tech or they would not be able to maintain what she sent them. Farming equipment would be a must. Some of them might not have clean water, and she could list several low-tech solutions to those problems. Shelter would also be important. She could prefab a few houses for them, but they would have to assemble them. Simple hand tools would likely be welcomed as well. Hammers, nails, saws, screwdrivers, that sort of thing. Generating a list, she ordered a subroutine to get started on manufacture. Then turned her attention back to Alira. Their conversation quickly drifted into idle, but enjoyable conversation. Kairu felt the rush of warm wind on her face. She was very much enjoying the rush, the thrill of running at full tilt. The rocky ground of the desert she was racing through presented little challenge for her enhanced body. If she looked around, she would be able to spot a few of her classmates. Also running through the desert, she wasn't sure how fast they were going. However, her mind was too focused on trying to keep ahead of May. She didn't want to lose their little race. If she had to guess, however, she felt she was easily outrunning most light vehicles. It felt exhilarating, the wind rushing by, the ground passing so quickly that if she was not enhanced she might have missed the many details of this gorgeous desert. The rocky soil glittered in the harsh sun bringing to life the lovely browns, golds, reds, and oranges of the soil. Here and there large rocks jutted out of the ground, and her eyes spotted numerous smaller ones. Sparse desert shrubs struggled to take root where they could in the harsh desert. She jumped, sailing over a desert snake that she had spotted in her path. Kairu had no fear of the creature, but didn't particularly feel like trampling it. She didn't want to have to wash it off later. It wasn't the first snake she had seen. The desert was filled with lizards, snakes, and insects, most of which were harmless, at least to her and her classmates. Landing back on the ground, she shot off like a rocket to maintain her pace. A part of her marveled at the fact that she wasn't even winded yet. Her old self would never have been able to run this fast, and would have been winded long ago if she had tried to make this run. A part of her wondered how fast she had run, but she didn't bother to check her HUD. She didn't want to lose her lead. Ahead she spotted a formation of large rocks right in her path. She cursed. That was going to cost her a little time. Nothing she could do about it. Well she could try shooting them, but she didn't think that was legal. Besides, she had no experience trying to use her weapon at full speed. They were too tall to jump, so Kairu altered her course to avoid the rocks. There was no helping the detour though. Thankfully, it proved to only be a small detour, and she was back on course in mere seconds. A part of her was amazed at how easily she could maneuver at these speeds. The enhancements done to her body never ceased to impress. It really drove home the fact that she was technically a super soldier now. All of her classmates were as well. She tried not to think of the implications. Moments later she crested a hill, and the ridge came into view. The goal of her little race. She had gone farther than she thought. A bit of relief went through her. She was almost to the goal, and she left May in the dust over an hour ago. Kairu had not seen her since and felt it safe to say she had won. Kairu was going to enjoy this. She put on a final burst of speed to close the remaining distance more quickly. The terrain whizzed by a dizzying speed, but as she drew closer she noticed a few figures already at the ridge. 
It seemed a few of her classmates were already there. That didn't matter though, she wasn't racing them. Only May, and as long as she got there before May that meant she had won. She didn't see May, and she didn't think May could have gotten ahead of her in any case. Just before she reached the ridge, she put on the brakes. Kicking up a cloud of dust, and rocks, she smiled and looked around, a part of her feeling quite accomplished to have made it. But before she could celebrate, a familiar voice spoke, glad to see you finally made it. Did you get lost or something? She turned towards the source, and her shoulders slumped. Kairu felt herself deflate, as leaning against a rock with a wide grin on her face was May. It seemed she had somehow lost the race. A part of her turned red, as she remembered what that meant. Feeling indignant, she shouted, How? I left you behind hours ago. How are you here? May just chuckled. I took a better route, clearly. Now I am sure you remember the consequences of losing. Yes? Kairu sighed and looked away, she very much did. With reluctance, she reached for her clothes and started to take them off. This was embarrassing, but she had lost. Worse she already agreed to this, Kairu lost her chance to protest this hours ago. This wasn't fair. At least she would be able to put her clothes back on when they got back. The penalty had simply been that the loser runs back naked. As her clothes hit the ground May commented, looking good. Ready for the run back to the outpost? She gave May a look. Of course not. Might as well get it over with. Then she glanced at her clothes on the ground. How are we getting those back anyway? One of her other classmates came over. She recognized her. It was her next door neighbor. K spoke quietly. May asked me to carry the loser's clothes back to the outpost. While showing off a small pack she was carrying. This sucked. But she was already backed into a corner. Kairu figured it was best to get it over with. She handed her clothes over and watched as quickly and efficiently packed them into the small pack. May smiled, and said, race you back, if I lose I'll take my clothes off, and if you lose you stay naked for the rest of the day. She shot off like a rocket before Kairu could protest those conditions. Kairu didn't even have time to really blush at the thought. She took off after May, with every intention of beating her this time. 73, Chapter 32 A Day Without Kairu stopped in front of the gate to the outpost. She had just finished a run back to the outpost entirely in the nude. The run back had given her enough time to think, and once again left her amazed about her enhanced body. It really drove home how little she needed clothing. With a sun this harsh, you would think being out in it nude and without protection would lead to a sunburn. She didn't have one, nor did she have any marks from the wind lashing her skin. Her breasts being unsupported didn't cause her any problems either. It really did prove that she didn't need a bra. May, naturally, was already here. Not surprising, given that May knew the terrain better, and had a head start. At least this time, she was right on the other girl's heels the entire way. May had expertly prevented her from taking the lead, however. She heard footsteps behind her and glanced back to seek arriving with a pack containing Kairu's clothes strapped to her back. Kairu then noticed K's expression and was quite thankful it wasn't directed at her. K barked at May. You know that wasn't all that fair taking off like that. You didn't even give her a chance to accept your proposition. May glanced at her feet. Sorry. I was too excited. Kairu could tell she was sorry about that. In fact she looked very cute acting all contrite like that. Very cute. Kairu was kind of enjoying this. K seemed to mellow a bit, and let out a sigh. In that case you won't mind spending the rest of the day without your clothes. May giggled. I guess that is fair, but I did win. K replied, with a shake of her head, not exactly a fair race, you had a head start, and as proven by the first race, a better grasp of the area, May deflated a bit, and started removing her own clothes, yeah, you have a point there, K pulled the pack off her back, and held it out to Kairu, you can have these back, thanks, she replied feeling a slight heat on her cheeks, she looked away, which brought her gaze to the city gate, where she noticed an emblem emblazoned on the gates that she had not seen before, it featured a very prominent star that was pierced by a single sword from above. Three rings orbited the star, one horizontal with the equator. The other two were offset by 23 degrees, and met with the first ring at the prime meridian of the depicted star. Breathing the entire emblem was a pair of silver wings, K commented. Never seen it before have you? She shook her head, and K informed her that is the flag of the Solian Empire. Complete with the normal blue background. Kairu took a second look at the gate. She had thought that the blue color was simply the paint of the gate. She hadn't realized it was meant to be part of the symbol on the doors. Although the symbolism of it was lost on her, she knew nothing of what the symbol stood for. She replied with the only thing she could think of. 
It looks nice. May her clothes neatly folded and draped over one arm, interjected, let's get inside. We can talk over lunch. I don't know about you two, but I am famished. That statement reminded her that she had not eaten since before the run. She was feeling somewhat hungry herself. She had to concur. Cool so quickly agreed. The trio headed for the gate, although only one of them was actually dressed. Kairu having forgotten to actually put her clothes back on, Kairu settled into a seat in one of the ship's mess halls. They had gated back to the ship for lunch. The outpost cafeteria had not yet been completed. Besides, it also had given May a chance to stop by their quarters to drop off her clothes, something she was doing right now, while Kairu and claimed a table. As Kairu looked around the hall, she noticed that May wasn't the only one without clothing. Kairu set down her pack, and then glanced at K. She would have chosen May, but she hadn't come back from dropping off her clothes. Why are those girls not wearing clothes? K shrugged, you would have to ask them. Some of them may have lost games like you did or they may just have chosen not to wear them. We biomics aren't particularly modest, and some of us are more open to being nude than others. The fact that we have no need for clothing does have some impact on that. On the other hand it makes us more appreciative of the aesthetic value of clothing. We can be far more artistic with our clothing than others. Although some of us just prefer body paint instead of clothes. You're joking right? K shook her head. I'm not. Clothing or paint are prime methods of drawing attention to your charms, but they are also used to display our individuality. Speaking of individuality, I think you need some lessons. I've never seen you use paint, nor have you worn anything other than the standard issue outfits. Great for training, I guess. Or when on duty. Off duty however, they don't exactly say much. K's gaze suddenly locked behind Kairu. Kairu looked back and her gaze froze. It seemed May had finally gotten back, and she had painted herself. Although that paint looked to be a little much, and thankfully K seemed to agree. How desperate are you to paint yourself like that? Kairu however could find no words to convey what she felt about May's paint job. It was rather lewd, in a fashion she found rather inappropriate. Well, since I have to go naked, I figured I would try and get noticed. Kairu quipped. Well, that will certainly get you noticed but I don't think that is appropriate. K nodded. I agree that is a little much. Paint something a little tamer next time. May glanced down at herself, sighed, and said, maybe it is a bit much. Slipping into her chair she changed the subject. So what were you two talking about? Kairu quickly lied before could say a word. Exotic technology. Claughed. Nice try. Actually we were talking about biomic clothing habits. May shifted, and gave Kairu a look. Speaking of clothing habits, I didn't expect you to adopt ours so quickly. Kairu frowned. What was May talking about? Her confusion only increased when K said, I wouldn't comment too much. She hasn't fully emerged from her shell. May replied, I guess that is true, but it doesn't look like it. What did May say? Look like it? Shell? Her confusion deepened as she looked between the two girls at the table with her. A sinking feeling in her gut made her finally look down, and she flushed red all the way down. K shook her head and sighed. I told you not to comment. Now she's embarrassed. Why didn't you two tell me I was still naked? May deflated a little. Nothing wrong with that. K interjected. For us there isn't anything wrong with being nude. As I was saying earlier. We are more open about personal choice and clothing than you are used to. Something we were both trying to get you to realize in our own way. May with the betting games, and me with the conversation that was just interrupted. Kyrie looked around. She really wasn't the only one here naked. No one here was wearing the standard issue clothing. Much of what the Biomax were wearing here was provocative in one way or another. Some were painted, others not. But a part of her noted that if she put the standard issue clothes back on, she would look out of place. May noting her gaze said, that is kind of why we wanted you to come out of your shell. All you ever wear is the standard issue clothes. We all would like to see a little more variety in your dress. See you relax, and just be yourself. She looked between the two, trying to reconcile that. Before she could say something, coffered. I was planning to invite you to some dress up after lunch. Maybe find something you would enjoy wearing off duty. Kairu, deciding to change the subject, replied. Interesting. Anyway. Why don't we talk about something else? Well there is that upcoming mission. Or we could talk about girls. Girls? Don't you mean boys? K commented. That might apply, if we had prospective male partners, but we don't. I think May was right with that one. I guess we could talk about that mission. Although I am more curious about how the ship intends to uncover what is going on with my people. May smiled. Well, 
There are several ways to go about it, but the best place to start would be the Neku home world. If any place would have the clues we want it would be the seat of power in the Neku Imperium. Kyra nodded, logical, but that place is also heavily defended. How exactly are we going to get the info we need? I don't think we can go in with cannons firing. Shifted, and confirmed, no, it might work, but the risk of failure would be too high with that plan. A stealth infiltration has a much higher chance of success, although it will take longer. May interjected before she could ask, the ship has a cloaking device. We can enter the system undetected, and gather basic information from orbit. Cloaked drones can then be deployed to the surface to set up a stargate. The depths of the oceans would be a good spot for that. We can use the deep sea gate to transfer agents. Hacking the civil net would allow us to create identities for those agents. As said, this will not be a quick operation, but a stealthy one. Especially since we don't want to alert the puppet masters without cause. With a frown she inquired, wait, are you saying cannons firing is actually viable? Both girls giggled, and after about a minute or two, K nodded, and May elaborated. It is. This is a Solian battleship. How many methods do you think a ship like this has for incapacitating a planetary population? She shrugged. Kairu honestly had no idea. K sighed. Hundreds. Actually, from the conventional to the exotic, some quite destructive, others comparatively tame. A few methods are actually non-lethal, most of them involving a bioagent of one form or another. The Empire does however have a few starship weapons in inventory that can be used to stun the populations of entire cities from orbit. The PPBs for example can be adjusted to unleash a wide beam stun blast. Although we won't be doing that for obvious reasons, Kairu just nodded. She knew exactly what those reasons were. No reason to have them explained, I guess that is kind of interesting, but what is with the mention of bioagents? The Empire's preferred method of pacifying a planet is through the use of bioengineered weaponry. Famous examples of Imperial bio are things like the Ancient Bloodleaf, or the truly infamous Lyra, neither of which you would know much about. Although Bloodleaf despite its age is still in use, while Lyra was discontinued during the Age of the First Lords, we won't use any Imperial weapons though. The Neku aren't Imperial rebels nor is the Empire at war with them. Imperial protocol restricts the use of those weapons after all. bio -eapons? Did the Empire not sign any treaties banning those? The Empire rarely signs treaties, not all that surprising given the history of the Solian people, and the size of their empire. The Solian Empire is after all the largest of the precursor states. At her height, the Solian Empire ruled over 2,000 galaxies billions of inhabited star systems, and controlled a vast fleet on the order of trillions of ships. Before she could ask about that, Megumi entered the room. She scanned the crowd and then headed straight for their table. It seemed something had come up since they parted. 79. Chapter 33 An Ancient Crash Site Megumi settled into an empty chair, and surveyed the three of them. When her eyes passed over May, and her body paint she shook her head and commented. Don't you think that is a little much me? May sighed, and glanced down at herself. You do? I guess it really is too much then. Kyra interjected, never minding May's weird paint job. Mind telling us what you came here for? Megumi leaned forward. I have a job for you, Kyru. A job? Megumi nodded. Yes, all three of you will participate along with one biomech of the hacker class. She paused, and gestured to the center of the table, as an image projected above it. It appeared to be the crash site of some old ship, the lines were a bit aggressive, it featured some thick armor, and several bulbous modules, however, Kairu did not recognize the general design of the ship. I found this on the edge of the system. The design isn't in my databanks, but initial scans indicate that it crashed around the same time my people disappeared, it might provide insights on where they disappeared to. Kairu frowned, are you saying that ship is of Solian design? The ship shook her head. Afraid not, but the design parameters do correspond with those of a race I am familiar with, specifically the Halon. I know that doesn't mean much, but they were one of the member races of the Empire. There is a very good chance that the memory banks of that ship contain useful information on what was going on then. Who had so far been silent interjected, so you want us to enter this wrecked freighter, and escort a hacker to the computer core, so that she can download the ship's logs? Yes? Kairu took a glance at the ship. Freighter? That ship looks a bit aggressive to be a freighter. May smiled and puffed up. It's a blockade runner, a type of armored freighter designed to break through blockades to supply forces on contested worlds. To be specific, this freighter is a civilian blockade runner. Civilian? 
What possible legal use would a civilian have for one of those? Megumi gave Kairu a look. I take it the Imperium tries to keep its citizens unarmed? Kairu frowned. The Empire doesn't. Megumi shook her head. We do not. Military vessels are typically stripped of restricted hardware and then sold on the civilian market at the end of their service. Many ship classes were retired in that fashion in fact. Anyway we do seem to be getting off topic. I guess we are. Megumi gestured to the projection. The moon the ship crashed on is quite warm despite the lack of sunlight. The source of this heat is geothermal, and several regions of the moon are dominated by volcanic activity. The ship crashed in a region that is geologically stable which has helped preserve the wreck. Kairu sighed, a volcanic moon really? What kind of atmospheric toxins will there be? Just the usual mix of volcanic gases. There is enough sulfur in the air to cause problems without protection. Nothing special will be needed, however. May nodded. Yeah, we can just adjust our shields to filter out toxins. We might need to bring an air supply though. Unless there is a source of oxygen in the atmosphere. Megumi just smiled, as the projection shifted, revealing the wider landscape. Something about it seemed weird, and then she saw something move. The moon is actually populated, mostly simple life forms. The moon does, however, support one complex life form, an invasive species. Most of the simple species are also invasive. Kairu frowned. Invasive, as in not native? How can you already know that? I sent a few science drones already to survey the natives. Preliminary data indicates that life on this moon arose around the same time as the crash. Not all that surprising since the freighter appears to be configured for biotransport. So, in other words, these Halon were transporting something, and when the ship crashed it escaped. K interjected. It's not clear from the images, but the one species, it's a kind of slime isn't it? Yes, a biomorphic slime. Genetically engineered. Slime? Genetically engineered, Megumi leaned forward again, nestling on her palms, and began, Slimes are rather simple creatures, well the natural ones anyway. The image shifted to show a gelatinous mass flowing up the hill. If not for the fact that it was going up a slope, she might not have thought much of it. This is a slime. There isn't much to say about it. It has a simple nervous system, an outer membrane, and an acidic composition. Slimes feed by absorbing organic detritus and dissolving it. Some breeds of slime also feed by dissolving in organic matter. As animals go, slimes are typically non-aggressive. Their senses are also rather poor, but that doesn't matter much since they are not predators, nor are they much of a threat. While they can be dangerous that is only if you are stupid enough to step in one. Kairu could see that, then interjected, that is only true of the natural slime species, Megumi nodded, yeah, many races dabbled in engineering more advanced slimes because of their potential as weapons or tools, of course, to be of any use as a weapon, the intelligence of the slime had to be vastly increased, biomorphic slimes are of Solian creation, highly intelligent, and extremely adaptive, they can thrive in any environment, these slimes are natural shapeshifters, and were designed as both a weapon and a tool. What do you mean, both a weapon and a tool? They were designed to prepare worlds for colonization by a member species of the Empire and to subjugate any local species for service of the Empire. Not that it matters to us. What does is the fact that they have successfully terraformed the atmosphere. If they were meant to be terraformers, why haven't they finished? They have been down there for what? Several hundred thousand years. More than enough time to. Megumi cut her off, actually not enough time. Based on the current population, I have already determined they had an initial population of only five. The others in storage must not have survived the crash or the battle that caused the crash. At least not long enough to reproduce. Anyway, slimes reproduce via two primary methods, splitting, and seeding. Given the conditions on the moon, seeding was non-viable, so this population had to reproduce via splitting. To actually have an appreciable effect on the moon's environment their population needed to reach a certain critical size, but splitting isn't particularly efficient for reproduction. A slime needs to reach a certain mass before it can split, and reaching that mass is a function of food. Organic detritus is most efficient for reaching critical mass, but the moon is sorely lacking in that. As such these slimes have had to make do with inorganic materials, which for a slime is the equivalent of subsistence living. They get barely enough energy from that to keep themselves alive. So the fact that they now have a population of about a hundred thousand is actually impressive under those conditions. Kairu frowned. That was interesting actually, but she did have a question. What exactly is seeding? Megumi shifted back, 
The other method of reproduction for a slime is somewhat parasitic instead of the normal splitting process. They deposit a number of specially formed eggs inside a host, typically a female of live young bearing species. These eggs hatch and absorb nutrients from the host until they are large enough to survive on their own. Before you ask, the process is almost never fatal for the host. In fact it can be quite enjoyable, even addictive for the host. I can see why that would be non-viable then. So other than having to look out for slimes, is there anything else we will have to worry about down there? Megumi nodded, the ship still has power, and while I haven't confirmed her automated defenses may still be active, they should recognize you as a friend, but there is no guarantee that they will, you may have to be prepared for having to fight your way to the core, Kyra nodded that she understood, many ships had automated internal defense systems, given the clear violence of the crash, and the extensive battle damage the freighter had sustained, those security systems might be damaged. She had even had training on what to do if the Frenfo recognition system for her ship's internal security grid failed. In that case, I will need the location of any internal security stations, preferably one that is intact. If the grid is malfunctioning, we should be able to shut it down from there. You should. It would be easier if I could give you the access codes, but that ship was launched after I was disabled. All the access codes I have are out of date. The hacker I plan to assign to your team should be able to bypass the security, so it should not present too much of an issue. The next few minutes were spent going over the reg, its layout, possible defenses. Megumi laid out the plan as well. Landing site, locations with slimes. How to deal with them. Apparently, slimes were hard to kill. Their outer membrane was quite tough and extremely flexible. In addition, all slime species were known for having a high regeneration factor. Blunt force physical weapons did nothing. You might be able to do something with a bladed weapon, but their acidic nature meant they would degrade such weapons quickly. Projectile weapons would be of no use either as the projectile would do little damage and would be quickly dissolved by the acid inside the slime. Energy weapons on the other hand could inflict significant damage. If the locals proved hostile, Megumi recommended keeping their distance and using their plasma cannons to repulse the slimes. Something Megumi said would likely not be a worry. They were not highly aggressive and were genetically programmed not to attack Solians or their technology. Biomics were included in that list, but Megumi cautioned them just in case the slime's genetic memory had degraded. By the time Megumi left them, lunch was long over. However, there apparently still was time for their planned dress-up session before they had to go on the mission. Kyra then glanced at Mei. A good thing too as they needed the time to repaint Mei with something sensible. Kyra had no idea what she was thinking with that paint job, and thankfully it seemed everyone else agreed as well. That thought reminded her that she still hadn't gotten dressed. She blushed while mentally planning to correct that. During their planned dress-up session she might find some good casual clothes to add to her wardrobe. She was already looking forward to it. 70. Interlude Sol Fire Class Heavy Cruiser Perhaps one of the most successful warships of its age, the iconic Soulfire is among the oldest of Solian warships, designed in the age of the Solian Alliance as a successor to the venerable Battle Hawk class heavy cruisers. The ship class would prove remarkably successful, and updated variants would later be employed during the early years of the Solian Empire. The class was ultimately retired and sold on the civilian market where it gained enormous popularity among certain groups. In the modern age variants of the class remain in service to civilian elements of the Empire. The ship class features a highly streamlined hull and a distinctive tri-split quad nacelle configuration. This unusual engine configuration provides a significant advantage in the area of speed without significantly inflating the ship's engine configuration. While the streamlined hull minimizes the ship's profile, Sol Fire class ships have the highest top warp speed of any ship class ever employed by the Solian Empire. It is able to reach warp 62, the maximum limit for warp-based propulsion systems. That equates to 100,633 times the speed of light. Naturally, the ship cannot maintain that warp speed for extended intervals. Like all Solian ships, she is designed for a much lower cruise speed. Unlike modern vessels, the Sol Fire class has an optimal cruising speed of warp 5 c whereas all modern Solian ships have an optimal cruising speed of warp 12.825.00c. The Sol Fire remains impressively fast on sublight. The class features an equally unique configuration for her plasma pulse wave engines, 
a configuration born of the unique needs of the Alliance. This configuration results in a practically non-existent sensor profile for the ship's sublight engines while providing enough high energy thrust to achieve an impressive acceleration profile. Since pulse wave engines are reactionless, the Sol Fire class can change directions with virtually no energy loss making the class very maneuverable even at high speeds. Also of note about the class was that the Sol Fire was the first Solian ship class to be designed specifically to employ several key technologies including phased plasma beam weaponry, and hypergraviton shields. Hypergraviton shields were the first shield technology employed by the Solians rated for combat. Hypergraviton shields have the key advantage of being highly resistant to the energy of electrocannon fire a weapon popular with the Solian people of that era due to its ability to defeat energy shields in very short order. These hypergraviton shields relied on their namesake particle the hypergraviton layer to create an energy barrier. A barrier that unlike previous generations of shielding exists partially in hyperspace. As such hypergraviton shields can function in hyperspace. Unlike their counterpart graviton shields. These generators were also uniquely configured with a rather unusual feature. A feature carried on to all future Solian ships. This feature is called shock detonation. The shields in this case are deliberately overloaded to unleash a high energy shock wave extending in all directions. Doing so would collapse the shields, but do serious damage to any ship within 12 light seconds of the equipped ship. However, it is important to note that the modern civilian versions of this ship are unshielded, as the Empire outlaws civilian ownership of shield generators. In addition to new shields, the ship features adaptive cloaking shields. A staple of the era, these shields constantly adjust to prevent sensor lock. In addition, unlike many of the other cloaking devices of the era, they did not prevent the cloaked ship from firing her energy cannons. As the adaptive matrix can rapidly compensate for the disruption caused by the associated energy burst. This same feature means that even if the cloaked ship takes a hit from an energy burst her cloak will remain unaffected. Since the Sol Fire was intended to fight mainly while cloaked she features a robust armor configuration, able to shrug off hits that would cripple other ships of the era. Sol Fire class ships were originally armored with Mark 37 Overlord armor made from an adamant Titan IV alloy. This was changed with later versions of the ship. Of course, the most important feature of the class is the power plant. No ship can function without power. The first generation of Sol Fire cruisers predated the advent of Omega Power. As such, it used a very different composition of technology for power. Main power was supplied by four primary antimatter plasma reactors while auxiliary power was supplied by a series of phased plasma cells. Phased plasma cell technology was also linked into the primary weapons array. Every beam emitter was supplied power by its own phased plasma cell in addition to a dedicated array of plasma cells, improving weapon recharge rates, and yield by 35%. This gave the Sol Fire Cruisers a significant firepower advantage over older designs who merely had the technology retrofitted into their design. An advantage that was incorporated into successor designs, improved versions of the plasma cell technology remain in heavy use throughout the Empire as a cheap source of power. Often used in weapons ranging from small arms to starship weaponry. Some ships even use them as a secondary power source for the primary systems. Although they can struggle to adequately supply energy to the more powerful Imperial Shield Generator systems. 55, Chapter 34 Exploring a Reg, Kairu stepped into the room. It was about time for her squad to deploy. As such, she had followed May and down to the shuttle. This room was an equipment locker just outside of the shuttle. Looking around she could see numerous lockers sealed with some transparent material. Behind these barriers she could see rows upon rows of rifles, pistols, grenades, rocket launchers, and more. Even weapons she could not even identify. Assuming they were even weapons. They looked like they might be a weapon, but she could not be sure. She gazed around at the different alien weapons. Smiled, impressive sight isn't it? More so for you, maybe, since you didn't get the download. Kyra nodded, it was an impressive looking armory. May approached a locker full of pistols and opened it. She pulled out a few pistols while saying, based on the mission brief, we shouldn't need these, but they might be handy in a pinch. Kairu accepted one, and looked it over curiously. May informed her, that is a standard issue LPP infantry plasma laser, model 2311. It draws power from an interchangeable hyperphased plasma cell in the grip. It has three variable intensity settings, and can be set for either focused or wide beam settings. 
The pistol also has a secondary firing mode in which it rapid fires charged plasma pulses. While useful we won't need the secondary mode. The main reason we are bringing these along is that unlike our personal defense cannons, LPP-2311 has a stun setting. Kairu interrupted her there, as she had a couple of questions. She had no idea what a hyperphased plasma cell was, and she was pretty sure that most Solian weapons didn't have a stun setting. What exactly is a hyperphased plasma cell? I have never heard of that technology. May sighed. In simple terms, it's a form of fusion reactor. It utilizes a low energy form of plasma fusion to generate usable energy. These types of reactors are remarkably efficient at converting generated power into usable energy with virtually no loss. K interjected. Plasma reactors have a long history. The oldest versions were first employed on Battle Hawk class vessels, but they weren't even phased then. Often employed in grouped arrays, as the cells are rather small individually. I believe it was not until the Soul Fire class that the Solian people started to employ phased plasma cells. Hyperphased is a wholly different animal. Hyperphased plasma actually exists in a state of hyperspatial flux. Kairu stopped her. This explanation was getting rather above her head. She knew enough now to know what was in the pistol. So in other words this pistol is powered by a miniaturized fusion reactor? I was not aware fusion reactors could be made that small. They both nodded, and said, most forms of fusion can't be, but plasma fusion can, a fact that makes it invaluable. Its invention revolutionized small arms, and it will do the same for the NECU if they discover the secret. She could imagine so, it would allow for infantry and ship crews to wield more powerful small arms. May suddenly interjected anyway, you can read more about them in the ship's library. Anyway, what you do need to know is that the plasma cell in the pistol should be good for about 20,000 shots on the stun setting. She paused and pointed out three spots on the grip. These nodes are designed to interface with our systems. Your HUD will keep track of its settings and power level for you. You can also change the firing settings with a thought. However, you must physically depress the trigger to fire. May pointed out a large grey button just below the display on the pistol. This here is the firing trigger, the display above it would give you everything your HUD does, so feel free to ignore that. A third voice interjected, as fascinating as this is. We do have a mission to get to, Kairu looked over. It was the hacker who had been assigned to the team, Kairu had met her briefly earlier, thankfully she didn't look like her, like and May did, as the hacker came from a different batch with a different base genetic template. Kairu believed the young woman had been introduced as Iris, and she seemed quite proficient with computers. Not that Kairu could really judge the young lady's skill set. May replied, We can finish on the shuttle, I guess. May and K gestured towards the door opposite the entrance. As Iris grabbed a pistol, they headed on through to the shuttle. Sitting not far from the door, ready for launch was an unfamiliar shuttle. It sat low with a sharp angled hull. A pair of short predatory looking wings spread from either side of the fuselage. Despite the predatory appearance, she could spot no obvious weapon mounts, no turrets, no gun ports, no missile launches. Not only was there a lack of obvious weapons, but she could not spot any engines either. At least not at first. As she drew closer, Kairu spotted a pair of nasals mounted at the base of each wing, but no other signs of propulsion. On the starboard side towards the front, there was a hatch just above the base of the wing. A gangway had been extended to allow boarding. There was a spot at the rear that also looked like it might sport a hatch and gangway, but it was sealed. K informed her, this is our ride, a Star Wolf class heavy assault shuttle. If you haven't already, I suggest you read the library entries on the shuttle. Kairu had not read those entries yet, but made a mental note to do so at the earliest opportunity. Especially since she had never even seen this shuttle class before. As she approached the hatch, she inquired, anything you can tell me now? K nodded. The Star Wolf is the mainstay assault shuttle of the Solian fleet, equipped with multi-adaptive shielding, a supplemental energy armor matrix, and overlord armor 200 centimeters thick. This little ship can take quite the pounding. She is outfitted with two PPB banks, four Hellfire plasma turrets, and a pair of torpedo launches. The ship can carry up to 40 standard micro torpedoes. The rear bay can transport two tanks and 14 soldiers to the battlefield. As she entered the hatch, she thought back to her first look at the shuttle. It certainly did seem large enough to carry two armored vehicles, and still have room to spare for a few soldiers. The shuttle landed a few hundred meters south of the main crash site. By then Kairu had been given a full in-flight briefing on the operation of the LPP-2311. 
They never covered the secondary fire mode, but she had been told they won't need it for this mission. She had a feeling they were right. The slimes were supposed to be non-aggressive, and she had been given a briefing on what kind of defenses the ship's internal security grid would likely contain. Key areas would be protected by light plasma turrets, and armored security doors, both of which could be dealt with from any security station. However the turrets were protected by only light armor, and could be disabled easily with more aggressive measures. Kairi made for the door, hoping that the mission would be as uneventful as possible, if she was lucky. The turrets would recognize them as friendly like they were supposed to, unfortunately that was not guaranteed, but if they didn't, they shouldn't be much of an issue, her personal shield should protect her from them quite well, and her own defense cannon should be able to knock a turret out in short order. Karu exited the shuttle with the rest of the four-man team, her eyes quickly surveyed the area around the landing site, the terrain was rocky and devoid of vegetation, not surprising given that there wasn't much light here comparable to a night with a new moon, perhaps just a little brighter, as the land itself had a bit of a glow. Veins of light blue light formed intricate sprawling patterns as far as the eye could see. These veins even extended over the hulking form of the wrecked freighter, as such she could see its mangled and twisted hull quite clearly. In fact she could see it far better than she had expected. A fact she appreciated as the alien world was beautiful. The view overhead was dominated by the nearby worlds. Scattered between those alien globes was the light of twinkling stars, a view broken only by dark orange clouds that glowed lightly as they drifted through the night sky. Nearby she spotted the slow lazy movements of a few slimes, one of which formed a tentacle that soon faced them, and its tip was clearly an eye. The slime was looking at them. It stared for a moment or two. Then the tentacle retracted into its body, and it went the other way. With the distinctive and slow-flowing movement of a slime, it seemed the ship was right. They were not inherently aggressive. Her eyes moved back to the wreck, and she commented, It's a bit brighter here than I expected. Yes, seems that some of the microbes have developed a form of bioluminous. Commented, Kmm replied, It's quite a pretty vista. Iris interjected, Unfortunately, we didn't come here to sightsee. But it is an impressive vista all right. Anyway, I think I see our entry point from here. Kairu saw it too. There was a breach in the hull at ground level. They should easily be able to enter the vessel from that breach. She agreed with the assessment of Iris. And the group made their way to the wreck. As they drew closer, she commented. It must have been a fairly violent crash to have mangled the wreck this badly. May replied. Maybe not as violent as you think. It shouldn't be this badly damaged, not from the crash anyway. The battle must have dealt serious damage to structural integrity, without those systems reinforcing the hull. She trailed off, but the point was already made. Kairi recalled that SI systems were known to mitigate the effects of impact damage just as well as they did weapons fire. Those systems having failed would certainly help explain the extent of the impact damage she could see, although not all of the damage was from impact. Some of it was quite clearly weapons damage. The hull breach they were approaching was clearly of the latter. The hull was melted and scorched in that section of the freighter, not twisted or mangled. Clear signs that an energy blast had impacted the hull at that point. Moments later, the four entered the wreck through the breach. The entire section was scorched by whatever weapon had been used to penetrate the hull. They found a sealed blast door leading into the ship fairly quickly, but soon discovered that the door controls were non-functional. I guess we will have to cut our way through, commented Kairu. May glanced at Iris, who was still examining the broken door controls. Perhaps not. Iris, the outer casing is scorched, but the circuitry is still intact. Give me a minute to bypass the control panel and I can get the door open. Responded Iris, as she opened her equipment pouch and pulled out a strange tool. Kairu watched her work and true to her word, it only took about a minute to bypass the control panel. A minute after that, the door slid open with a slight squeal, revealing a stretch of corridor lit dimly by flickering emergency lights. Kairu appreciated their presence, as it gave her something to see by, and she marveled at the fact the wreck still had power. The briefing told her it did, but seeing it for herself just made it feel more real. The corridor was in fairly good shape, and she noticed a few doorways lining the walls of the corridor. As they walked down the corridor, they peeked into the rooms. All of them were in disarray, and a couple were thoroughly destroyed. Yet there was enough intact to determine that these were crew quarters, and this part of the ship was low security. None of the quarters seemed appropriate for anyone of officer rank, so these quarters were likely used by lower-ranked crewmen. Making small talk, she commented. 
It's impressive that this old wreck still has power, not really. Of all the systems on a ship, the power systems are by far the most important, Kyra nodded, true. Most designers give the power systems the greatest degree of redundancy. After all, if power fails, everything else fails. On my last ship there were even emergency power cells hooked up to the life support system as part of a last gasp measure to keep that system functioning. K nodded, that isn't all that uncommon. From what I have been taught, most races do that because life support is the system everyone prefers to have fail last. True. Every ship I served on, and encountered had a high degree of redundancy for the life support and power systems. As they reached another door, May commented, Well what good is a warship if power fails completely with the first hit? No one answered, the answer being quite obvious. Instead they focused on the security door blocking their path. Kyra noted text written on a plate on the door. It was labeled Arms Locker 17. She commented, Looks like an arms locker. Yes. But it's the last room we can access, and we can't go further thanks to that collapsed bulkhead. Anyway there should be an emergency maintenance hatch in the arms locker. We can use that to get deeper into the ship. As Iris started work on bypassing the security lock to open the door, Kairu said, I'd have placed defenses in an arms locker. K nodded, and May stated, yes, there should be two plasma turrets in this room. I guess we are about to find out if the target recognition system is still working. K replied, well if not our shields should keep us safe. Kairu agreed with that sentiment. She had seen the strength of her shields, and it was hard to imagine anything could penetrate them. Before she could say a word, the security door slid open, revealing a dimly lit arms locker. Half the lockers were smashed, and the others were empty. Against her rear wall was a pile of bones still holding an old rifle. Kairu had barely registered the corpse, when the room flashed bright. Several angry red bolts of plasma slammed into the doorway and her shields flared. A quick glance at her shield bar indicated that they had been drained a little over 20%. 64. Chapter 35 Secrets of a Crashed Precursor Freighter The red plasma barrage struck her shields dead on. Almost as soon as the door opened, a glance at her had told her that it had drained 20% of her personal shield in an instant. However, before she could process that, her training took over. She slipped into a covered position, and readied her weapon. A second barrage of red plasma bolts slammed into the wall with a few zipping past her into the corridor. Her trained eyes spotted the source. Two plasma turrets, ceiling mounted, with an angle on the door. As she took aim she cursed the brutal brilliance of the designers. A single blue-green beam of phased plasma lanced from her arm to the first turret. The stream punched through the armored security turret, melting the far more delicate internals. The melted turret fell silent as its friend fired another barrage. At the same moment, one of the others counterfired with their own shot. A second beam of phased plasma tore through the second turret while it was still firing, causing it to sputter and die. Seeing no other threat, she commented, You know, those turrets were brutally placed. If we didn't have shields they might have killed us. Iris commented, We would have needed to be more cautious in that case. Kyra nodded. Although looking around, she noted that cover around the door was generally poor, and that the controls were placed in such a way that it was impossible to open it without exposing yourself to both turrets. It was good defensive design, but that only made it annoying for them to deal with. She took another look around the room, the smashed lockers, and the corpse she noted earlier. Nothing seemed useful, but the presence of the corpse seemed interesting. She commented on it, and then May noted, I'm not an expert on corpses, and neither is anyone else here, but from what I understand that corpse could have very well been here since the ship crashed. Kyra nodded, and tried to put that in perspective. If true, that corpse was positively ancient, old enough that Kyra knew many scientists would kill for a chance to study it. A fact that weirdly enough meant that the most valuable item in this wrecked arms locker was in fact not a weapon but the dead body. Although there was one weapon still here, the one that the corpse was holding, none of the lockers still held weapons. Well, intact weapons anyway. She did spot a few smashed rifles in the lockers, but she presumed most of the weapons were elsewhere on the ship, most likely distributed to the crew during the battle that led to the crash. The active defense system helped discount other possibilities. The group then made for the maintenance hatch. While discussing their route deeper into the ship, the nearest security station was on this deck. Reaching it would be the challenge though. The deck was in shambles, and they could not rely on the schematics. They did have the recon data from the advanced probes, and drone scouting. Unfortunately the weaker scanners on those things couldn't penetrate deeply into the hull. 
The ship's hull alloys apparently absorb sensor pulses. The only sensors that could penetrate the hull, and give them a full view of the interior would have been the Constellation's short-range scanners, but those had a maximum range of one light second. Meaning that with the ship orbiting another planet, and not being near the moon, they didn't have that scanner data. As such they were going to have to find it the old-fashioned way. End of Block 1